Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's 13th and final day of the hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. <laughs> My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. I have been joined on the dais by Councilmember Barry Gudenchik and others I'm sure will be coming very soon. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to give a well-deserved public thank you to the entire Finance Division of the City Council. They have worked incredibly hard over the last several weeks, yes, to ensure that the executive budget hearings have been informative, thoughtful, and comprehensive, starting with the Director Latanya McKinney to all of the Deputy Directors, Assistant Director, Councils, Unit Heads, Finance Analysts, economists and support staff, thank you very, very much. I'd also like to thank all the sergeant and arms who keep us safe every day, as well as the members of the New York City media who make us look good on television. And finally, thank you to my entire staff, both here at City Hall and back in my district office in Jackson Heights in Queens. Today we will hear from the Department of Finance, the Controller, and the Independent Budget Office, and of course, the public. If there is anyone from the public here now, please be advised that the public portion of the hearing today will begin at approximately 12 p.m. If you would like to testify, please fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms and be sure to indicate the topic of your testimony on that slip. We understand that seniors, students, or people with disabilities may need to leave by a certain time and we will try to accommodate that need by putting you on one of the earlier witness panels. If you need such an accommodation, please write it on your witness slip or speak with one of the sergeant at arms. Now, let's kick it off with the Department of Finance, whose executive budget totals $314.2 million. The department's budget has seen relatively few changes since the preliminary budget, with approximately $3.9 million in new needs over fiscal 19 and fiscal 2020 offset by $4.2 million savings in fiscal 2020. I am pleased that one of these new needs is $407,000 to staff and supply the new property tax aid unit, which will administer the income-based payment plans that were authorized by recently passed legislation. I look forward to learning more how the process of rolling out these new agreements is going and working with the department to get eligible seniors and other low-income property owners who need help signed up for this program. Before we hear your testimony, Commissioner Gia, I'd like to thank you personally for meeting with me last week to discuss the work that you're doing at DOF and the programs and initiatives you're hoping to implement. Your commitment to fairness, efficiency, transparency, and customer service is clearly evident in the work that you are doing. I look forward to maintaining our open dialogue between ourselves and our staffs so that we can continue to work together collaboratively for as long as we are in our respective roles. Well, thank you very much. And before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member. And if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. Uh, we will now hear from the Department of Finance, Jacques Gia, the commissioner, after he is sworn in by council. Uh, good morning. I do you affirm that the testimony you're, you will give today will be um, accurate to the best of your information and belief? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Whenever you're ready. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Drum and the members of the Finance Committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jacques Jiha, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Finance. I'm joined today by First Deputy Commissioner Michael Hyman and Deputy Commissioner Jeffrey Shear. <clears throat> I will begin by providing you with an update on the city's financial position. Through April, the city's revenue totaled $55.8 billion, which represents a 3.1% increase over last year. The improvement in the city's financial position since the March preliminary budget hearing is due to a rebound in personal income tax collections. The economy remains strong with interest rates moderate and unemployment at a half century low. Nonetheless, we remain concerned about the future 
as there is a small risk that the national economy will skid into a recession in late 2020. As a result, we continue to advise caution when approaching the fiscal year 20 adapted budget. When we met in March, I told you that our agency has been relying more and more on data analytics and artificial intelligence to mitigate risk, reduce inefficiencies, bring down costs, and make better decisions. As I said then, our, our customers are also customers of private companies that are providing state-of-the-art products and, uh, and services. Companies like Google and Apple set our customers' expectations, and to meet this high standard, we have to continuously improve the way we do business. <clears throat> Hence, in the last five years, we have developed a suite of strategic initiatives designed to modernize the agency, improve our processes, and ensure a better experience for our customers. Some of our most successful initiatives include the award-winning parking ticket pay or dispute mobile app, an updated business tax computer system, the use of advanced technology for, ac for more accurate property valuations, the incorporation of artificial intelligence into the selection of audit candidates, and a cross-agency data sharing initiative that has created a collaborative culture among more than 20 participating city agencies while providing concrete results, such as the use of uh, uh, GOB data for more accurate property assessments. Now, I will provide an update on several important initiatives that we believe will change and improve our business practices. In March, the Department of Finance was only days into the launch of our new <coughs> online property tax system. Those of you familiar with the green screens of the old web page will no doubt appreciate the more modern, customer-friendly experience that we are able to offer with the new system. It is now much easier for customers to perform transactions and access information such as the property tax bills and notice of property value. And because the site is mobile responsive, property owners can now view their bills and pay their taxes from the palm of their hand. As with any new computer system, there have been and will continue to be growing pains. But we have spent the last two months improving the system in response to customer inquiries. Key improvements include a new account balance page, which allows customers to predict their future discount and interest in order to plan their property tax payments. A historical notices feature, which displays all notice of property value since January 2010 and all property tax bills since June 2009. And several improvements that make it easier for customers to access the Department of Finance data on the New York City Open Data Portal. More data will be added in the coming months. <clears throat> As I have testified in the past, a key part of the new system is the new smart file online application process. Through smart file, property owners can apply for money saving tax breaks such as she and Z and the veterans and uh, clergy exemptions. Already, more than 250 New Yorkers have applied for benefits via the smart file system. We are pleased with the early response to SmartFile, and we hope to see similar results later this year with the launch of a new tenant access portal for particip participants in the rent freeze program. Modeled on our successful landlord access portal, the tenant access portal will provide beneficiaries with a one-stop shop for forms, information, and resources for the rent freeze program. Tenants will be able to see the status of their benefits and download custom reports electronically. With smart file already in place, the launch of the rent freeze tenant access portal means that property owners and renters will be able to access more information about their benefits online at their own convenience rather than having to write or call us. Another important initiative that was launched to the public this spring is the property tax and interest 
uh, deferral program, also known as PTA. This program offers manageable and affordable payment plans to low and moderate income property owners who are having trouble paying the property taxes. <clears throat> there are three P uh, PTA uh, payment plans, one for seniors, one for homeowners facing extenuating circumstances, and one for those who simply need to stretch a year's worth of taxes over multiple years. Property owners with PTA agreement will be excluded from the 2019 tax lien sale. For that reason, we included an informational PTA insert with the mailing of the 90-day lien sale notice, and we plan to do the same for the 60, 30, and 10-day notices. We have also advertised the program on social media and in the press, and we expect that many New Yorkers will apply as we get closer to the lien sale which will be held in July. We created PTA in response to the high default rate in our standard payment agreements. We are also exploring another improvement that may help customers avoid falling behind on their taxes in the first place. Most uh, people pay their mortgages each month, and many would find it difficult, if not impossible, to make that payment on a quarterly basis. Yet, our customers do not have the option of to pay the property taxes each month rather than each quarter. We plan to introduce a monthly payment options, option that will make property tax payments more manageable for our customers. Our hope, as I said, is that if we can help homeowners keep up with the property tax payments, they will never find themselves in need of a payment plan. Fortunately, <clears throat> We continue to see fewer properties at risk of being included in the lien sale uh, than in previous years. Earlier in the decade, the Department of Finance included on average more than 26,000 properties in the risk pool each year, a number that has been reduced to about 22,000 properties this year as a result of clearer and more frequent communication with customers. It is important to note that the majority of these properties will not end up in a lien sale. Last year, approximately 3,700 liens were sold, considerably less than the 5,300 that were sold in 2014. We have been particularly focused over the past several years on making sure that not-for-profit organizations remain out of the lien sale. The Department of Finance has convened a tax force to help keep not-for-profits informed of the obligation to renew the tax exemptions annually. It takes a concerted and collaborative effort to communicate effectively with customers. And today, <clears throat> I'm asking the Council's assistance and partnership to inform New Yorkers of a very important new state law. As you know, the governor recently signed legislation that will expand the speed camera program in school zones. It is important that drivers be informed of the new rules. Most significantly, the hours of speed camera operation are expanding. Beginning July 11, when the uh, law takes effect, the cameras will be operating from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday, 12 months a year. In addition, the speed camera zones will be expanded to within a quarter mile of any school, and the number of school, the number of school zone will, zones will increase from 140 to 750. The new law will result in significant changes for drivers, and we plan to work with the council, the Department of Transportation, advocates, and the media to help get the word out. We look forward to partnering with you in this effort. Another key Department of Finance uh, uh, communication initiative from the first day of this administration has been a broad effort to improve some of our important mailings. Last year, we revised the annual uh, notice of property value in response to customer requests that we include an estimate of the property taxes for the coming year. By presenting the NOPV information in a logical progression and by incorporating design elements that customers are accustomed to seeing in bills and statements from private companies, we were, we were able to reduce two and one calls about the NOPV by almost 10%. 
Meanwhile, General 311 NOPV inquiries from customers who do not have a specific question about information contained in the notice were reduced by 23%, an indication that customers understood the notice well enough to ask informed and specific questions. We saw similar results with our redesigned she and the renewal mailing. The response rate to the mailing, that is the number of recipients who returned and completed application, increased from 25% in 2016 to 75% in 2018, while calls to 311 regarding she and the renewal decreased by more than 70%. Subsequent communications brought the final renewal rate to 94%. While we are pleased with these results, <clears throat> we under also understand that no matter how much we simplify our communications, customer will always need to talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. Property and business taxation are complex subjects, and there are certain questions which require the help of an expert. That is why on July 1st, we will launch a new Department of Finance call center to provide customers with access to experts on business taxation, property tax exemption, exemptions and benefits, the rent freeze program, and refunds and misapplied payments. The call center will be able to direct calls from 311 to knowledgeable agency staff to provide faster and more personalized service to customers who have questions about their taxes and benefits. In short, the call center will make it easier for New Yorkers to access the information and help that they need. Our goal is that whether they call, write, or visit the Department of Finance, all customers have their questions answered and their needs addressed in a timely, friendly manner. The initiatives I described today are part of an agency-wide commitment to customer, which we take very seriously and are proud to share with the Council. We thank you for your continued support and partnership, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. <clears throat> thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, let me start off by asking some questions on tax collection. There has been some discussion about the strength of fiscal 2019 tax revenues, particularly the personal income tax. DOF directly collects most of our taxes, with the, exception, with the exception of the personal income and sales taxes, which are collected by the state and then remitted to the city. How much has been collected from each of the taxes for the month of May as of Friday, May 21st? Specifically, I'd like to know about the property tax, the commercial rent tax, the mortgage recording tax, the real property transfer tax, the general corporation tax, the unincorporated business tax, and all the other taxes combined. Uh, as of, uh, I mean, year to date, I mean, month to date, uh, you know, I don't have that information because we have not closed the month yet. But I believe uh, through the last, uh, uh, through the end of April, we collected in total about $37.1 billion for all of these taxes. Okay. And <coughs> um, going forward, uh, until we adopt the budget, uh, will you give us um, some updates on what's happening and what the collections look like? Once we, uh, once we close the month, we will provide an update to, to the council staff, yes. Okay, and you'll we'll have that information broken down by tax? We will have that information broken down by taxes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, currently, DOF's vacancy rate stands at nearly 10%, and it is not expected to decrease in fiscal 2020, despite a small drop in budgeted headcount. What impact has this persistent vacancy had on DOF's ability to manage its varied portfolio? Uh, let me say that uh, we, uh, we expect to uh, um, basically backfill many of the position and hire a lot of the staff that we need sometimes this year. Uh, the, uh, one of the reasons why we, uh, uh, we lag behind in terms of hiring is because we're moving our employees from Brooklyn into uh, most of our, about 900 employees from Brooklyn into Manhattan. So as a result, we decided to postpone the hiring of many of these employees because it makes sense to hire all these folks and then move them uh, from Brooklyn to Manhattan. So we're in the process right now of uh, speeding up the hiring process. So we expect to have the staff in place, full staff in place, sometimes uh, uh, this fiscal year. So is that um, uh, 
all new hires that have come on board? Is it those um, 900 that you're talking about, or is there more? Some of them, some of them in the area of audit. We have a, a lot of, we are hiring a lot of auditors, and we're also uh, hiring in the area of uh, uh, sheriff, for the sheriff department, and also for um, assessors. How many people have left? Um, it's, a, it's a moving target. Do you have something to speak in mind? Uh, we could provide you that information, okay. yeah, specific information. All right, thank you. It's, it keeps changing month to month, as you can imagine. In the November plan, DOF saved 3.9 million from 53 vacancy accruals, but made no reduction of headcount. In the executive budget, DOF saved 4.2 million from reducing 63 positions starting in fiscal 2020. With respect to the vacancy accruals, why did you take them as accruals in, November, in the November plan instead of reducing the headcount? Again, as I said, we're in the process of hiring, you know, and uh, so our goal is uh, to bring our staff to the level that we currently, you know, that is authorized. So again, it is, it was a, ti it's a timing issue from our perspective, but as uh, we move into the fiscal year, we, our goal is to basically hire all uh, the employees that we have that is authorized in our budget. Will we see a further reduction by uh, adoption? Uh, no. No, well, actually we'll see an increase in terms of the headcount that we'll bring in. Because as I said, you know, we were moving our employees and we uh, successfully uh, move all our, all our staff uh, at the end of May. So right now we're ratching up our employment, uh, our hiring. Okay, so for the 63 positions that we're talking about, can you please break it down by, for us by program area as well as the titles and salaries of the positions? We will provide that information because right now it's like a placeholder for 63 employees in general. And okay. It's not broken down by, but we will, you know, as we do the allocation, we will provide you that information. Okay, thank you. Uh, earlier this year, the council passed legislation after working for months with the administration to establish the new PT aid payment agreements. My staff and I were dismayed to hear that earlier this month, uh, a constituent of mine went to the DOF Business Center for assistance with enrolling in one of the new payment plans only to be told by several DOF staff, including a supervisor, that they were unaware of the new law or the new payment plan. When did DOF begin training staff on the new plans and is training still ongoing? Yes, uh, we, uh, we have tra ongoing training with our employees, but uh, the, uh, and I was, uh, you know, I'm sorry that, that that happened because, uh, you know, I believe we took care of that constituent. We yes. reached out to that constituent and, and took care of, of the problem. <clears throat> but currently, we've been training our staff to make sure that they're fully aware of the program. Again, as you can imagine, it's, uh, we have a lot of employees and that, you know, in all the business centers, and we have to make sure every single one of them is fully aware of the program, but we're in the process of doing that right now. Okay, and what about 311 operators? 311 operators are also aware, we provide them all the scripts that they need, and as I said uh, uh, earlier, and uh, as part of the call center, we will be able to handle, okay, any call that's referred to us from 311. So the law had a um, explicit, um, outreach requirement, um, are you m moving along to meet that requirement? Yes, we've been, uh, we've been doing a lot of outreach. Uh, we, I, I believe we, for the tax lien set in general, we've done about so far close to 25 outreach campaign and we have five more program actually. If uh, you or any member of the council wants to have a program in the district, please let us know. We'll be more than happy to have, uh, to come to your district and to their district okay, to basically um, educate people about the program that we have now. Okay, thank you for that. The fiscal 2020 executive plan includes funding increase of uh, $407,000 for the property tax aid unit to assist with property tax aid in fiscal 2020. How many homeowners does DOF expect to assist within the first year? Uh, so far, I believe we have about 33 applications and uh, we approve so far six, but again, as we get closer to the lean cell, we expect a spike, okay, in the application because, uh, you know, as I said, many people are not aware of the program and we are doing our best to uh, reach to as many people as possible to make them and make sure they enroll into the program because we create the program because we believe there was a need for it, there's a need for it. So our goal is to do an outreach as aggressive as we can be so that we could uh, uh, try to enroll as many people as possible into the program. 
Is there a dedicated staff at DOF to assist uh, with yes. the program? Yes, we currently have, I believe, four employees in the PTA program. Four? Okay. Yes. Uh, when DOF informs home, homeowners of arrears, does the communication include information about PTA? Yes, uh, we, uh, as part of the lien sale notice, we include an insert right. uh, with each one of the mailing. And that's that the said. mailings that you mentioned in exactly. your testimony? Exactly. Okay. Um, so uh, when we passed Local Law 45 of 2019, DOF communicated an estimated cost of $45,000 for title searches. Is that included in the new needs? Uh, I believe so. We were already on board. Uh, we hired a company. We hired a title search company to help us with the uh, title search effort that we need to do, the title search we need to do in order to approve uh, these uh, applications. Okay, and in your testimony, and on a different topic now, you mentioned uh, the speed cameras. Um, how much new revenue do you expect to get from the speed cameras? We're still working, we're, we're still working on uh, you know, what kind of deployment we're gonna have, but again, it depends on how aggressive we are with the deployment effort. And have you heard from DOT on a rollout a timetable? We've been working. We've been working with DOT and City Hall in terms of uh, you know on the rollout. But again, you know, it's uh, we will soon sooner we would come sooner than later we would come up with a plan to uh, roll out the program in a way that makes sense for everyone. Are those cameras on during the summer? I believe they will be 12, 12 months. To, you know, twelve months of the year. Yeah, twelve months a year. <laughs> All right, a taxi broker investigation. On Monday, the mayor announced a joint investigation by the TLC, DOF, and DCA into predatory practices by brokers in the taxi industry. What is DOF's role in the process, and what is the timeline for the investigation and release of any recommendations? Uh, the mayor has asked us to look, uh, in conjunction with uh, TLC and uh, DCA, to look into the matter. As you can imagine, uh, it would not be wise for us to telegraph our next steps. So in appropriate time, when the investigation is completed, you know, we will uh, uh, announce the outcome of the investigation. What do you think would be a, su a successful outcome? Uh, again, as we just started, you know, the mayor just made the announcement, you know, we're in a process of reviewing all, the, all our options, so I, I cannot you know, tell you at this point in time what uh, success would mean. Okay. Um, <clears throat> DOF's units of appropriation do not match its program areas, which makes for reduced transparency and limited um, ability for oversight. Would DOF be willing to engage in a conversation with the council to add several new units of appropriation to match, to match its programmatic layout? Again, this is not something that we basically have a say on it. You know, it's basically OMB and the council, you know, in terms of negotiation. I mean, we are always open for more sunlight. So therefore, I don't have any, conceptually, I don't have any issue. I don't know where OMB and the council are in terms of negotiation. I know you've been talking with OMB about this issue for a while. So I, I don't know exactly what, you, what the discussions are, but we, I don't have any, we don't have any issue per se with respect to providing more transparency. Okay, well, it seems like things are going fairly well with OMB, so hopefully we'll get some new units of appropriation as well. Good. Good. Uh, parking violations, Bureau of Revenue. In the fiscal 2020 executive plan, DOF estimates that it will collect $4.1 in additional revenue from delinquent parking violations Bureau debt. Is DOF planning on doing anything new or different to achieve this goal? Uh, I think we uh, currently, uh, we... Um we're hiring a third collector. Am I, am I, am I correct? Yes. We're hiring a third collector. Collection agency. Collect, collection agency. Uh, out, outside collection agency. Again, it's part of our own aggressive effort to collect in general, whether it's uh, uh, parking, uh, business taxes, or ECB debt. This is part of the effort that we're doing to uh, raise our collection. Okay, and uh, what role will my sheriff friend here play in this effort, and will it involve more bootings? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> the, uh, the sheriff has been extremely aggressive in terms of uh, doing their best to help the Department of Finance enforce uh, not only uh, parkings, but also ECB debt and also business debt taxes. So they will be integral to the effort 
Are there targeted areas where you're doing the bootings, or how, how does that work? We don't target any specific area. We just go by the numbers. You know, we look for people who, you know, who, you know, who do not follow our rules and don't make permits when they get violations, and these are the folks who target. We don't target specific areas of the city. And I think that last hearing we had, you said anybody who's over $350. Anybody who's over $350. So right now what we do is we're trying to be as customer friendly as we can for people uh, that uh, for f uh, we have uh, email addresses. As they get close to the $350, which is as they become close to the boot eligible number, which is a 350 we send them emails telling them, by the way, be careful, your car may be booted if you, you know, don't. Uh, pay your fines because you are very close to the 350 line. So what we're trying to always find ways to give them heads up warning so that people are not surprised. Okay, thank you. Um, monthly billing. We're excited to learn that DOF hopes to offer opt-in monthly billing for property taxes. Uh, when, you in, when do you anticipate being able to roll this out and will all property classes be eligible to opt in to monthly billings? Our goal is to do it uh, sometimes in January, but it's going to be uh, basically limited to uh, uh, class one properties and condos. And um, uh, class one and condos, and mostly for properties with assets values which are less than $250,000. Um, because the monthly bill taxes will actually be due earlier than uh, they would be otherwise, might this uh, at least initially create a financial barrier for taxpayers to take advantage of the monthly billings? Uh, no, it's, uh, the, the tax due date will be the same as it is currently for the quarter. It's just that we're giving them the option of spreading that, uh, you know, that uh, quarterly payment over three months instead of paying it all in one lump sum. So given that the taxes will be prepaid, how, if at all, would the early discount rate apply to taxpayers who opt into monthly billings? The early discount is paid annually and semi-annually, I believe. Yes. Yes. It, it yeah. would not apply. It would not apply to, uh, to this. It would not. Yeah. It's a very small window, you know. Are there uh, any legal or operational hurdles that you must overcome in order to implement the monthly billings? Uh, at this point, no, we don't see anything unless we were to change, I believe, uh, the uh, payment date, which we, are, we don't intend to do. Okay. Uh, the executive budget contains a new need of $1.6 in fiscal 2020 and $169,500 in the out years for a case management system for the assigned council plan. Uh, what will this funding be used for? I believe it's to acquire a case management system because we have some security issues. We're trying some security, you know, some gap in terms of security we're trying to fill. It's basically to address our own security uh, issues. That's the, it's a case management the, system. Can you describe that gap? What, what, what is the need? What, what's not happening? Uh, it's, uh, I would rather not go in detail. It, again, as I said, it's part of cybersecurity that we're trying to address uh, some of the issues that we have. We, so it's part of uh, uh, that uh, funding to address that issue. How did DOF come to be the agency that administers the voucher system for attorneys in uh, criminal courts? I believe it was assigned to us by the, uh, by the mayor back then in <laughs> when 2000 something. You know, I, don't have the, I don't know the history, I wasn't around. Uh -huh. so before your time. We were before my time. We were before my time. <laughs> um, how much headcount is devoted to this effort at DOF? About 14 employees. Okay. Thank you. Uh, DOF's fiscal 2020 executive plan includes a new need of $924,000 in fiscal 19 and $814,000 in fiscal 20 and the out years for cybersecurity infrastructure to protect DOF uh, databases. Can you expand on the scope of work entailed in this capital project <laughs> and specifically uh, what this new expense funding will pay for? Again, it's part of our effort to boost our security is basically, if I remember correctly, is to acquire firewalls and switches. Has uh, work commenced on the cybersecurity project? Yeah, I think so. And when do you think it'll be completed? In December. Okay. Uh, does the new property tax system have built-in cybersecurity protections? Yes. It does, okay. Uh, I'm gonna stop here. 
Um, Council Member Gredensha, I'm sorry, we've been joined by Council Member Adams, uh, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, and Council Member Cohen, and Council Member Gredenchik has questions followed by Council Member Adams. Right. Oops, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you kind of asked what I wanted to ask, but um, I do want to follow up a bit on the uh, speed cameras. And um, do, does the Department of Finance decide? Who gets to decide where those cameras go? There's Depart a lot coming in, so. Department of Transportation, we only collect. You only collect, we, you're the we uh, Grim Reaper. And also we adjudicate uh, those, uh, the fines, okay. the tickets. So it's up to DOT then, is that yeah. what you're saying? Okay, um, do you have, uh, the chair asked you about revenue estimates. Do you have a ballpark figure of what, you know, I, I would think given that we are, we are going to be more than, 140 to 750 is, a lot more, it's almost five times the number of what we had. Do you expect revenue to go up four times, three times? Uh, I can't tell you at this point in time, you know. You know. Have you put anything in the budget for, is it, is it in the budget somewhere? Whatever, whatever you have in the budget is what we, you know, all believe would be, you know. So at so this, was point, there in time, a, was at there this a, point in time, I don't have actual data. Was there a difference, Commissioner, in a revenue, revenue you're anticipating for FY19 as opposed to FY20? I assume it has to go up. It's just a, almost a mathematical impossibility that's not going to go up. Well, you could, you, you could assume, you could make, yeah, it's, your assumption is correct. You know, as I said, there's an improvement in collections. All right. I would appreciate it if you could um, get back to the committee and let us know once you have a bit more uh, grasp on those numbers because they, they are important. Um, and I'll follow up with DOT on locations. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you for being Good here morning. this morning. I represent District 28, South Jamaica, uh, Richmond Hill, Rochdale Village, and South Ozone Park. And my question uh, pretty much pertains to information that is received uh, by the public when it comes to tax exemptions and abatements. We know that there are quite a few out there, but what we're finding in our office when it comes to constituent services is that the information is not really known um, to our constituents the way that the way that the information should be shared. So um, does the Department of Finance plan to increase community outreach? Yes, we actually, it's, uh, we'd be more than happy to uh, work with uh, your office uh, to uh, do uh, outreach uh, in your own community. So our goal is, uh, as again, as I said, we know rent has, you know, continuously increased in New York City, and our job is to try to provide relief to, uh, to renters, to tenants. Uh, so again, we'd be more than happy to work with you uh, to make sure that uh, uh, people in your districts are fully aware of uh, many of the benefits that the city provides so that provide relief uh, to tenants or to homeowners in your district. So again, uh, let, 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 you know, after, uh, after the hearing, I, I will talk to you and then you could give me some information about who to reach out in your office and we'll be more than happy uh, to come uh, to your district. That's great. Uh, we definitely will be connecting to do that. I actually have an event this evening on tax lien, okay. and I would much rather talk to. Do you have anyone from our office in your district tonight? Or? I believe so. I will okay. let you know after the hearing. Okay. All right. So it's it's a lot of good information that we definitely need to share out there for middle class homeowners that sure. need that information. Thank you. All right. No problem. Councilmember Heim Deutsch has joined us and he has a question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. So I just want to uh, mention um, that, uh, first of all, I had two um, uh, property tax outreach events with your office and your staff is wonderful. We had two great events. So I really want to thank you and your staff for all the work that you do each and every year. And the only thing I wanted to mention is that on when people get their bills in, in the mail for the property tax, it only mentions what the exemption they currently receive. And I have a bill in the city council and I'd like to see if we could work on this, that uh, when people get the bills in the mail, it should also tell them what they might be eligible for. So, because at the first property tax uh, event that we had, workshop that we had, we were able to save one of 50 people 
under property taxes on other things like if someone's a clergy, if someone's a veteran, but if we could prevent that if it's on their bill, this way they know, okay, I got the uh, star enhanced, but now, you know, I could apply for a veteran's exemptions. So this way they have the heads up and this, it, could, it could also prevent a lot of uh, unneeded um, you know, acne later on for, for people. Again, we will be more than happy to work with you, with your office, to see what can we do to improve our transparency. But again, with respect to the exact amount, we could always try to provide an estimate, but because you know the value of property changes, as property and, and the exemptions very often are based on the value of the properties. So as property value changes, the exemption also change. So we could only provide an estimate. Yeah, okay, so just the yeah. information of um, what categories they, 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 they could be eligible, eligible for exemption. For. Yeah, we, so we, uh, we, on the bill, we, it should, it we should also, I'm pretty, we do a pretty good job at trying to, because one, one of the things that we do very well is if we, uh, when we receive an application, and if we see taxpayers are qualified, are eligible for some other benefits, we reach out to them automatically to tell them they are, and then, or some, very often, we even fill out the forms for them. Okay, and I send them back to them just to sign. I know our outreach people try to, as much as possible, try to provide a comprehensive view of all the exemption programs that we have so that people who are qualified for the different programs can have achieved all of them. Yeah, okay, so like if I get my bill and uh, I'm a vet, let's say I'm a veteran, so I only apply for Star Enhanced. So now when I get my bill, I see I could apply for veterans, mm -hmm. so this way I could, you know, without getting the outreach from your office, I could do that on my own and uh, so that would make it a little easier for everyone. Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, just my last question, and just to, something I had mentioned briefly before. So a resident who would pay property tax on July 1st would be opting to pay in May, June, and July. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay, so I just ask because I'm a little bit concerned that this may be a bit of a hurdle for low-income folks to do uh, initially. Do you have any concerns about that? Uh, I have, we will, we'll take a look at it to see what kind of uh, concerns that we have. We'll talk with your staff, but based on uh, what we see is they would spread it out, you know, before the uh, due date. Mm -hmm. In other words, they would receive the uh, SOA, the statement of account, early enough so they could spread the payments over a three-month period rather than, again, I, I'm trying to see the concerns that you have, but if there is something, we'll take a look into that issue to see. I'm just thinking if they, if they um, were expecting to pay in July, they may not be ready to do it in May, and you know, yeah. sometimes people don't plan or don't have the money. No, no, I understand. But yeah. you know, we, we will take a look you know, to see. Okay. Yeah. All right. But um, again, our goal is to make it easier. F that's, that, that's the direction we're heading, to make it easier for people to, to pay. So if in the process of implementing it, we see some challenges that would make it difficult for them, we would try to allay some of these concerns. Okay, I appreciate it, Commissioner. Thank no you. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Andy Cohen, and um, I don't think we have any other questions, so we thank you very much for coming in. We look forward to continuing to work with you, and we will reconvene in about five minutes with the um, controller. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, uh, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget <coughs> for Fiscal 2020. I have been joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Councilmember Barry Gudenchik, Councilmember Adrian Adams, and others will probably join us shortly. We just heard from the Department of Finance, and now we will hear from Controller Scott Stringer. And in the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, and we will hear from the Controller after he is sworn in by Council. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> well, um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Drum and members of the Finance Committee. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity today to discuss the city's fiscal health and also talk about the 2020 executive budget. Joining me is our Deputy Controller for Budget, Preston Niblack. I also have members of the Controller staff and our first Deputy Controller, Elena Gilligo. Each year, we have an opportunity to consider how best to serve working families and promote policies to empower our communities. Our budget is not just about numbers on a spreadsheet or mere dollars and cents. It's an expression of our values and a statement about what's important to us as a city. Because behind every line item is a human face, a family struggling to keep their home, a working parent struggling under the crushing cost of childcare, children growing up in communities without adequate spaces to play. I hope that my testimony today will help ensure that our budget manages our finances for the long term, lifts up our city's most vulnerable, and moves us forward towards a more affordable and livable city. We cannot and we will not stand for anything less. The national economy has now experienced a decade-long expansion, the longest and strongest in recent history. Since the end of the Great Recession, New York City has added close to 90,000 jobs a year. A booming economy and growing tax revenues have enabled us to invest in critical initiatives such as pre-K for all and right to counsel. When I last appeared before you in March, there was considerable anxiety about the national economy. Markets had tumbled in the wake of a Federal Reserve rate hike in December, and the threat of a trade war with China was high. The outlook was guarded. Since then, the Federal Reserve has taken a more dovish stance on monetary policy, which markets and employers have obviously welcomed. But President Trump's reckless actions have once again spiked concerns about a trade war with China that will only serve to hurt businesses and workers here at home. The impact of the President's latest whims must be an important reminder that unpredictable and damaging policy shifts in Washington can quickly undermine confidence and growth in our economy. One way or another, the rate of economic growth is bound to slow, and job growth will decelerate. We project that within the next four years, job growth in the city will decline to under 30,000 new jobs per year. Fiscally responsible management of the city's budget requires taking the long view not just balancing this year's budget, but ensuring we take action today to protect our ability to provide the critical services that New Yorkers rely on tomorrow. I remain concerned that we are simply not doing enough in this regard. In one of Aesop's fables, the grasshopper spends all summer singing instead of storing up food. When the winter comes, he has not stored food to rely on, and he starves. If we fail to take prudent steps to shore up our economic reserves now, when an economic winter comes, our most vulnerable New Yorkers will pay the price for our singing. And with this in mind, I'll begin with a review of the City's fiscal 2020 executive budget and its financial plan. Over the period of the City's financial plan, through FY 2023, the Administration projects spending to growth at an average annual rate of 2.5%. In contrast, revenues are projected to grow at an average rate of 1.7 percent each year, resulting in budget gaps of $3.5 billion in FY 2021, $2.9 billion in FY 2022, and $3.2 billion in FY 2023. My office expects tax revenues to rise by 3.6 percent per year, higher than the 3.2 percent rate the Office of Management and Budget projects. We expect tax revenues to be $670 million higher this year, 
than that, than that what's projected in the executive budget, rising through the remaining years of the plan to reach nearly $1.8 billion more by 2023. The biggest contributor is the property tax due to both higher anticipated growth in the near term and a lower level of reserves than what the administration is forecasting. We've also identified several significant risks on the spending side of the budget, including overtime and charter school tuition. And the financial plan still does not include funding for the Fair Fares program. Taken together, our revenue and expense projections result in smaller gaps in the last three years of the plan compared to the administration's forecast. Nevertheless, our budget remains more vulnerable than it could or should be. As I've said every year, the city should have a budget cushion, the accumulation of prior year resources that can be used to balance the budget if needed. We recommend between 12 and 18 percent of spending. But since FY 2017, despite continued strong growth in revenues, progress in increasing the cushion has stalled at 11 percent. We must set and reach targets to increase our savings to ensure we reach the optimal range of our financial cushion, something we should have been doing for the past five years. In the FY 2020 budget, we should at least reach the bottom of the optimal range. To do that, we would need $2.1 billion more in reserves by the time the FY 2020 budget is adopted. And we should plan to increase our target by one percentage point each year, reaching 15 percent by FY 2023. This plan is both completely realistic and urgently needed. To achieve these targets, we need to generate more reoccurring agency savings. The mayor decided, uh, has now decided uh, to call a peg, but then failed to deliver a meaningful one. The $420 million in savings this year and the $496 million next year sounds impressive, but it relies heavily on the hiring freeze and not enough on real agency efficiencies. And the savings failed to pay for new spending. The executive budget peg program still amounts to less than 1 percent of agency spending. Now, I recognize it can be difficult to ask agencies to do a thorough scrub of their budgets at a time when the city coffers are seemingly full. But I think we can and must demand more. Not only must city agencies contribute more to savings, they must be held accountable for the public money they spend. Last year, I introduced the controller's watch list to highlight agencies with high spending growth and lackluster results. This year, the agencies on the list include two from last year, the Department of Correction and Spending on Homeless Services, and one new agency, the Department of Buildings. Despite significant efforts and increased spending, the number of New Yorkers who sleep in homeless shelters continue to rise. We are now on pace to spend more than $3.2 billion next year across all agencies on homelessness. But it is unacceptable to continue spending that much and yet not make a meaningful dent in the homeless population. As I said last November when I released our proposal for a new approach to meet the crisis of housing affordability, we cannot continue to have two separate policy tracks, one for homelessness and one for housing. They are one and they are the same crisis. And the solution is to focus on providing affordable housing, true affordable housing, for those with the lowest incomes and the highest rent burdens. This is a moral crisis. And what we are doing today simply isn't working. It's time to recognize that reality and meet the problem head on with a new approach. Our jails now spend more than 300,000 per year to house one person on Rikers Island. As we have reported for five years now, the jail population has been steadily falling. Yet the costs are growing and despite a concerted effort, the culture of violence has not abated. Again, we cannot simply spend more and more money year after year and not see meaningful results. Since 2014, the Department of Buildings has increased its budget by over 60 percent and its staffing by 50 percent. And yet, accidents, injuries, and fatalities are rising at an even faster rate. The number of construction-related accidents more than tripled between 2014 and 2018 and shows no signs of abating this year. Injuries and tragically fatalities have gone up at a similar rate. 
I know that the council is well, well, well aware of the problem and passed essential legislation in 2017 to address the issue. We need to ensure that new spending and requirements will make a meaningful difference. Another area that has drawn our attention is Thrive NYC. My office has been asking questions about all aspects of Thrive, and we made an extensive request for data. But our initial review of the information they provided to us still leaves lingering concerns and questions. It remains fundamentally unclear exactly what it means to be part of Thrive, how much the city is spending on Thrive programs, and how well Thrive is doing. Yesterday, I sent a letter to City Hall outlining our concerns and questions and urging much more transparency regarding Thrive. I know that we all commend the effort to address mental health needs of all New Yorkers without regard to financial or other circumstances, and I commend City Hall for this effort. And I hope that the Council's work will continue to improve Thrive and its outcomes for vulnerable New Yorkers. The public deserves the assurance that its money is being spent effectively and on ensuring that we can provide truly critical services to those who need them. As Roe v. Wade comes under head-on assault in states like Alabama and Georgia, we in New York must protect safe and affordable access to abortion without shame, pressure, or punishment. And we must defend abortion access not only for New Yorkers, but for women who live in states where legislature, legislatures are ripping away rights enshrined in constitutional law since 1973. And that's why I urge you to ensure that abortion is accessible to all women without regard to the ability to pay. I urge you to support the F Fund Abortion New York City Coalition's proposal for an additional 250000 this year for the New York Abortion Access Fund. It is a small price to pay to protect a fundamental right. I hope my message today is clear, because it is increasingly urgent. The economic growth we've relied on in recent years is slowing down. The mayor's agency's savings are a start, but we need to do a lot more. We need to prepare our city so that regardless of what may come our way, we can protect and uplift all of our communities. For our present, for our future, and for every working family, let's deliver a budget that takes the long view and shows what New York is all about. Once again, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify. And Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Controller. I want to start off by saying we have been joined by Council Member Deutsch and Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. And let me start off by talking about early child, um, child care proposal for uh, children under three. You recently unveiled a proposal to expand um, access to affordable care for the city's youngest population, including kids from birth through age three. To pay for this, you are proposing a new payroll tax on companies with payrolls greater than 2.5 million. You assert that this would raise some $600 million and interestingly would cover payments for a proposed city bond that would be needed to support the construction and renovation of child uh, care facilities. So uh, why did you uh, propose that the payroll tax apply to companies with payrolls greater than 2.5 million? How did you arrive at that threshold? Well, first of all, thank you for asking the question. A child care proposal of the magnitude that we envision would greatly impact uh, the children of our city. We've seen the positive impact of pre-K and 3K, and I praise the mayor for that vision. But we have to do a whole lot more. We have to start thinking about the children zero to three. Eighty percent of brain development for these kids start at that age. It's pretty incredible. So we introduced what is perhaps the largest initiative on child care in the United States. We envision 84,000 kids in the program. We envision expanding child care uh, options throughout the five boroughs. We released a report that showed the child care deserts in so many of our communities that even if you can afford $21,000 a year, you can't even get a slot. It's harder to get a child care slot than get your kid into a big college. So we've got to level this playing field, and here's how we're going to do it financially. We're going to ask for a minuscule increase in the payroll tax 
for the 5% of businesses that have payrolls of 2.5 million or more. It's a small, it's a small down payment of what we're planning. Here's what we get for that tax increase. We get a $650 million build out. We not only help the children, but we also project that 20,000 parents would be able to re-enter the workforce, mostly women. Now that will help many of the companies who are asking for just a little help. Uh, as part of this proposal, we exclude 95% of businesses. We exclude all small businesses. Uh, the payroll tax uh, increases employment and it increases parent participation in the workforce. And that's our way of paying for it. Now, let me also remind people that when you have a proposal like this, I would not want to release it without identifying a funding stream. But there's many ways that we can engage in terms of capital funding, state funding, federal funding, uh, in the time that we're going to uh, implement uh, New York City under three, or NYC under three. So we wanted to give you a roadmap to make it real, um, but I'm certainly open to the council and the mayor and the state to work with us to find different revenue streams. Can you evaluate the um, current um, uh, system as it exists, uh, the state of child care in the city, and um, you mentioned uh, deserts as well, uh, where those deserts are? Yes, we have, do you have the list of, uh, I don't know. Um, so we see whether it's in Bay Ridge or Sunnyside, we have, so we have so few uh, subsidized childcare slots, it's a truly citywide crisis. And in part of, in, in doing our report, we wanted to take into account the fact that we should be building out a childcare network. And the way to do that as part of our plan is to appropriate capital dollars, $100 million for five years, especially in the beginning of this plan, to build capacity in neighborhoods that we've declared child care deserts. So that's one way of addressing the issue. The other way of thinking about this is, again, what would it mean to the city by returning 20,000 parents to the workforce? We would realize $540 million in new, um, in new income for people, and that would give the city millions and millions of dollars in taxes. And that, to me, also is a multiplier. The last thing I want to mention in terms of why this works, when you invest a dollar in childcare, you get $8 back in savings for the city. That's real money. So here we have a program that would help 84,000 children start them out zero to three, give them the extra learning they need to compete uh, in the new economy, send 20,000 parents back to work, they would earn $540 million, pay millions of dollars in taxes, and business would benefit because the more people in the workforce, the larger employment pool. And communities would also benefit because we'd finally build a child care infrastructure in neighborhoods that never had it. And I think that's critical. And look, who can afford really $21,000 a year for child care? It's breaking families, and a lot of people have to pack up and leave the city. Uh, I see uh, the majority leader uh, with, a, with, with a silent clap. Uh, but Many new parents are, are focusing, focusing on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about city contracts. Late registration of city contracts has been a long-standing issue that plagues nonprofits and their capacities to provide vital services to New Yorkers. Nonprofits are often forced to go months without being paid or able to access funds from the city contracts because of delays in registration. Your office has been reporting on these delays in the city's contracting system as it pertains to human services contracts and issued a report addressing this issue. According to this report, about 75% of all non-discretionary contracts for fiscal 18 arrived at the controller's office late for registration after their start date had already passed. For human services contracts, 81% of contracts arrived late for registration. So to your knowledge, what causes the delays in the registration and which agencies have the most issues? So many agencies have these issues and a couple of, a couple of thoughts. The, 
This is becoming more and more of a crisis, Mr. Chair, and I'm really glad that you're bringing it up again. You talked about this last year, and I think it was very helpful to highlight the issue. The agencies are not delivering the contracts to our office in a timely measure, but it's not just being late and causing paperwork delays. Many of these agencies are not realizing their contracts, so they're actually going out and borrowing money. The heads of these agencies, rather than think about how to expand childcare services or helping the elderly, are now full-time trying to just stay ahead of the city's incompetence when it relates to contracts. There is no excuse to put our social service network in general, in, in jeopardy. Human services is a vital part of what our city government provides, and we don't do it ourselves. We contract with agencies, non-for-profit agencies. But then we say to them, we're going to make your life miserable. We're going to disrespect you. We're not going to help you move the contract along. So we have two opportunities. One, I urge the city council to work with us in not asking but telling these agencies that they are on a time clock. I'm trying to get that through the Charter Vision Commission right now. I haven't had much success. I think maybe we can get it done. But if we don't, we need legislative initiative in the council to simply mandate timelines. The controller's office has a timeline. It's 30 days. Contract comes to me, and by the way, 30,000 contracts come to my office every single year. I get 30 days on the clock to determine whether to sign that contract, approve that contract, send it back, worry if there's maybe perhaps fraud or other issues, and we take that job very seriously. The agencies have to be on the same clock. The mayor's office of contracts has to be on the same clock because, as you know from your constituents, we've seen contracts come to our office years later, and that has caused a whole financial crisis within the nonprofit community. I urge you to work with us to find a solution, perhaps uh, bringing people together, passing needed legislation. I'm hearing from members of the council all the time about not-for-profits that are simply struggling. I do town hall meetings and community meetings, and the first thing I, I, was, um, I was out this week uh, in, in, in communities, and half the conversation was about not-for-profits talking about the crisis in the contracting procurement process. You mentioned that uh, on occasions you have to refuse a contract. What, what, on what basis do you refuse contracts? Um, fraud. It's not a good thing. Always fraud. Well, fraud, uh, incomplete uh, paperwork that I find necessary to review. Uh, we scrutinize those contracts and do our due diligence. Is uh, there a way for a, a, a CBO to um, uh, appeal your decision? Well, the city uh, can deem a contract registered. You know, the Charter never, never envisioned the controller stopping contracts outright. I think the interpretation of the Charter was that the controller's office should scrutinize, make sure the contract was in order, send it back for more concrete information, certainly refer it if there's a finding of fraud. But at the end of the day, we're not supposed to impede the work of government. And so we balance that when we see a contract. What, what you know, for example, one item that we have sent back were the whole ferry contracts, right? And part of the reason I sent those contracts back is I wanted more information on the deal of the contract, because we want to understand it better. And I'm for the ferry system, but you have to question a contract where the ferry owner gets the concessions, gets the revenue, and then we buy them their boats. So that's not fraud, but that's concern about whether, what impact that would have on the finance of the city. So we have to manage that within the confines of not slowing government down, but making sure we do our due diligence. Well, we've been asking a lot of questions about the ferry contract uh, yes. during this series of hearings here. Yep. Um, let me just do a little, uh, some questions about your, your headcount in your office. Since the fiscal 2019 adopted budget, the controller's office has added seven new positions in the Bureau of Audit for fiscal 2019. 
and the executive budget adds three new positions for court representatives for fiscal 2020 and beyond. Can you discuss why there's a need uh, for these court representatives? Yes. Um, so the head, well, let me just say things. So the head count increase in audit was seven positions to a create a much needed new cybersecurity audit division. As you know, we're increasingly, uh, we're incre increasingly uh, reliant on community-based client interface and on the use of cloud computing. And in order for us to do our auditing, we're really gonna have to create a new system and a new way our auditors function. As it relates to the three new court representatives and Bureau of Law and Adjustment, this was also recommended by the Law Department as part of an ongoing effort to ensure that we're conducting an independent review of the Law Department's recommendations to get the best outcomes of the city. But you know, Mr. Chair, the Finance Committee of the City Council has gone from 20 slots to 50 slots, so you've increased your budget by 67%, and I think you're recognizing the complexity of doing budget analysis. And so, like you, we try to keep our hires to a minimum, and uh, I look forward to continuing that conversation. Well, I with can't you. say I'm not grateful for the additional staff that we have. Of course. They've been wonderful this no, year. No, no, it feels absolutely. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the business corporation tax. Uh, collections from the business corporation tax seem to be on track to rebound this fiscal year. In fact, year to date collections as of April 19 are about 17% more than the same period last year. As a result, OMB is forecasting a 12.6% increase in collection for fiscal 19. This would be the first growth in the business corporation tax collections since the 2015 business tax reform. Your office sees an even stronger growth in the business corporation tax than OMB in fiscal 2020. To what do you attribute um, the pickup in this tax? Yeah. I mean, I, we think that it's part of but because of the 2017 uh, tax, uh, tax law that lowered corporate tax rates. So now it's an advantage to switch to a partnership or a corporation for tax filing purposes. Like BlackRock is a prominent example of a partnership that recently incorporated to take advantage of this change in the federal tax law. We think there is gonna be more switching of filing status, but I can't tell you today how or if that's gonna impact our tax revenues yet. And we're gonna to have to work together to monitor that, um, but I don't have data that would support an opinion one way or another. So essentially I think what you're saying is that there could be a, a decrease in the unincorporated business tax and an increase in the corporate business tax. Yes. And that's due to the Trump tax changes in 17. Yes. Okay, interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit now about the pension actuary error. The uh, executive budget reflects increased contributions to one of the city's pension funds totaling 150 million annually in fiscal 2019 through 22. This cost is associated for the approximately 2,900 active members that were previously excluded from the pension system census data due to a coding error. Can you comment, excuse me, <clears throat> on what happened here and what you think about it and who exactly are these workers and do you know how long the city has failed to contribute for them? Well, let me, let me say that uh, this was a malfunction and a mistake by NICERS. So we um, obviously were very concerned and the only good news in this was that, was that the NICERS auditors actually caught this. So the system of checks and balances worked. But having said that, there is no excuse for this pension fund to have missed this, and it obviously cost the city, and that's not right. Um, I don't have all of the information for you on NICERS because it's not a controller issue, it's a NICERS issue, and we're certainly monitor monitoring it as we monitor all the pension funds. Uh, auditors, you should know, did not find problems at other systems. I am told that NICERS has now done a thorough scrub working with the actuary of their data. Uh, I think all the five systems are migrating to better, more reliable data systems, but it's important to realize that we have to get to a data system that is really full, you know, foolproof. Um, but 
to answer your question about the workers, approximately 2,900 NYSERS participants who transferred into NYSERS from other retirement systems were mistakenly coded as having transferred out of NYSERS. So this is, this is a pretty, you know, a, a pretty, this was a bad era, and I'm not making light of it, and we certainly work with NYSERS. And uh, you said that there's a, a scrub by the other um, uh, systems. And I am told that the other, the, the, uh, other systems have scrubbed for the same issues, and we had no identical problems there. Okay, so you're feeling confident that... I am, and if I, see, if I, if I hear differently, I will come to you and, and, and alert you before we meet again next year. Okay, thank you, Controller. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about risks. In a February 7th press conference, Mayor de Blasio stated that there was an unusual level of uncertainty facing the fiscal 2020 budget. In particular, he cited three challenges, which were the economy and the risk of recession, the state budget, and federal policy. While the state budget process is done and we have a, a better sense of the impact on the city, challenges with federal policy and the economy continue to be uncertain. Uh, what is your view of these remaining challenges in the city's budget, and do you foresee any of these challenges having an impact on the 2020 executive budget? Look, look uh, the, the point I, I, I've made over the last couple of years coming to testify is that there are some risks out there. You know, uh, Trump's Washington is full of uh, risk every day. We see that in so many different ways. This is not administration in Washington that cares a whole lot about what happens to people in New York City, so that's a risk. Uh, we have to be careful that we continue to put away money for a rainy day. God forbid a terrorist attack. God forbid another Sandy. We really, we, we see our vulnerabilities after something happens. I think because our economy has given us some more revenue than we've seen in other administrations, I would just urge that don't stop at the $250 million you're proposing to put away. See if you can do, do much more. It is important that we really prepare for anything that comes our way. And we seem to be stuck at that 11%. I know you're not going to go to the 18%, nor should you. We have to gradually put away money for a rainy day. And I respect and appreciate uh, that the council has to contend with many different priorities and the decisions you make or decisions I support, uh, I would just urge you now in these times when it is easy to do it, to put, to put the money away. I think that's a, that's a victory for everybody and for the people in the city. We are at 11 percent? I thought we were lower than that at this point. We're about 11, maybe about 11? a smidgen other, but let's call it, a, for rounding I would say 11. Okay, all right. And I'll stand by that. Okay, good. And, and you'd like us to be like 13 to Look, 18. the optimal is 18, but right. that would cost billions of dollars. We're not going to get there overnight, right. and there's obviously a lot of pressing needs in the city, but I do think we can incrementally do better um, in the time that we're in office. And I would like to see us, you know, at a point where we can weather any storm that comes our way. You know, it, it, it gets vulnerable for our city when we then have to go to Washington for help or the state to help, if we know that we have full reserves and what we can deal with whatever happens, then I think we're all better for it. Okay, so you're looking for a AAA rating? Well, we've had some success in the bond market. We are seeing, uh, you know, uh, Moody's with a better rating. So, you know, we have, we have sh you know, there's a lot of good news here. You know, I come here and tell you all the you know, the things to watch out for, but we also should take, all of us take credit in, you know, the Moody's upgrade, and, and I think that's helpful too. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have some questions from uh, my colleagues. Cal uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Jonai, and Councilmember Deutsch has questions, followed by Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Controller. Um, so with a $92.5 billion uh, budget, which I think since we came into the Council is like $20 billion more, than when we, when we first came in. Um, we have, um, the mayor has called for a higher freeze in all the agencies. So how does the controller monitor the higher freeze, for example, uh, to see how it affects uh, New Yorkers? Uh, the NYPD, they have uh, overtime freeze, and for example, my committee, the, the ch uh, ch as being the chair of veterans. Well, they don't have, there is a higher the NYPD freeze. doesn't have a hiring freeze. No, they have a. If you're uh, in Iowa. 
they're not. <laughs> they, well, they have uh, overtime uh, freeze, and uh, my committee uh, is being chaired the veterans. Uh, there's a higher freeze, and this is all the agencies across the board. So how do you monitor that if the mayor is doing the right thing, and how do you weigh in on this? Well, a couple of ways. Um, you know, we won't audit because we have to see impact, right? So we're just seeing the, the hiring freeze now. We'll probably be at your council hearings uh, when you start asking those tough questions before you adopt the budget. And we will be in the room looking at ways to do our own due diligence. Make no mistake, we're gonna be right there with you. One of the ways we do it is we put together uh, my, our watch list, we identified three agencies that were concerned about performance, and we'll continue to monitor the, hi the hiring free as part of our performance evaluations. Yeah, because now we're ready, we're at the end of the budget process where we need to negotiate with Look, I think before you adopt the budget, these are the questions you're gonna have to ask. You're the ones who bring in uh, the agencies, you're the ones who ask the tough questions, and uh, I could use some help with that. Um, it makes it easier to hear what you're saying so then we can do our audits and our own uh, independent investigations. But I will work side by side with you. Thank you. Uh, and another note, um, at my veterans hearing just about three, four months ago, where I had Department of Health, where I called out Thrive NYC on the $250 million annual budget, and that's when things blew up, where people were looking at it. And I'm sorry, say, say, repeat that? That's when things blew up with Thrive NYC, when I didn't see anything in my district, when I see very minimum that um, on their $250 million budget that goes towards veteran, especially where you have 20 veterans uh, that commit suicide each and every day here in, here in the United States mm -hmm. of America. Um, so I called them out on the $250 million, how it's spent, and, and also, um, I think that if an agency that has a budget of $1 billion over four years, then I think that all 8.6 million New Yorkers should know about uh, that there is mental health services, not just a small amount. So how, um, how did, the two, how did the Thrive's budget not be detected by the controller's office, and how are you gonna continue monitoring that they properly do what they need to do, and, and also uh, spend the money, the funding wisely, because uh, we also asked for a cut on Thrive NYC, and uh, the, the administration came back that they're not willing to take that full cut that we asked them um, to reduce because they haven't spent that. So, so this is a couple things. Um, part of the due diligence that you do is to ask these questions when you see ballooning costs we do the same. One of the ways that they have been able to escape uh, review is they have not entered, there's no Thrive budget codes, right? So when we see checkbook or other ways of evaluating this, it's because we see the code. We, as you know, sent a letter this morning talking about developing a, tra a transparency tool we should have budget codes relating to Thrive if programs are coming through Thrive, if, and that's something that we have to look at. And as you know, our office has been the most aggressive in challenging uh, the serious issues impacting Thrive. We have looked at this uh, today, where we released the letter showing that we're very concerned about the programs that do not measure for success we're very concerned about a budget that is not transparent. And again, I urge you to take the information we sent to Thrive NYC today and perhaps help us by asking some of these questions. And I, one of the reasons why I like coming here today is because it gives us an opportunity to commit to work together. But I, again, could use some help because you have the ability to hold hearings and challenge under the charter, I can do an audit, but no one's gonna come and testify before me. I testify before you, and agencies testify before you. So don't stop, keep asking those questions. And let's also remember, and I praise the mayor and the first lady, Thrive and Mental Health Services is very important. It's necessary, and I commend them for making that a priority of the city. But Thrive has to be consistent. 
We see too many programs in Thrive and then taken out of Thrive. We see $177 million that was used for mental health services in the prison system under Thrive, but then it gets pulled out. It's still there operating somewhere else. I think that if we could create a more transparent protocol for Thrive, looking at a budget codes, looking at more testimony, I think the public would embrace Thrive once we identify what it actually is. Yeah, so the concept is good, and people need mental health, but um, the money is not everything, but you need to know how to spend that money, and that's why I'm asking the controller. And, and finally, I just want to ask the controller one other thing, that when you do measure the success uh, um, of Thrive uh, from now ongoing, uh, if you could also take a look at the lack of services for other services, for example, sexual offenders. So if someone is a sexual offender and they need to go for help, um, a, a, therap a therapist could cost them three, four hundred dollars an hour, where if a person cannot afford it, then they're out in the street again and they, they'll continue doing what they're doing. And that's one reason why I asked for a ban on sexual um, predators for who are recidivists in the transit system. And I asked Rive at the last hearing that I questioned them if they have services for sexual offenders, and they told me, no, we don't deal with that community. And I think that they should deal with that community because this is something important and it's not spoken about. So I'd just like to ask the controller if you could take a look when you measure their success just to make sure they expand their programs in other ways to protect um, the women of, that live here in the city. So, so not to shirk responsibility in any way. I think that is what you should be doing. You should be sitting with the Thrive folks and you should be talking about the programs you want to see in your communities and to ask those tough questions. Uh, you know, from, I will work with you and stand with you because I also have ideas, but I think the best way we can work together is for you to help create a transparent Thrive budget, get them to put the codes in that would allow me to take a look at Thrive spending, we want very much to have a consistent Thrive, identify what Thrive is. Maybe Thrive can't do all the things that you want, but we should at least arrive at a place where we can identify Thrive programs. And if those programs don't fall under Thrive and we still want to have Thrive, then we should also look at other buckets, whether it's funding for people who are sometimes are left out who need help as well. And I'll work with you on that, Council Fred, Member. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Councilmember Cohen, followed by Joe Knight. We've also been joined by Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer. Uh, still, I think, good morning, Controller. Thank you for your testimony. Can I just say thank you to the Council? These are the most Council members have listened to my testimony in six years. Can I just say <laughs> thank you very much? I, thank you. Thank you. Let's give them a round of Can we just, this is great. I don't think we're allowed to. <laughs> to the, for the City Controller, I am... Preston, this is never going to happen again. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I want to ask a little bit also about the rainy day fund. Like, I mean, is 11% like if we have light showers? If we, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to get a scope because that money does have to come from somewhere. Yeah. And I think that we, you know, it's insurance essentially, and we should insure against realistic risks. Where do you think we are at 11%? Where do you think, you know, in terms of what, what do we get as for our money if we put it away? Look, I, I think that I th we've long identified the optimal gold standard of 18 percent. Uh, we had that uh, under the Bloomberg years. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to be at 18. That's optimal. All I've really said is the more we put away every year, you know, we started at, what, 8 percent? You know, some years ago, we've been fighting now, so we're at 8, we're now at 11. If we get to 12 or 13, I do think it gives us more options in the event something happens. And you're absolutely right. The balance is if you put away money, right? Um, you know, it, it, you know, the, if you put away money, well, it, you could end up not funding something you really want to. Those are important decisions you you got to make. But I come here telling you. Uh, to make sure that we have enough to deal with some crisis. You know, it's the, you know, uh, you know, Aesop's fable, you know, about that grasshopper, man. You, you know, if you don't eat, it's trouble. No, right? but we do have stores. I mean, like you said, it's the 11%. And mm -hmm. again, I, I want to sort of get, if you have a better sense of the risk uh, 
in terms of you know what we should really well, the, realistically insure the, against the, the, the risk is essentially self-insuring against a downturn the the, the risk is uh, you know we tend to deplete our savings pretty fast after a terrorist attack or a hurricane so you know it's hard for me to to tell you what's coming our way I do know uh, having walked the streets after 9/11 and walked the streets after Sandy, that you know it, the, the building it back and making sure that the city has necessary reserves is is just incredibly important. And look, the big risk factor is one: we've had a recovery that has gone on longer than anyone ever thought. So it, you start to forget, you know, 2008 and you know other times. We we haven't had a calamity, thank God, and 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 but you tend to get, you know, a little less focused on it. I'm just here to tell you that as you make your important funding decisions, if you cream a little off the top and put it away, uh, maybe some new council, some new controller, some new mayor, 10, 20 years from now, will remember this time and said, you know, they didn't spend it all. And we just got to, you know, I'll work with you to give you our economists and some of their views, but this is not my, uh, you know, optimal range. We really try to look at the, eco the economy, we look at some of the risks involved, and then we look at past experiences. And unfortunately, I know all of you around the room, we've all been there in very tough times. Okay. Uh, you know, actually, yesterday I, I asked Mock Jay about uh, if there was sort of a, a peace dividend in terms of the you know, the, the reduction in population uh, at Rikers uh, and the cost of operating, and they were not, <laughs> they were not uh, clear at all, actually. And uh, I'm actually yeah. surprised to hear you throw around the figure of 300,000, because I believe when I came into office and I, the population was much higher in Rikers, but I thought the number was in the $150,000 range. So we calculate all the costs for that detainee, the overtime, the, the, the cost of running the facility, and and we and we get to that number. Um, we we have seen an incredible uptick in the amount of money that we're spending there. Even though it's counterintuitive, you would think money would yes. be saved. You're absolutely right, and that we would see as the population comes down, we would see real savings. We've actually seen more cost, more overtime, less inmates, more violence violence on inmates, violence on correction officers, the place has not been, you know, has, is, it, the, the place has not been fortified. And I'd be happy to work with you to share more of our budget information as it relates to Rikers. We've done a number of analyses on the Rikers budget and what's happening there. And I'd love for you to share it with you. I can send you stuff tomorrow. Mr. Chair, I have one more if you don't mind. Quick. Oh, uh, this is anecdotal, but uh, huh? it seems to me that I, I, I've heard about a significant number of settle, legal settlements against the city that seem uh, to me to uh, defy credulity. And I, I'm wondering if, if there's been a rise in that or what, what the status is of civil settlements against the city. Well, I have some good news. Okay. Total settlements have started to come down. And that is in part because the controller's office has led an aggressive effort through ClaimStat to manage risks. And we've partnered for the first time in history with agencies from the police department to sanitation to DCAS. All of these agencies <coughs> should really be commended for looking at ways to bring down the claims. And the fact that they're working with the controller's office is, I think, a real testament to the commissioners who see this as a problem. The amount, the amount paid out in settlements and judgments in FY 2018 decreased by 19 percent compared to FY 2017, uh, and so that is a big number for us. We're starting to see some daylight. Um, and also, when you exclude legacy tort claims that were filed before 2009, payouts declined from $640 million in FY 2017 to 543 million in FY 2018. So, council member, there is, uh, we, we, you know, we, we're really trying, and we've had some success. Now, pre-litigation settlements, as many of you know, we conduct risk management and legal analysis to determine whether to settle a claim pre-litigation, and we are also playing a major role in trying to do that through the lens of what, bet, you know, what's in the best interests of the city. 
Uh, that's great news. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, now we have uh, Councilmember Joe Nye. Thank you, Chair. So good to see you. Councilmember, how are you? Excellent. I'm not sure what title you refer to now, controller, comptroller, uh, but I refer to you as um, uncle, so I'm okay with that title. Wow. Well, please know I'm always in comptroll, and uh, if you're in the, if you work for the Daily News, I'm in control. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you for that uh, clarity. Thank you. Um, we've been hearing uh, again at roughly ten thousand. $800 per capita, per every man, woman, and child, we have the highest budget in the nation. And with those kind of numbers of $92.5 billion, New Yorkers shouldn't want for anything. We should have it all. I am concerned about a recession, that we should ne we're never going to be prepared for it, the rates that we're put in a way. I believe in seven years of feast, prepare for seven years of famine. Uh, we don't adhere to the biblical terms or the history uh, that has often blindsided us. I commend you on the work that you're doing and the partnership that we have and the checks and balances and the important role that we both serve as a body uh, alongside Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a shell game in trying to figure out where the pots of money are in this budget that go unaccounted for. In particular, the headcount, the proposed, the actuals, uh, which create a slush fund for the mayor to use at his own discretion, where we squeeze every penny and we threaten to cut every program and we hit every emotion out there of all those special interest groups that are facing cuts to a miraculously somewhere during the fiscal year we find hundreds of millions of dollars available for pet projects and programming at the mayor's discretion. Quite disturbing. I want you to elaborate a little bit on that, if you will. Roughly, we call them budget shenanigans uh, is what they're referred to. But what, are we prepared for recession? Are we prepared for a natural disaster? The government inefficiencies that you've brought up time and time again, including Rikers, why would that, why would I, and we understand that overhead costs or, or fixed costs remain constant so there can be an increase in per inmate cost, but why is the budget increasing if the number of inmates is decreasing? So, and I'm going to just Yes. I don't want time. I want to ask as many questions and sure. hopefully give you enough time to answer them all. I'm going to forget them all, though. I see a gentleman writing there. He'll remind uh, you. <laughs> the other, uh, throughout the uh, budgetary hearings, I often brought up the government waste. And I've asked commissioners directly, is it criminal when we are spending taxpayer dollars on capital projects, and just to name two, libraries at $2,750 per square foot, condos in New York City are selling for less. Comfort stations of $900 a square foot for some of the most basic structures that can be built. Why aren't we getting ahead of this? We don't have an income problem, we have an expense problem. And we can do so much more. And if we don't have to do more, at least we can have that money remain right. in the pockets of our taxpayers. Yeah. I also called on you um, to evaluate all of the city-owned property that we have. And we know there are audits being done on vacancies that we have within our own buildings. Well, I've, I've done that. Why are we leasing additional properties and office so, space? So only because there are so, there's so many questions. Let me just start out with the ones I remember. So part of what, what, I, what I would say is, you know, you and I served in the assembly and that was a unique set of budget challenges in terms of how the budgets were made in Albany. Uh, you know, the city has its own budget dance. Uh, it's gotten better over the years, but 
a lot of this is the mayor needs wins, the council needs wins, the controller needs more revenue, right? So I would just argue that in the weeks that are coming up, uh, you know, try, you know, to have a more transparent budget discussion that will balance the, uh, the need to save for that rainy day or that recession and also provide vital services for the city. Uh, I do not set, subscribe to the notion that all agencies are spending into the ground. I've never said that. I, I've identified specific areas where we should have better policy and streamlined spending, but, I'll, but as you know in this big budget, uh, a lot of these are fixed costs, federal dollars, state dollars, the police force. When you start adding up what this budget is, there's very little move money. You see that with council discretionary money, right? It's relatively small, but people need it. Uh, very small when you think about a $92 billion budget. It would be helpful to talk about budget reform and how better we can get to that product, and I'd be happy to sit with your council member and work on that. Can you answer some of the other questions, including the shenanigans with the head count well, shell Well, game? I don't call that shenanigans. I like to refer to that as the budget dance. And again, one of the things I've tried to say to some, some council members today is the best way for us to work together is if you do the hearings, and ask the tough questions, I will be in the room making sure I do my job. And you haven't been following my hearings. I asked those questions. All right, well, I gotta get some of those hearings. Uh, and as far as the corruption um, in around the capital costs of projects that are unfounded? Well, corruption, when, when you say the word corruption, then you should be willing to make a referral to a law enforcement agency. Great. If you have, if you, if you, square foot if you, have it, if you have information that you want to bring to me, I will find the right authority. But that that's a that's a heavy statement. You know, you got to back that up. I could talk about mismanagement and finances or money better spent. Happy to have that conversation with you. And Thank we you. need to move on. So because uh, I have um, IBO coming in, and then we have the speaker, and the public portion is already seven minutes behind. So. I'm going this to is the year of the controller. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Joe and I to, uh, if we can end it here, because I need to move thank along. You, okay. Thank and you, Councilmember. And I want to thank the controller very much for coming in and thank spending you. so much time with us. We appreciate it very, very much. Thank, thank you. And Councilmember, you chair an amazing committee. The work you do uh, has always benefited the city. So I want to thank you for your courtesy and your tough questioning, but thank you for everything you and all the members do for the city of New York. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we're going to go right into uh, IBO. Um, so I say that they're here. Thank you again. Lose everybody, but they can't go too far. So you have to just come back for. Uh, they really stick around for the mayor or for the public. They used to. But then again, the gallery, you know, the balcony used to be full also. So I don't know. Damn it. Okay, I know I, I should not be um, in any way concerned. <laughs> you're, you're on. Okay.
Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for, 20, for Fiscal 2020. I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. No, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Helen Rosenthal is here. Councilmember Helen Rosenthal has joined us. Uh, we just heard from the controller, and now we will hear from Ronnie Lowenstein, the director of the Independent Budget Office. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement. So we're going to go right to you, director. And I should say that I'm joined by George Sweeting, who's IBO's deputy director. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, in an effort to be brief, I'm going to spare you my reading of my testimony and just give you a few highlights. The bottom line on all of it is, despite an economic forecast of considerably slower U.S. and local growth, particularly for 2020, um, we expect the city's fiscal condition to remain relatively stable, with gaps of a size that we've managed relatively easily in the past, and a level of revenues that could largely take care of the gaps over the next few years. Starting with the econ, um, we expect that strong growth that we've enjoyed over the, over the whole of the expansion, largely, uh, to taper off towards the end of this calendar year and throughout next calendar year. Um, particularly sharp slowdown in 2020. Um, we're expecting that the U.S. economy will grow 2.7 percent in inflation-adjusted terms this year, which is just slightly slower than we grew last year. Um, but like most forecasters, including those at OMB and those at Council Finance, um, we're projecting much weaker U.S. growth next year. Um, we're expecting at IBO uh, growth of 1.6 percent in GDP. Um, and there are a bunch of reasons for that, but I think the biggest reason is that the fiscal stimulus um, of the tax cuts and increases in spending uh, that we've that have bolstered growth over the past couple of years are starting to wane. And what was fiscal, fiscal stimulus is really turning into fiscal drag. Um, so that weakness in the U.S. economy, we expect to show up as weakness in the local economy as well. We're expecting the city to add 73,000 jobs this year, but just 34,000 next year, which is less than half of this year's gains. And it's only about a third of the nearly 100,000 jobs on average that the city's gained over the course of the expansion, that is, since the recession. Moreover, the mix of jobs has been changing. Most notably, 40 out of the 93,000 jobs the city added last year came in two sectors, home health care services and individual and family services. In fact, New York City added more home health care services jobs last year than the rest of the country as a whole. Um, job, it's great to have more jobs. If you'd like me to go into more detail on this, I will. Uh, but these jobs are largely part-time and largely lower-wage jobs. Um, and so they're having less of an impact throughout the local economy than they would if these were full-time, better-paying jobs. And 40 out of 93 is just a huge share. Okay, so what does that mean for the city budget? Let's start with city tax revenues, not surprisingly. We're expecting growth in city tax revenues to slow over the plan period. We're expecting an average rate of increase over the financial plan of 3.7% a year. That's through FY18, FY18 through 23. If we do see tax revenue growth along those lines, that would be the slowest five-year average uh, throughout the expansion. Um, it's being powered by property taxes, where we expect to see the strongest and steadiest growth, um, with, with an average growth rate of 5.5% a year, which is amazing. Um, and if that happens, we would expect that total property tax revenues would be $34 billion at the end of the financial plan period, which would be uh, virtually half of all city tax revenue. And that's an important to dis discussion to have as well. Um, in contrast, if you look at the cyclically sensitive taxes, like the personal income tax, we're expecting an average increase of roughly 1.6% a year. So turning to the other side of the ledger, um, the executive budget is proposing relatively modest increases in city spending. 
Uh, there are no proposals for new big ticket items. Um, whatever spending growth we're seeing is largely attributable to unforeseen increases in the cost of providing services, like it's going to cost more for Carter cases for uh, this year than we had anticipated. Um, and also to a, a number of actions in the state budget, um, including unfunded mandates uh, for uh, election reform and uh, providing for early voting, for example. Um, after adjusting for the use of prior year surpluses and reserve funds, we project that city funded spending is going to be rising an average of 3.3% a year over the plan period. So if you put those numbers together, tax revenues are rising at an average rate of 3.7%, city funded spending at an average rate of 3.3%. Um, our city's fiscal condition remains sound, despite our expectation that growth, particularly next year, is going to be very slow. We're expecting this year to end with a surplus of 3.9 billion, which is $375 million more than OMB projects. And we're also anticipating a surplus for next year of 675 million, um, while OMB sees the year as balanced. Assuming those surpluses get used to help us bring 2021 into balance, um, we're left with a 2021 gap of 1.7 billion which is just 2.3% of city funded spending, um, and an amount that would largely be covered by the reserves already built into the city budget for that year. Um, it's not all rosy, absolutely not, but under some fairly um, conservative assumptions about economic growth, particularly in the near term, uh, the city is in good shape over the next few years. Uh, thank you, and I'd be delighted to answer your questions. Thank you. I'm going to jump around a little bit because you said a number of interesting things. I'm just curious to know if you know who is taking those health aids jobs, the low-paying jobs that you're talking about. Ah, that's particularly interesting. Um, there's a program in New York State called the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program. Um, kind of hard to put into an acronym. But basically, um, seniors and disabled who are on Medicaid who need personal assistance are now able to tap people such as relatives or friends who may have been providing them with care in the past and actually have them provide that care or entice them to provide care um, with payment through Medicaid. Mm -hmm. All of that makes a great deal of sense, um, but it appears, and we don't have proof of this at, at this point, but it appears that's driven up uh, the number of caregivers and fiscal intermediaries who are being funded through Medicaid dollars um, and has been in large part responsible for this really huge surge in health, home health care and individual and family assistance services over the past few years. Is there any savings, therefore, in uh, nursing home care? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I really don't know. And if this is something we can look into, we will. Yeah, I think it was one of the objectives of uh, creating the program uh, was to you know, prevent people from having to go into nursing homes sooner than they would have to if they could provide some type of at-home care. So curious to know. And, and I was just wondering, too, if it's mostly family members who's taking advantage of the program or if it's outsiders. So love if to get can, more information. If we can get data on any of that, we will. And we'll keep you informed about whether okay, we can great. get it. All right. Thank you. Um, budget risk. As of February uh, 7th, uh, at a press conference, Mayor de Blasio stated that there was an unusual level of uncertainty faced in the fiscal 2020 budget. In particular, he cited three challenges, which were the economy and the risk of recession, the state budget and federal policy. While the state budget uh, process is done and we have a better sense of the impact on the city, challenges with federal policy and the economy continue to be imminent. Uh, what is IBO's view of these budget risks? Are there any steps the city should take to proactively address these risks? Other than what we are taking, I guess, at this point. Um, I think the city is, has reserves that position us to deal near term with some of these risks. Um, and maybe I should amplify uh, a point that started with the controller. 
Um, whether the reserves are sufficient uh, to tide you through a downturn, um, we would say that that's actually not the role of the reserves. Um, reserves are there from our perspective, not to fill the hole, but rather to buy you enough time to make the policy changes, whether it's cuts in spending or increases in taxes or shifts in funding that will see you through. If we were to build reserves to a point where it would, they would see us through even a, a relatively modest downturn, those reserves, particularly given how our reserves are currently structured, would be a huge target, uh, particularly for Albany. And if you think of all the risks that we're facing, those risks that come down the throughway, uh, particularly for the MTA or from the feds uh, on NYCHA or through health and hospitals, um, are, are major. So you know, we have a somewhat different viewpoint on the reserves. Um, I think uh, we've also expressed, particularly to the Charter Revision Commission, uh, concerns about the structure of the reserves. Um, in part because the Retiree Health Benefits Trust, um, there's a limit to how much you can get out in a single year. So if the current limit to what you can get out in a year is uh, something in the vicinity of two and a half billion, uh, putting more than five billion in means that it's gonna have to be a really long recession uh, to, to continue to draw down that fund. Say nothing of the fact that the fund really provides um, some assistance in those long-term liabilities that we're all concerned about. And in terms of the other reserves, you know, they're just a real tempting target. And there are no restrictions for drawing down either set of reserves, even if it's not raining. Okay, thank you. Um, let me uh, go to another thing that you had mentioned in your uh, testimony, which was the uh, growth in Carter cases but I know that another piece of uh, large growth in the Department of Education's budget was also for charter schools. I think it was somewhere in the range of about $100 million. Uh, do you see that as a potential problem for us in the future, the continued cost of uh, charter schools? Um, George, correct me if I'm wrong, or, okay, but the increase uh, going into the budget for charter schools is funding the natural expansion of those schools as they add grades year in and year out. Um, I, it doesn't take any special forecasting expertise to know that if you have a fifth grade now, there's going to be a sixth grade next year. And I don't understand why the administration has often failed to add those funds earlier in the budget process. So you would see an increase coming in terms of how much we have to spend uh, until those slots are essentially all filled up? Yes, but the perhaps good news is that you know, particularly at the moment with the cap still in place, um, you know, we will run, we will run out of that issue uh, in the, you know, presumably in the next few years. But if the cap were to be raised, the city would then have to um, in, endure that cost. Uh, yes, it would. And, you know, it, we, we've been, this has been in a, uh, we call it a re-estimate or repricing, you know, our review of the, the mayor's budget uh, financial plans for probably 10 years now, we've been pointing out that they're not accounting for this every year, you know, and they're still not. In some way, I think they were hoping for some state action on it, but it hasn't happened, so, yeah. All right, uh, personal income tax. The personal income tax collections seem to have bounced back from the weak collections we saw this past December and January. Estimated payments for the month of April was about 1.4 billion, nine-tenths of which were made up of extension payments. This is a 65, this is 65 percent more than April of last year. So is this an indication of a rebound, an ongoing strength in the estimated payments? We actually think it's something to be concerned about um, because a significant uh, portion of those estimated payments uh, were associated with, with requests for extension, um, which means, uh, you know, that it doesn't necessarily indicate that just basic regular, 
more regular estimated payments were growing that rapidly in, uh, in the first quarter. Um, the, it, in many cases, when people file for an extension, and the reason we think extension filing was so much higher this year than, than in, in recent past is because people are still trying to figure out exactly what all the changes from the, the federal tax reform mean for their individual tax returns. And so we suspect that what a lot of people have done is file for an extension in April. And uh, in most cases, when you file for an extension and you make, a, you make an estimated payment, you wind up actually ha having extra money on account, which means you're going to ask for a refund in the fall. Um, so, you know, we have an expectation that refunds will actually be much higher in the fall than, um, uh, you know, the, than you typically have. So we don't see this really as evidence of, uh, you know, a, certainly any strong new um, rebound in estimated payments. And so you're, you're concerned mostly about those refunds coming in later on in the year? That's certainly, I don't know if it's the most concerning, but it's certainly something that, uh, you know, we're, we, we flagged and we're, we're going to pay attention to. Um, okay. Um, business corporation tax. Collections from the business corporation tax seem to be on track to rebound this fiscal year. In fact, year-to-date collections as of April 19 are about 17% more than the same period last year. As a result, OMB is forecasting 12.6% increase in collection for fiscal 19. This would be the first growth in the business corporation tax collections since the 2015 business tax reform. Um, what factors are causing the higher than expected collections? And, you know, I referred a little bit to this um, with um, Department of Finance and I think the controller as well. You know, we, we think a lot of it has to do with the, all of these changes that have been going on, both at the, the state and local level uh, with the, the uh, business uh, tax reform uh, in 2015, and then the, uh, the layering on of the, the, some of the implications of the, the federal tax changes uh, a couple years later. So just to go back, in 20, when the, the state law was changed, and it also affected the city law, um, it, you know, it had really significant changes for the city's business income taxes. And there were real questions about exactly how much li people's liabilities would change. There were also just some processing issues. There was, um, for a while, the city had not developed the tax return forms that people needed to file. And, people were encouraged to go ahead and file extensions instead of finals. So all of that delayed the process of seeing exactly what the um, impact of the, the 2015 changes were. Um, and then on top of that, you now have the federal changes, which basically, one of the consequences of the federal changes is to broaden the business tax base so that there's more income subject. And some of that is, is uh, income that had, had been overseas, that uh, there are now um, in reasons for companies to bring back, uh, bring back money that they've, that they've kept overseas, profits that they've kept overseas. At the federal level, they then, you know, having broadened the base, they then cut the tax rate so that the, the effect was still actually a tax cut at the federal level. For the city, we've got this addition to our tax base, and there hasn't been a corresponding change in the tax rate. So at least part of the story, we think, is the fact that you've got more income subject to tax because of the federal changes. And then um, our rates basically remain as they were. So you know, we're getting ex we, we think that accounts for why, why it looks like there's uh, a lot of, of new revenue this year. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, and we have been joined by Councilmembers Gibson and Cornegie, and then uh, shortly we are expecting the speaker. Oh, great. Thank you so much, That's, Chair Drum. You'll have to be the last question. <laughs> Sorry? You'll have to be the last questioner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much, Chair Drum, and, and thank you always to both of you who bring such wisdom to the Council. Um, we really appreciate that. 
I'm wondering, and I was just looking it up very quickly, but have you, uh, has IBO ever looked at um, the human service contracts uh, with an eye toward um, the payment the city gives, the, the breadth of the payment, and also about procurement and whether or not that affects cost and provision of services. When you refer to the breadth of the payment, are you referring to contracts that are actually below the cost of providing the services? Is yes. that That's the issue. Um, we've never done research on it. Um, we've had uh, conversations with many people in the industry who've decried this. and. Uh, our current advisory board chair, Jennifer March, from the Citizens Committee for Children, and her predecessor, uh, Nancy Waxstein, <laughs> um, uh, from uh, UNH. UNH. Yeah. I'm trying to get the underlying name. Um, these are huge issues uh, for them. It seems inappropriate from where we would sit. You know, why would you increase services if every additional child you serve is going to lead you further in the red, um, but the access to that in information, those contracts is something we've never had. So other than, I think, lending a sympathetic ear, um, we've been stymied in trying to do something, in, do empirical analysis on the issue. According to Sea Change, which is a consulting yeah. company that looks at the human services sector, it costs the sector about, I forget the number, $782 million a year because they're paid late. I'm just late. Not even with the short change in the amount of money they get compared to the service they provide. Would you be interested, and I'll shoot you a letter about this formally, in doing some analysis, an IBO looking at how much we shortchange the human service sector, the different reasons why, and what the impact on um, the city's, both the city's budget would be, sure, should we meet our, our responsibility, but also on the city economy to the extent that we pay workers in this industry a living wage, you know, primarily women of color in low income women of color who are single family, single female head of households, what the impact on the economy would be if we were to pay them living wages. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, our past attempt, we would love to, but our past attempts to look into the information um, really didn't get very far because it's all these separate contracts from so many different places. Um, is there something to add about that? I mean, certainly we have a desire to do it, but we've been stymied. I don't want to lead you astray. And as far as the impact, economic impact, I just remember that <coughs> Increasing wages for any sector um, is going to look like a very small fraction. It looked like a big number, but as a share of the city's economy, it's some tiny, teeny percentage that doesn't do justice to the issues that are raised here. Thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to sit down and talk to you about it with folks on our staff who have been trying to run up against it in the past. Appreciate that. Look forward to it. That would be it. great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming in. We're going to, we're a little bit late starting the public portion, so we're going to get started with that in about five minutes. And we appreciate you coming in and giving testimony. Thank you. Always good to hear from you. Thank you. Okay. We'll take a quick five minute break and then we'll start with the public portion.
Okay, we will now begin the public session of the Council's Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget Hearings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for joining us. Any member of the public who wishes to testify must fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms. We will endeavor to group the witnesses by topic, so please indicate the topic of your testimony on the witness slip. We understand that seniors, students, or people with disabilities may need to leave by a certain time, and we will try to accommodate that need by putting you on one of the earlier witness panels. If you need such an accommodation, please write it on your witness slip or speak with one of the sergeant at arms. If you wish to submit testimony for the official record, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the record. Uh, we will accept testimony through 5 p.m. on Thursday, May 30th, and we will be limiting panelists to two minutes each when they come up to speak. So we have many, many, many people who want to speak, so I have to be somewhat strict about that. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum. I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon, a very important day uh, for the Council throughout the budget process to hear from the public about priorities that New Yorkers have uh, across our great city. And I, I really just wanted to thank you for being here today. I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your busy days to be here to testify on matters that are important to you. Last year at the public portion of the executive budget hearings, we uh, heard from a variety of witnesses and it really did inform our negotiations moving forward. I remember last year during this portion of the budget hearings, there were, I think, five or six parents that uh, came and testified about accessibility in the school system and spoke in a very um, heartfelt way about the lack of accessibility. And from that testimony, we were able to uh, negotiate $150 million uh, for accessibility in schools. So your testimony here today really does matter. It's not pro forma. Uh, it is meaningful to me and to Chair Drum. And I see we're joined by Councilmember Van Bramer, the chair of our Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee. And we are joined by Vanessa Gibson, the chair of our subcommittee on capital. Uh, and uh, we're all grateful that you are here today. We're joined by uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, who's in the back. And we look forward to hearing from you. I just wanted to personally thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here and let you know that the council members that are present, the council members that are not present, and the staff here will look over and take into account all of the testimony that is given or submitted for the record here today. And with that, I want to turn it back to Chair Drum. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our first panel today will be Maria Policarpo, President Local 1757, DC 37. John Heislop, President Local 1321, Queens Public Library Workers. Joseph Reese, I believe, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Okay, thank you. Local 374, DC 37. Ron Barber, uh, President Local 1482. And Vincent Tolls, Treasurer Local 1505. If you'd like to start over here. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, and fellow members of the City Council. My name is Maria Policarpo. I am president of DC 37, Local 1757, which represents assessors, and I work as an assessor with the New York City Tax Commission. I testified at the March 27th preliminary budget hearing and asked you to reference my original testimony where we urge you to prioritize funding for the hiring of additional assessors in both the Department of Finance and the City Council, and the Tax Commission, I'm sorry. Staffing is currently at a crisis level. There were 40% less assessors in 2018 compared to 2001. This is unacceptable and detrimental. Assessors are responsible for overseeing the valuation of approximately 1.1 million parcels within the five boroughs of New York City. There is hundreds of millions of dollars in uncollected revenue to capture which would be sustainable that could fund vital public services. Cell towers and billboards need regulation and monitoring, along with an audit process for those who do not report the income they produce. Physicals from alterations, new buildings, flip sales, and condo conversions are being missed due to the lack of time an assessor has to spend in the field, the large unmanageable districts they are responsible for, and the many districts that are vacant. Meanwhile, funds are being wasted on technology without the necessary assessors to utilize it. 
Several failed computer tablets that never worked, pictometry, cyclomedia, and now LIDAR. How much is being spent on them and the managers and units created for them versus the cost of hiring additional assessors? The City Council, the City continues to rely more and more on a flawed modeling system which generates poor values. The tax roll is supposed to be produced based on fairness, equity, and transparency. Instead, there are in increasing complaints from frustrated taxpayers because values are incorrect. This is evidenced by the number of property tax appeals filed with the Tax Commission, which is 56,000 plus and counting. The current workforce is insufficient and is being overloaded. Together with a non-competitive salary compared to other jurisdictions, not to mention other titles within New York City, this is causing a recruitment and retention issue with a high attrition rate. The impact of the shortage of assessment staff will be the loss of billions of dollars in tax revenue in the coming years, along with tremendous liability incurred if property tax appeals are not settled. And this is reckless considering the enormity of what we are responsible for. Local 1757 thanks you for your time and consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, I'll be speaking for all three of the library system. Okay. Um, it does allow me a little bit more time. Uh, good afternoon, Chair uh, Daniel Drum, Speaker Corey Johnson, and fellow committee members. Thank you for giving me and my fellow presidents and this opportunity to testify. Uh, myself, Ronaldo Barber, President of Local 1482, uh, Val Colon in his absence, uh, President of Local 1930, John Heislop, President of Local 1321, and Joseph Reese, uh, Vice President of Local 374. Uh, uh, we are here uh, to come before you united in our request for more library funding. Uh, library have thrived with our allies in the city council. You have constantly and consistently supported library funding for library workers to provide six-day service, a wealth of print and non-print non -print material that is unparalleled in this world. Programs and services such as video visitation programs and partnership with the Department of Correction, my library NYC, expanded adult literacy, drag queen story hour, after school stack ID NYC, technology such as free Wi-Fi, uh, circulating tablets and laptops, free computers and printing, and a safe and clean environment for everyone. Also, we are a host for many community groups to have their meetings. Fiscal year 2020 is no different. The City Council supports fully funding New York City's public library. However, and sadly, this mayor has proposed what other mayor has done in the past, cut library funding. If this budget is adopted, it will stop the hiring of qualified frontline workers that our community needs and will have a cascade effect eliminating universal six-day service, restricting the program's library offer, cutting the material budget, cutting technology offering, and even the ability to maintain New York City busy public libraries. Our main concern is the library human capital, the workers who are the library. During the library system's uh, testimony two days ago, much of, those, of the focus was on executive budgets cut to capital funding and exclusion from the 10-year capital plan. This is very real and understandable concern. What was not discussed as much was our human capital, the men and women who keep our libraries open secured our buildings to provide safe space, clean our building to provide a healthy environment, create and support programs and services that not only educate, but entertain our thriving communities, maintain and fix computers, and busy and buy catalog for our library materials. If our funding is cut, then everyone suffers. During their testimony, the library administration provided with a wealth of information documenting our members' hard work and productivity. Our members know how valuable our service are. Throughout our work day, from opening to closing, 
our members come in contact with children, seniors, immigrants, job seekers, everyone. During the weekend summer days, uh, summer months rather, and evenings, working parents who cannot afford alternative relies on the library to provide not just a safe space for their children, but a place where their children can continue to learn and thrive while school is closed. If we do not get the appropriate funding, libraries will not have the necessary staff and branches will close. The outcome may lead to more incidents of children being neglected or youth violence. The city councils know libraries are vital. Everyone knows where the local library is. Everyone knows libraries are open for all. Everyone knows they can trust a library worker. We are truly a democratic institution. At last Tuesday rally before the budget hearing, you heard from one New York Public Library user about how important his library has been to three generations of his family. That was truly a testament of our library workers. The city council knows this and has always made library funding a budget priority. We need the mayor to listen to his constituents and fund our libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Parks is next. Good afternoon, Chair Dom, Speaker Johnson. If you could just pull the mic a little bit closer to you and tilt it down. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon, Chair Dom and Speaker Johnson and members of the Finance Committee. My name is Vincent Toes. I am the treasurer of Local 1505, representing city park workers, CPWs, in the, city, in the New York City Parks and Recreation Department. Our members work in all five boroughs, conducting maintenance in all city parks. I want to start out by thanking the Speaker and the City Council for urging the Mayor to include the funding for the 100 CPWs and 50 gardeners in his fiscal 2020 budget. But this does not go far enough. These 150 positions must be baseline in the City's budget. So these workers do not have to worry ever, every year, whether or not they will have a job. We said it before and we'll say it again, the Department of Parks and Recre Recreation is distinguishedly, distressingly underfunded. The support of the City Council is vital in order to continue to maintain our communities by keeping those underserved parks and communities beautiful. Furthermore, our members make $15.48 to start and it's becoming increasingly difficult to live and raise a family in the city. The city must take a long, hard, wholesale look at how it can take care of its workforce. As we approach the summer, the start of the summer season in the next several weeks, there's a lot of work to be done to prepare the parks for thousands of New Yorkers who will be taking strolls and enjoying the warm weather in the parks. The beautification of parks is important to all New Yorkers, as well as to the thousands of tourists who visit these areas. Once again, I want to thank the City Council for getting the mayor to restore the funding in fiscal, 20, fiscal year 20 for the CPWs and Gardeners line. We are asking you to further push and urge the mayor to baseline these 150 positions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know Councilmember Van Bremer wants to say something. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Drum, and I just want to say thank you to all of you. Obviously, in particular, I am enormously proud to represent uh, all New York City Public Library workers, uh, the three systems, um, and uh, just want to say I really feel very, very proud to be a part of this council with Speaker Johnson and Chair Drum and everyone so united behind libraries. And as I said at the hearing, uh, because I am really proud to have been a library worker for 11 years myself, uh, that uh, you can't have libraries without library workers. And I know, having been one of you for 11 years uh, and now 
having been uh, the chair of this committee for almost 10, uh, 21 years in this fight together to make sure that library workers are respected and New Yorkers get the services and the programs they deserve. So we've been heard, I know we've been heard uh, loud and clear on, on City Hall steps a couple of days ago. Uh, there have certainly been a lot of articles written about our fight uh, for justice for library workers and, and I feel really grateful uh, uh, to have the speaker's support uh, and Chair Drum's support as well as we fight with you to make sure that not only are cuts restored, but that we get what we really need and what library workers get. So I just wanna say thank you, and of course, to all of you, thank you. May, may I say one thing? Sure. Point of privilege. President Dickinson sa says, what's up? Uh, <laughs> Tell him I said hello, one of my favorite people in the world. I really wanna thank you all for being here today and for the work that all of the New York City employees do that you are representing here today, the vital work you do uh, for the assessors and the uh, librarians and library workers and in the Parks Department. The work you do is crucial for the day-to-day -day functioning of New York City and making our city run and keeping us the greatest city in the world. And we couldn't do it without all of you and the hard work of the workforce uh, of the different uh, unions that you're representing here today. So. On behalf of the New York City Council, I want to thank you and the different unions you're representing. Thank you very much. And finally, let me just say that anybody that mentions Drag Queen Story Hour in their testimony gets extra points with me. So <laughs> thank you all for coming in. <laughs> Our next panel will be Lois Kellerman, Roxanne Delgal, Constance Lasold and Lucy Sexton. We're missing someone. Lucy, I don't see Lucy. Oh. Is Lucy Sexton here? All right. Why don't we start here then with this woman? Yeah. Hello, my name is Roxanne Delgado from Pelham Parkway. As a friend of the park group, Friends of Pelham Parkway, I learned a lot about how parks work and how the city does not fund them adequately. New York City Park is a city park agency, but the city expects volunteers and donors to take responsibility for our parks. It is time for the city to take care of the parks as its own city agency, as it does with other city agencies. Due to upzoning, homeless population, and warmer uh, weather due to climate change, we have more usage in our parkway. Due to lack of enforcement, we have lots of illegal dumping and lots of illegal barbecuing. This um, not only burns trees, but it pollutes the air and it takes away the clean air from park goers. The, the United Nations released a report that over one million of species of plants and animals are on the brink of extinction within decades. The report calls on all of us to act, to think globally and act locally. As a park worker recently informed me that parks doesn't plant the trees and plants that will provide natural food source for the wildlife because they don't have the staff to clean up any remaining fruits or seeds on the grounds. That is very shameful. Parks may be um, efficient with the money that they do receive, but it cannot care for our parks adequately. It cannot care for the trees, the wildlife, and for our community with less than 0.59 of 1% of the entire city budget. We need a green deal for our New York City parks, and we need to think globally and act locally. I'd like to thank my city council member, Mark Jonah, who with the limited resource he does have, he does help us clean the park, but we need a dedicated staff. We need someone to care for our parkway. We cannot rely on the residents to continue doing the quick fix that we need. We have sinkholes in our parkway. We have, we have lost over 100 trees in less than two years, and that's because they don't receive TLC. And like, I like to say parks is one of the best, hardest working people. I love them, but they need more staff. Thank you so much, Speaker. Thank you, Council Member Jonai. Thank you very much. Next, please. Just push the button so the red light's on. 
My name is Constance Lessold, and I am the founder of the Committee of 100 to Free the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Again, as you know, it was free for about a whole century until the 90s, and then we basically had three free days, and now we have nothing but half a free day. Brooklyn is not a wealthy borough. Uh, there are many people who really cannot take advantage of it. It's wonderful that the Botanic Gardens allows college students in Brooklyn to come for free. We approve of that. We approve of everybody that gets to come for free. But we need to have the public who is disadvantaged and not in these special groups, like nannies with their children, like homeless people. We don't want homeless people excluded from our parks and gardens. We want them in there relaxing I've suggested yesterday to the head of the Parks Department that we have exercise programs for homeless people in the parks rather than throwing them out or trying to discourage them. Uh, we need to get housing, of course, for homeless people first and foremost, and we're all for that. But getting back to uh, the Botanic Gardens, uh, this situation cannot continue. Civilized countries have free gardens, all of them. And it's wonderful that you have built all these beautiful waterfront gardens, and I have nothing against uh, partnerships, um, but the uh, very wealthy developers who are benefiting by those free waterfront gardens um, cannot be allowed to go and Bill Garden, Bill Bellings the Shadow, the whole Botanic Garden, and uh, <laughs> are predicted to damage half the plant life and others. Now, the other thing I want to mention in here, though, is the uh, community gardens, because the community gardens provide free services to the city, and they are very unhappy right now because of the new leases. They don't cost you anything. People do free work in those, I founded the garden over the, Frank, over the Franklin Avenue shuttle that is called the Brooklyn Botanic Garden Stop. It's been in existence for 30 years providing free recreation for the city. Uh, we need these gardens to be protected. We don't need just developers saying, aha, uh -huh, that's a piece of public land, okay. that's a library, that's a community garden, that's this, therefore we can take it. Okay, Constance, uh, we need to wrap it up. Okay, well, I'm counting on you because that community garden over the Franklin Avenue shuttle was built with the help of CUNY, uh, with the help of Medgravers College. Th it thank was you. The botanic Gardens. Thank you. It was built we have a lot of people to get to I today. I know we do, but thank you very much. I, I, I do want to tell you got, that the press has said that the gardens we, we, are not important got, to the public. No, no, we got your but point. But they are. Constance. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're very passionate. Next, please. Yeah, right. I'm, uh, Lois I just had to get that mic on. I'm Lois Kellerman. I'm the uh, the lesser of the two here. <laughs> still, way. still learning in every way. And uh, but I wanted to say something so simple uh, that it gets overturned or put in a corner because we're so smart and we have such big words. And so I just wrote down something that I believe. And it says this, I am alarmed at the rate of cement, steel, glass, and every unliving thing I see every day, larger and larger, mm -hmm. while the small, tender grass dies. Exactly. I hope that the kids who are shorter than we are, can look down more frequently and realize how wonderful it is to run barefoot in our parks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Back over here. Hi, thanks for letting me speak. Sorry, I was out of the room for a second. I'm Lucy Sexton with New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. And this budget season, I sat in on city council hearings, not just on culture, but on education, aging, immigration, criminal justice, and general welfare. At each of these hearings, I heard about the importance of cultural programs in doing their work. The criminal justice hearings presentation on probation co programs was a salute to the power of arts and culture, referencing Carnegie Hall and their neighborhood partners' extraordinary 
extraordinarily successful NEON program working with youth on probation. At the general welfare hearing, I heard about the city's largest soup kitchen, Holy Apostles, which also offers live music, a writer's workshop, a drumming circle, and other cultural offerings to their guests. One homeless woman reported, this place makes me feel like a full human being again. That is as important as the food the soup kitchen offers, the chance to express yourself, connect with others, and reconnect with your own humanity. I know the world today is not fond of facts, but the data is clear. Art and culture help kids improve in school, helps seniors live longer, healthier lives, helps people getting out of jail re-enter their lives, strengthens communities of every background. You want to counter the current anti-science trend, which is so dangerous to our democracy and our planet? No one educates more kids and grown-ups on the mysteries at the heart of the world we live in than our zoos, science museums, and botanic gardens. Arts and culture are not extras that can be cut without any impact on the lives of your constituents. When we invest in culture, we invest in the dignity of every person in this great mosaic of a city. We can and we must fight for a city that counters the narratives of fear, division, and ignorance taking hold in so many places in our world. Our city can and must be one which says that every person is valuable, every culture is rich, every story deserves to be shared. There's no better way to build community across differences than with music music, murals, dance, gathering in cultural centers to learn more about our world and each other. The CIG and program groups ask that you say no to this proposed cut to the cultural budget and to keep us harmless at 2019 levels with a $25 million increase to the baseline. Thank you so much for allowing my testimony. We, we agree with you. It's Thank totally you. unacceptable what was proposed. And, uh, I mean, it's really offensive in many ways. We, we will not stand for any cuts to our cultural institutions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to this panel for coming in. Now I'm going to call up our next panel, and that is Joel Kufferman. Is Joel here? Emily Walker. Is Emily here? Okay. Gwendolyn Tindall. Uh, Alexandria Estrella, uh, Brigitte, I'm sorry, Brigitte Mousset and Kayla Jones, and Bernardo Felice. Would you like to start? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Walker, and I am the Director of Outreach and Programs for New Yorkers for Parks. Our organization is a founding member of the Play Fair Coalition, which currently includes 140 organizations citywide and has the support of a supermajority of the city council. Thank you to those of you who are here today who have supported our campaign. Um, we thank the City Council Committee on Finance for allowing us to speak about the fiscal year 2020 executive budget. City-owned parkland comprises 14% of all city land, but last fiscal year, NYC Parks received only 0.59% of the entire city expense budget. While we were pleased to see the City Council embrace many of our budget proposals in their preliminary budget response, we were disappointed to see that the Mayor's office did not pick up any of our coalition's asks in the executive budget. Enough is enough. Now is the time to play fair for parks and commit to an increased budget for maintenance, operations, and programming. We are asking the city to commit an additional $100 million to the preliminary budget for parks. While this might seem like a large ask, the reality is that this amount would increase the total proportion of the expense budget for parks from 0.59% to just 0.69% of the budget. What would a $100 million addition to the expense budget for NYC parks provide? Baselining, truly baselining, $10 million would once and for all mean that 100 city park workers and 50 gardeners will have secure, stable jobs. I want to emphasize that we believe this funding should finally be made permanent after six years of asking for it. Nearly $4 million means that NYC's natural forests will begin to receive the proactive care and maintenance they need to remain healthy and resilient in our changing climate. 
a little over $47 million would allow the 48 largest parks in NYC to have dedicated crews that could better maintain, beautify, and care for our vital neighborhood open spaces and regional parks. Nearly $18 million would expand fixed post crews to all eligible smaller neighborhood parks that currently lack a full-time dedicated staff. Just over $8 million would fund improvements for all 550 Green Thumb community gardens citywide, new soil, new raised beds, and new features to ensure that gardeners have the resources they need for their gardens to thrive. Nearly $4 million in the budget would mean that 395 additional playgrounds citywide would be able to host structured sports and after-school programs for children in every district via Kids in Motion. $3 million would mean 50 new urban park rangers, and $6 million would mean that we could hire 80 additional PEP officers. I want to end by saying in a city that champions, champions equity, we have to start treating our parks, gardens, and open space as critical city infrastructure, which also means investing in the infrastructure of the thousands of people who care for them day in and day out. Thank you so much for listening to our testimony, and we, are wel we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Gwendolyn Tindall. I am a proud parent of two students at MS50. My son, Vaughn Clifford, is currently in the eighth grade. My daughter, Zelena Clifford, is currently in the sixth grade. My son, Vaughn, is suffering with autism. He has a speech impediment, but he does not stop from standing and standing firm of what he believes in. He receives an ELT classes at MS50. His confidence level has grown tremendously. He has been able to rise on the honor roll from sixth grade to eighth grade every marking period, entering MS50. Vaughn is determined to build his own computer, create math games for other kids to play. My daughter, Zelena Clifford, has stepped out of her comfort zone. Well, currently in MS50, involved in student government, debate, excuse me, volleyball, Van and the same school year, one school year term. Being involved vitreously in AOT classes has given her the drive to prepare herself for the future, show that she can do better in life. She can do anything she puts her mind to. She has a goal to either be a lawyer, judge, or maybe the first female president. I have been a proud parent and supportive of the ELT program of MS50, and we continue to support and stand and fight for the ELTs for these kids. Please do not take these kids' ELTs. Thank you. Thank you. And, sorry. And I would like to add, I need additional statements that I have from students and parents that I will be turning in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a group of students was here the other day, and um, we heard you loud and clear at the education hearing. And um, I'm also deeply concerned about the cuts to the middle school quality initiative, where the mayor's taken away $2 million from schools like yours. And so we're going to fight for you on that level as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, please. Buenas. Mi nombre es Alexandra Estrella. Soy madre de un niño de octavo grado en la escuela MS50. Me gustaría dar las gracias a todos los miembros del consejo por su tiempo y apoyo hoy. En particular, gracias al concejal Traeger y al concejal Reynoso por apoyar a la MS50. También queremos felicitar al canciller Canrasca por su dedicación y su compromiso con la equidad. Estoy aquí porque yo pienso que el programa de ELT es beneficioso y no se debe ser cortado. ELT le permite a los estudiantes que hablan otro idioma la oportunidad de practicar inglés y seguir siendo bilingüe, como nuestro equipo de debate en español. Yo hablé con, mi, con mis padres y ellos también me dijeron los siguientes puntos. ELT ofrece a los niños la oportunidad de elegir una de diversidad de programas y encontrar sus pasiones o explorar una carrera. Bernardo Feli. Los estudiantes necesitan activi actividades productivas fuera del horario es escolar y no estar en las calles. Daniel Frindo. Los estudiantes necesitan clase ELT porque le da confianza cuando prueban cosas nuevas y luego tienen éxito. Wendell y Tindal. Y el sí le permite a los estudiantes con necesidades especiales tener acceso a actividades y oportunidades divertidas. 
Muchos programas de, después de la escuela no dejan que ellos par participen porque no tienen el ayudo de su para profesional y el bus no espera por ello. Vilma Ruiz. Y el, el ELC sí le da a los estudiantes opciones y los empuja a tener una mente abierta y probar cosas nuevas. Y el sí le da a los estudiantes oportunidades para prepararse para el arte, como se van a preparar para las escuelas secundarias, artes y es, sin esas oportunidades en la escuela intermediaria. Por favor, no corten y el sí. Nosotros tenemos orientación con los nuevos estudiantes en próximos jueves y les queremos decir que ellos también van a tener las mismas oportunidades. Gracias por escuchar. Gracias. ¿Hay alguien aquí que va a traducir para usted? Uh, no. Ok, yo entiendo español. Yes. Ok. Well, ok, come up, come quickly. And just state your name for the record. Uh, Fiorella Guevara. Uh, my name is Alexandra Estrella. I am the mother of a student in eighth grade in middle school 50. I would like to give the thanks to the members of City Council for your time and support today. In particular, um, Council Member Traeger and Council Member Reynoso for supporting Middle School 50. We would also like to thank uh, Councilor Carranza for, su, uh, for, su, for his dedication and support and uh, equity. I am here today because ELT pro, that ELT program is uh, beneficial for us and we should not, it should not be cut. ELT allows students who speak another language the opportunity to practice English and continue to be bilingual. Just like our debate Spanish uh, team. I also spoke with uh, parents and, and they told me the uh, following points. ELT offers students the opportunity uh, to choose a variety of programs and find their passions to, and explore a career, but not the release. So the students need productive activities um, after school and not to be able to be in the streets, and that's why they need these productive activities. Uh, the students need ELT classes because it gives them confidence um, when they try something new and then they have, um, and they are successful. ELT also permits students with disabilities to have ex access to activities and, opportuni and opportunities um, some, so often after school programs do not, just not, do not let them participate because they do not have their paraprofessional and the bus is not allowed to, and the bus doesn't stay for them. ELT gives students options and teaches them to have an open mind and to try new things. ELT gives students the opportunity to, pre to prepare for careers in the arts and to prepare for high schools in the arts as well. Please do not uh, cut ELT. We are, we, have, we are having an orientation for our students this Thursday and we would like to be able to tell them that they, we, they will be able to receive the same opportunities as our students are, are currently receiving. Thank you for listening. Great translation, you're hired, <laughs> you're hired. All right, next please. Um, good afternoon, uh, thank you Speaker Johnson and Chairman Drum and the rest of the committee members for allowing us to testify today. Uh, my name is Kayla Jones and I am with Jumpstart, which is an early childhood uh, literacy organization. Uh, we were founded in 1993 to promote high quality early learning for preschool children from underserved communities. And to do so, we train college students and community volunteers to provide lit language literacy and social emotional programming to more than 12,000 preschool children in underserved neighborhoods across the country. And in New York City alone, um, our college student volunteers from 10 universities support 40 preschool partners to, to deliver Jumpstart curriculum to nearly 1,500 children during the school year. Um, and first off, we want to thank uh, Councilmember Adams. She's not here right now, but she's been a, um, a supporter of Jumpstart programming and early literacy. So I just want to offer our thanks to her. 
Um, and so Jumpstart also recently surveyed uh, 1,168 of our alumni who served in our program to gain a better understanding of our um, influence in their college experiences and on their career. And what we learned um, confirmed uh, many of the barriers that we already knew about uh, to enter the early education field. Uh, so 84% said their Jumpstart experience was a major influence in their decision to pursue a career in early childhood education. And 33 of those respondents in the ECE ECE fields already make less than $20,000 annually. Uh, 29 of the respondents stopped working as an early childhood educator because of salary and compensation they felt was inadequate. Thank you. Uh, my name. My name is Brigitte. I will be testifying on behalf of Jumpstart as well. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Um, as my colleague mentioned, uh, some of the data we found was also that 33 of, uh, 24 of these respondents carry between 25 to 50K student in student loan debt. And 21 of these responders said that primary, the primary reason they decided not to become an early childhood educator was because the salary was not inadequate, was inadequate. Um, so this data reveals the urgency and necessity to pay for pay parity for early educators. Even though Jumpstart's alumni is very small percentage of the early educators in early childhood field, their stories are a highlight of the challenges that many early educators feel. Um, that's so many 24% who actually make less than what they get paid annually. So uh, the research for this case, high quality preschool is now well known. It has significant impact on children's literacy, math and social emotional learning and has lifelong benefits such as increased high school graduation rates, lifetime and increased lifetime earnings and reduced crime and teen pregnancy. Yet we also know that our children learn best when their teachers are well educated, professional and stable, in, to, stable forces in their lives. So critical to all of these factors pay the teachers. As Jumpstarts continue to provide high quality learning experiences for our children and college students, it is important that our teachers all well, are well compensated and reflect the value they add to the classroom. I know that New York City recognizes the importance of early education and has become a leader in expanding across a high quality preschool. But it's time for now New York City to lead the nation in creating true pay parity among early educators in every setting, including starting salary, uh, salary increases, and benefits. Preschool quality for both nationwide and in New York City cannot improve without high quality, motivated, and well compensated professionals in classroom. As such, I urge the Committee of Finance to make, an, uh, to make early educator pay a type, uh, top priority and do everything in its power to advance the ECE field in its year's budget. For youngest learners to build strong foundations for lifelong learning, their educators must, must be well prepared, trained, and supported in order to succeed, and they choose, so they choose to stay in preschool classroom. Thank you so much again for giving us the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Do you know what I did before getting elected to the council? I know you were a teacher. So. Yes, I was a teacher in the DOE, and I was a teacher in an early childhood center before that. So. Well, I'm really glad, and we appreciate all your hard work. Thanks. We're fighting for you. <laughs> Yes, sir. <clears throat> Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Bernardo Félix Rodríguez. Soy padre de un niño de octavo grado en la escuela MC50. Y soy presidente del PTA. Me gustaría dar las gracias a todos los miembros del consejo por su tiempo y apoyo hoy. En particular, gracias al concejal Traigan y al concejal Reynoso por el apoyo de la MC50. También queremos felicitar al canciller Carranza por su dedicación a garantizar que todos los estudiantes de la ciudad de Nueva York reciban la mejor educación que, pueda inde que puedan independientemente de su raza, etnia, estatus o socioeconómico, capacidad, género y lugar de residencia. Estoy aquí porque yo pienso que el programa de ELT es beneficioso y no, de no se debe ser cortado. ELT en MC50 ha sido un, una parte crucial de nuestra estrategia de transformación escolar. Los datos no mientan. Un aumento del 4% en la asistencia duplicó nuestra inscripción, triplicó los puntuajes del examen estatal y el duplicó nuestra eh, cuadricupli, cuadricupli, cuadruplicó los puntuajes de los exámenes estatales de matemáticas. Hace cuatro años, 
les pedimos a los estudiantes y a la familia que identificaran los cambios específicos que querían ver en nuestra escuela. Tomamos esta información y creamos un programa que se centró en lo que los estudiantes querían aprender y los combinamos con el conocimiento y la pasión personal del profesor. Cada año incluimos nuevas clases basadas en el interés de los estudiantes. Y ahora tenemos un catálogo de 38 clases distintas basadas en el arte, atletismo, activismo y oportunidades para que los estudiantes reciban ayuda adicional en lectura, matemática, ciencia, estudios sociales y adquisición del inglés. Todos los estudiantes merecen estas oportunidades. Tenemos que seguir con el programa que trabajan, EIRT trabaja en nuestras escuelas. Le pedimos al alcalde Di Blasio y al canciller Carranza y al ayuntamiento, y al ayuntamiento que continúan financiando el IRT por los estudiantes, tengan las oportunidades para explorar y crecer su creatividad. Gracias por su tiempo. Gracias. Y uh, esta mujer va a traducir para, para nosotros también. Okay. <risa> ¿Cómo se llama usted otra vez? Fiorella Guevara. Gracias. All right. My name is Bernardo Feliz Rodriguez. I am the father of a student in eighth grade in middle school 50, and I'm the president of the PTA. I would like to give, the th I would like to give thanks to the members of city council for your time and support today. In particular, Councilmember Trigger and Councilmember Reynoso for supporting middle school 50. We would also like to give thanks to Councilor Carranza for his dedication and dedication towards the students of New York City uh, so they can they receive the best education possible regardless of the race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, ability, gender, or where they live. I'm here today because I believe that EL the ELT program at Middle School 50 is beneficial and it should not be cut. ELT at Middle School 50 has been a crucial part of us, our st transformation strategy and the, stat the statistics do not lie. We have increased 4% in attendance, doubled our enrollment, tripled our ELA state exams, and quadrupled our math state exams. After um, Four years ago, we asked students and families to identify those changes that they wanted to see in our school. We took this information and created a program that centered on students, on what students wanted to learn, and we combined it with teacher passion and, what, and teacher knowledge. Each year, we have included new classes based on interests that students have, and we, right now we have a catalog of 38 distinct different classes based on the arts, STEM, sports, activism, and opportunities for students to receive additional help in ELA, math, science, social studies, and English acquisition. All of our New York City students deserve these opportunities. We need to continue programs like this that work, and ELT works at our school. We are asking Mayor de Blasio and Chancellor Carranza and on City Council to continue to fund ELT so all of our students can continue to have these opportunities to explore and grow their creativity. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes para venir. Uh, yo quiero asegurarse que nosotros estamos luchando para usted, especialmente um, el concejal Antonio Reynoso, porque Antonio Reynoso asistía a su escuela, ¿verdad? Sí. Yeah. Sí, yo sé. Felicitaciones. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We're going to fight for you. And we know that Antonio Reynoso went to your school also, so we're not going to let you down. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, our next panel is Joe Puleo, President of Local 983. Daniel Clay, President of Local 1507. Um, uh, I can't read that. It could be Noel Burns, Brooklyn Stronger Together. Liesl Burns. Ralph Yozo, small homeowner, renters, and taxpayers. Robert Kramer. Is Robert Kramer here? I don't see him. And Douglas Davies. Is it 
Is Mr. Burns here? Uh, what's your name? Liesl Burns. Yeah, we called you. Oh, okay. Yeah, come on. We I called your name. Yep, I'm sorry. I could go first. Yep. Thank you very much. Why don't you start right away? Yep. Yes. Greetings to counselors, and it seems as though it's a very supportive group. I'm the retired uh, clergy leader of Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture. And among other things, what I wanted to focus on, I'm part of a group called Stronger Together Across Traditions, which is part of something called United Religion Initiatives .org, URI .org in, uh, on the web. And it's talking about partnership and the strengthening of culture in terms of a, a fu solving a future problem. So I'm not really talking about money right now, but begging us to be that sanctuary city to figure out how we can make access across age generations, across religious and indigenous and non-believing traditions, so, because it seems to me that our culture nationally is being debased and that New York City is an island of diversity. But we need somehow partnership groups, like in an island in Park Slope. I go to Haiti three times a year. We should be partnered with a little town in Haiti. It seems to me that the, the, the junior high, the 50, is a good example. So what I'm begging the council to do is to do some sort of political organizing and think about what a sanctuary city really can ask of its citizens. And it might be a special tax on the gentrifiers and the people that are developing these enormous buildings next to public lands. But do anything that keeps us ahead of this debased culture. I love the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Barber, because they say we want a moral revolution, you know, that systematic racism is a moral issue, that degradation of the earth and the environment is a moral issue. And together, if we include non-believers and put our, uh, say that other traditions are neighbors, not competitors and not customers. Uh, I think we can do that. Thank you. With your help. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Let's go right here. Sarah, we'll start with you. We'll go this way this time. No, no, turn, uh, turn the mic on. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ralph Yazzo. I want to start with a quote. Eight billion dollars and on a single page of paper. That. I don't know if people know who said that, but that was our uh, esteemed commissioner or uh, council person, drum chairman. And that's to the health and hospitals, right? That's the way uh, we, the taxpayer, are getting details on how the agencies are using their budgets. I just think that that's outrageous. And why don't we vote no on that budget and get details? The taxpayers are paying for this. I have a question about the corrections. Uh, Department of Corrections, they're cutting back by removing cars that were just used for commuting. Just used for commuting? Are, are, are the taxpayers paying for cars that are just used to commute back and forth to work? Uh, I think that's amazing. HPD, uh, the person, the commissioner is on the job two days, right? Oh, it's a pattern. All these commissioners come in at budget season, they're brand new. And so they say, I've always been on the job two days. Same with health and hospitals. Uh, the council, also, we had one about housing. They said that they don't, we, the public, and the council do not have access to the affordable uh, housing details. I, I think that, that was just amazing. That was Chair, uh, Chair Cornegie saying that. And the only reason I can say this is because I listen to every single council meeting. And you know, it's very difficult to see every single council meeting because the, uh, the, the videos are so hard to watch. So go to YouTube and look for New York City Council videos unofficial 
and you'll find all the council videos there. And I have a lot of other questions, uh, but I can see my time is running out. It just reminds me of a Seinfeld episode where we start all these commissions, right? We have a tax advisory commission, but we don't complete them. The tax advisory commission is, I don't know what they're doing now, they seem to be asleep. So it, just like the Seinfeld episode where they're renting a car and they're telling the rent-a-car how to hold a reservation, we have to complete hearings too. So I asked the council to ask the tax, uh, property tax commission, what are they doing? There's no report, nothing that I see. And no hearings, no public hearings, and I have a lot more questions. Okay, thank well, you. You, you know you're speaking to a, a really a New Yorker when they can string together property taxes in a Seinfeld episode. Exactly. So uh, I'm grateful for your promoting our hearings and giving an official YouTube address and uh, referencing uh, Cosmo Kramer and the Property Tax Commission. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Daniel Clay. I'm the president of the Gardeners of New York City. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to firstly thank you guys for your time, uh, Chair Drummond and, and uh, Speaker Johnson, and thank you for helping out with our 150 boots on the ground for this year. Um, and secondly, I'd like to impart a little gardening wisdom for everybody, which is this. Um, if you plant one single tree or one, one single flower, you're much less likely to watch it grow and become fruitful. Uh, you're much better off filling up your, your, your pot or your window box, right, with flowers or maybe two different kinds of flowers, right? Um, a tree works the same way too. You're, better, you're much better off going and buying a tree at Home Depot with a couple of companion plants. Plants, you know, watch each other's back. One plant does this for that one while the other one, plant B does that for plant A. Um, they protect each other from wind and, and, and hot afternoon sun and everything. And I'd just like to say that, that this translates right to us boots on the ground too, and I really hope that we could baseline our, our, our 150 CPI workers in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. Good afternoon, City Council people. My name is Joe Puglio. I, I am the president of Local 983. I represent the APSW, the Associate Park Service Workers. I represent the city seasonal aides. I represent the Urban Park Rangers, the Associate Urban Park Rangers, and as you know, the PEP officers. Now, every year we come here and we have this discussion, and every year we know parks money is not enough. Um, of course, we're going to ask for, for what's needed, and we're definitely not going to settle for anything less than what we had last year. And I know everybody here is pro parks, and I'm happy, you know, that to, to, for you guys to be as active as you are. But the bottom line is funding. You know, we could say whatever we want but we need the money for urban park rangers, we need the money for PEP officers, we need the money for all the seasonal workers that come back and rely on their incomes uh, and make the parks clean and safe for, for everybody else. Uh, what I find most alarming this time is the high cost of construction projects, comfort stations. The prices are outrageous, they're tripling. And it's really sad to me that people are not going to have their jobs so we can pay these contractors three times more than we did just a few years ago, which were already overinflated, in my opinion. We have to do something about it. Our APSWs, they're the ones that operate the heavy machinery. Guess what? They're already digging up the dirt. They're doing it for the ball fields. Why can't they do this for the comfort stations? You know, we could insource these jobs instead of us cutting workers, we can use that money that we spend on these capital projects to hire more workers to do the job for way less. When I say way less, a fraction of the cost of what we're paying. I think one, I think it was you, I'm sorry. Uh, you said the average cost was 900 and something dollars a square foot. I mean, I don't know of any construction project, even in this city, that comes anywhere near that cost but we're using it for bathrooms. I won't take up any more of your time, and I know your efforts are all well, and I know you all mean well, but we just have to take this, we all have to work harder to figure out solutions because, you know, we're really running, you know, at a time 
when we don't have as much money as we had in the past, and rumors are we're not going to get as much as we thank, had in the past. Thank you, Mr. Puglio. I want, I want to thank you for uh, representing very, very important workers that make sure that our parks function every single day, from PEP officers to urban rangers to the seasonal thank workers you. that you represent. They are key, and every year we fight for them, and um, we are going to continue to fight to ensure that they get the resources they need with hopefully a peace of mind and not having to be part of the budget dance every year and whether or not it gets baseline and taken care of. And so we will continue to fight on behalf of this very critical part of our parks workforce. And I appreciate you being here today. Yeah, and I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panel will be Robert Kramer um, and Douglas Davies, uh, Gregory Brender, Campaign for Children, uh, Carolyn Capizzi, Amy Pomaro, CBOs for Equity, Alice Bufkin, Children's Committee, Citizens Committee for Children, Leah Van Halsemen, Committee for Hispanic Children. I'm sorry if I'm slaughtering people's names. And uh, Yolanda McBride, Coalition for Community School. Okay, let's uh, get started. We can switch seats too if we, um, once somebody gets done. Do we have enough seats for everybody? All right, let's start um, right here. That mic is not on. Good afternoon, Speaker, Chairman, and all the councilmen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to give this testimony. Uh, just to start anything, I'll just let you know I'm not asking for any money. <laughs> so, <laughs> all I am. You get double the time today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Our company is a company that operates here in New York City and we manufacture equipment that's energy savings equipment that would help the whole infrastructure and resiliency of our city. And uh, what I am trying to do is very simple. I'm trying to use, according to all the legislation that you have passed, to save energy for the city of New York, our equipment is capable of reducing the amount of money that you spend on the budget on for heating and water and for other infrastructure. We are, we are bringing this equipment to be installed in the city buildings and all the other buildings without any cost because the, our equipment is so energy savings and saving water that we can make enough money on it without charging for the equipment, just for the amount or lower cost of whatever the energy is supplied. And I have, I have to thank the city of New York. DCAS has given us an opportunity to demonstrate our technology, and we have installed it in some of the facilities, including one of the hospital facilities, including one center street. And, our, and they've been wonderful. They're great. They're working very hard to try to reduce the energy consumption and to save the, the, the programs that you have in money to be able to use in the buildings. Unfortunately, the way the system is set up, we are, you are buying right now from Con Edison okay, Steam Energy. Move you along here. At a very high Finish point. up. And so what we are, we are, we are willing to install equipment in the infrastructure of New York City to be able to reduce the cost and create resiliency. If you recall when we had, uh, uh, when we had the flood, we didn't have heat in many of the buildings. 
Our equipment basically provides resiliency to all the buildings in New York that use Con Edison steam at no cost to the city. All we're trying to do is just to provide a whole infrastructure built at our own cost without any expense to the city of New York at lower cost for the uh, guaranteed lower cost and with full service for this equipment. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to the next one. You know I've been working with you. I'll, I'll help spread the word on it as thank well. You. Next, please. My name is Carolyn Capizzi, and the owner and educational director of Smart Start Early Childhood Center. We have been partners with the DOE, providing pre-K since 1999. I am also a member of CBOs for Equity, on whose behalf I will speak. We are community-based organizations that are in partnership with the Department of Education in providing pre-K and 3K services to young children and their families. We sincerely thank the New York City Council for your support and for allowing us to address the perpetual inequities that we face as partners of the Department of Education. CBOs have been the backbone of early education in New York City for generations. We represent over 60% of DOE pre-K for all sites. We are not-for-profits, women and minority-owned businesses, religious institutions, private schools, and storefront daycares. We are your neighbors, and we are here to testify that we are deeply disappointed by Mayor de Blasio and the Department of Education's lack of fiscal support. Along with early childhood advocates throughout the city, we are deeply troubled by the inequities and the lack of funding in the Birth to Five RFP. Our average cost per child of $11,000 has been stagnant for seven years and will remain stagnant for another eight. The average cost per child in a DOE-run program is approximately $30,000. We see no increase in salaries. A fully qualified teacher in CBOs earns an average of $42,000, yet her equally qualified DOE counterpart has a starting salary of $59,000. Under Mayor de Blasio and the DOE, there is no equal pay for equal work. Many CBOs can no longer retain quali qualified staff due to this gross inequity. The DOE now strongly encourages us to provide health insurance and retirement plans for our staff, something we fully support, yet they offer no resources for these exorbitant costs. We are asked to sign long-term contracts with no cost of living increase, and if that's not enough, the RFPs Pay, pay for enrollment plan will definitely be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Just this week, all five borough presidents addressed a letter to the mayor asking him to pull the current birth to five RFP and start over. We fully support that move. Both the mayor and the chancellor have stated again and again to the media and to this council that they hear us, that we are parts of the conversation, but we emphatically say that we have not been heard. Well, please hear us now. The current Birth to Five proposal puts all of our businesses at risk. Your decisions impact our livelihood and our ability to keep our doors open for pre-K children and the families in our communities. When the DOE needed us as their partner, we provided. When the mayor needed help reaching his goal of serving 70,000 children, we provided. Again and again, the DOE has come to us when they needed us, and now we are being dismissed and ignored. We gave you excellent, Mr. Mayor. Now, where is equity? Uh, it's very, very powerful testimony, and I think there's a near unanimous agreement with that testimony that you delivered today here at the City Council, which is why you saw last year and this year us including this issue in our budget response. Last year, sadly, it, it wasn't able to get done. This year, I feel more optimistic about where we stand, given your advocacy, given the work that you all have done throughout the year in organizing and in shedding light on the real inequity that exists. So I'm really grateful you're here today. This conversation is continuing in a very ramped up and meaningful way between the council and the highest levels of the administration. And we will continue those conversations and it will be a key part of our budget process. I can't uh, guarantee anything. I don't mean that in a dismissive way, but we're going to continue to fight for you and work with you. And uh, this is one of the top issues that we have prioritized and are advocating for throughout the rest of this budget negotiation. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, City Council members. My name is Amy Pomero, and I'm here on behalf of Tiny Tots Playhouse 
a community-based organization that provides pre-K for children in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, District 20. I am currently the full-day pre-K teacher at Tiny Tots, proudly standing before you as the third generation in our family and most specifically women-owned business. Tiny Tots was established in 1936 by my grandma, Ann Dalmau, who is the child of immigrants from Spain, who instilled in her the importance of education and supported her through graduating Brooklyn College, though neither of them spoke English. Our school has thrived in our neighborhood through the Great Depression, economic shifts and recessions, and campaigns of decades worth of mayors and educational administrations. Under the leadership of my mother, Kim Pomero, we partnered with the DOE in 2000 to begin providing free pre-K to four-year-old children in District 20, and have successfully served in this capacity with full enrollment ever since. I come to share the reality that many community-based programs like ours are currently in jeopardy of closing down because of the oversaturation of pre-K programs and the opening of a DOE pre-K site for 254 students in our immediate area. As such, long-standing local businesses such as ours are being forced to consider closing our doors. This will be the first time in our 19 years partnering with the Department of Education and 83 years in existence that we cannot meet our enrollment capacity, and as such, we may be forced to close. In the past, we were responsible for our own enrollment and recruitment of students. Last year, however, the DOE took over this process to streamline and began assigning our roster based on families that applied. Typically, the interest in our program far exceeds the number of students we can accommodate at our small school. This year, 146 families applied to our program with only 26 spots to fill. While this seems like a great advantage, DOE only placed us with 20 students, leaving six seats unfilled. The remaining families who have expressed interest in our program will not be informed of openings, and we will not have access to their contact information to attempt to register them. Under enrollment to this extent would be a huge deficit to our budget and would not enable us to sustain our program. Thank you. We, we got it. We understand. We submit the testimony. We're working on this. I want to hear from everyone, but we have a long list today. So I really appreciate you being here. What you're saying is very meaningful for us. And what is most, what could be really helpful is you submitting that testimony and working with the staff here and identifying the exact issue you were just talking about mm -hmm. on what a fix could be for us. Okay. So um, I'm really grateful we're, you're here and we look forward to working with you to try to resolve this issue. So important uh, programs like yours can continue to serve the city in a way that helps children and gets you the fair pay that you and uh, the folks that work at your business deserve. So I really, really want to thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Alice Bufkin. I'm the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health with Citizens Committee for Children. Um, my written testimony includes the fuller list of CCC's uh, priorities for the budget, but I want to touch briefly on a number of them today. Um, first, we appreciate the City Council's long-standing commitment to achieving salary parity and really appreciate the statements from Speaker Johnson just now. Unfortunately, as you know, the executive budget once again fails to include pay parity. Um, to ensure a high-quality and stable early care and education system, we need not only parity, but we also need to address the uh, serious limitations of the birth to five RFP, which you've heard about some, including addressing pay for enrollment, core versus non-core hours, reimbursing indirect costs, and covering escalating costs. We're also deeply disappointed that the executive budget once again failed to include summer program slots for 34,000 middle school students, forcing families and providers to once, ago, once again undergo uncertainty in the face of the budget dance. We know we have your support, um, and we urge the city to restore and baseline funding for these students. Uh, CCC is a co-lead of the Family Homelessness Coalition. We greatly appreciate the City Council's work with the administration to baseline funding for 69 Bridging the Gap social workers. However, however there are still 100 or more schools with 50 or more students living in shelter, and we urge you to increase the number of Bridging the Gap social workers to 100. Additionally, we strongly support an additional $500,000 to establish an education support center at PATH. We also fully endorse the $4.9 million that the City Council has proposed to add 57 social workers for children and families residing in DHS contracted hotels. In terms of children's health and nutrition, we strongly oppose the mayor's $6 million cut to breakfast in the classroom. The flexibility proposed in this cut will lead to fewer children receiving breakfast and more children going hungry. This is a time to expand, not reduce school breakfast options. 
We are also deeply concerned with the impact of state cuts to this, the city's Article 6 public health programs, which impacts programs like immigrant health, maternal and child health, and reproductive and sexual health services. We know that there's at least 3.4 million that, for CBOs that has not been restored in the budget as proposed by the mayor. Uh, we also echo the City Council's support for a mental health support continuum, which will provide direct mental health services and behavioral health supports in schools. We also support additional social workers in high-need schools, as well as uh, increasing restorative practices um, throughout schools in New York. So thank you again for, for all the support the City Council has done on these important issues. Thank you very much, and <laughs> you know how familiar we are with those issues. I do, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Leah Van Halsema, and I'm the director for the Early Care and Education Institute at the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families, or CHCF. CHCF is a nonprofit organization with a 36 year history of combining education, capacity building, and advocacy to strengthen the support system and continuum of learning for children and youth who are perpetually marginalized and under resourced within city systems. We'd like to thank the City Council for considering our testimony today. There are a number of issues that the council laid out in their response to the preliminary budget that CHCF wholeheartedly echoes and applauds. While our full testimony, testimony goes into greater depth on a number of these areas, I will primarily be speaking to inequitable access to well-resourced, equitably funded, high-quality early education programs for, New, for our youngest New Yorkers. We applaud the council's call for $89 million to begin to address wage inequity in the early education workforce, but we stress that the council and the city must intentionally bring family child care providers to the forefront of these efforts. The, simply, the city simply does not have the capacity to hold all birth through three seats in centers, even when accounting for CBO held seats. Beyond the fact that families, many families prefer the support of a family child care provider, the city needs these providers to thrive in order to ensure early educational supports and interventions that place all children on the path to educational success. The state maintains a low market rate that does not reflect the true cost of care or invest in the professional growth of its home-based workforce in an intentional way. Meanwhile, the low reimbursement rate, or the reimbursement rate has stagnated with the remaining cost of care falling on families and providers themselves. There are indications that a high rate of home-based providers are closing licensed programs, expanding the childcare desert. This is not only about the first inputs the city must make in ensuring educational equity, it is about sustaining the livelihood of a workforce that is predominantly women of color, many of them immigrants. We must invest in these small business owners, not only for their own well-being, but for the betterment of our children and educational system. CHCF echoes the concerns regarding the DOE Early Learn RFPs. While the city has established universal 4K and is in the process of growing 3K, these are school day programs, meaning they only run to around 2.30 p.m. Early Learn does bring extended day and year and infant toddler care under the purview of the DOE, but only for children with subsidies. Estimates by the Ready for Kindergarten, Ready for College campaign show that only about 25% of children eligible for subsidies are receiving them in New York City. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Gregory. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your leadership on uh, the issues I'm about to briefly discuss. Um, I'm Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses, uh, today speaking on behalf of Campaign for Children, a coalition of more than 150 organizations working towards high quality early childhood education and after school for every child in New York City. Um, as everyone else on this panel has said, we have incredible outrage and concern about the DOE RFPs, which present uh, five issues that are essentially fatal to the providers who are the backbones of the system. Their failure to address salary parity, uh, the failure to include cost escalators and indirect costs, uh, the creation of a core versus non-core hour system which interrupts uh, the day, and the uh, um, reinstitution of a pay for enrollment system uh, which will um, force providers to receive lower funds even though, even, when, even though enrollment is actually controlled centrally through the DOE. I also wanted to highlight an issue that the council has been a champion for many years, which is around Sonic summer programs. Uh, once again, 34,000 uh, Sonic, Sonic summer programs for middle school students um, have been cut in the executive budget. And these are programs that should be funded even in the preliminary budget because providers need to be able to plan their programs, to have hire their staff to enroll children, to secure space in DOE buildings, many of which are going through construction in the summer. Uh, so we thank the council for its leadership in continually pushing to restore these programs, and we urge the city to restore them immediately so that providers can provide quality programs throughout the summer. Uh, finally, we want to continue to uh, thank the council for 
uh, pushing for expanding elementary after school programs. There are many schools throughout the, elementary schools throughout the city that do not have access to programs, and there are many compass programs that have long wait lists of students um, where families have no option um, to find somewhere for their kids even though the work day is much longer than the school day, and we look forward to working with you towards expanding access to elementary schools, after school programs. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Good to see you. Thank you all very much. Oh, uh, Councilmember Powers. Yeah, just, just for a tiny, tiny tots, is that it? I, I just sent your note over the DOE about your issue and the pre-K division, they're gonna follow up with you on it. And, and you should reach out to your council member as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, our next panel, Yolanda McBride, Lisa Caswell, Maureen Finseca, uh, Randy Levine, Salma Malik, and Maggie Merrer. You may begin. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Salma Malik, and I'm the founder and executive director of Climb 2 Autism Services. Um, I attended a city council meeting a few months ago, and I just wanted to reintroduce um, Climb 2. We're a small and we're a grassroots organization that's to provide autism and developmental disability services to underserved and bilingual um, children with autism, developmental disabilities, and their families and we're um, looking to serve within all five boroughs, and right now we're all volunteer-based, so I'm trying to really expand and to be able to provide services um, beyond parent training and workshops and really do more like trips and community outreach things which require more um, funding, so I'm requesting funding for fiscal year 2020, and uh, I've attached in my testimony our mission statement and some information about us. And um, I know that New York City is trying to expand their language services for all of their city agencies. And I think that the languages I'm representing, representing are not really being covered currently, which are Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, Arabic. And um, I really hope that I'm afforded the opportunity to serve this community. I know my testimony is a bit short, but that's it. No, thank you for being here. <laughs> Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, and other esteemed members of the New York City Council. My name is Lisa Caswell. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for the Daycare Council of New York. For more than 70 years, the Daycare Council has successfully served the needs of nonprofit organizations that sponsor childcare programs across the five boroughs of New York City. Currently, we have 91 members who operate more than 200 early childhood education programs under contract with the Administration for Children's Services, we're also responsible for negotiating collective bargaining agreements on behalf of our member agencies with the two unions, DC 1707, and the Council of Supervisors and Administrators who represent the, ch the child care workforce in their programs. We would like to thank the City Council for including the Daycare Council's $89 million salary parity proposal in your response to the Mayor's preliminary budget. This is $83 million for certified teachers and directors and $6 million for support staff. This action in conjunction with the intensive multi-year advocacy efforts of the Campaign for Children and DC 1707 has resulted in the start of discussions to address the long-standing issue of salary disparity in early childhood education. We are off to a good start and with the City Council's continued support, we look forward to that proposal being fully included in the upcoming final city budget. I just wanna say I can't um, understate 
the fact that your support has meant everything in terms of getting us to the table at this point. Um, some of you may have received our report on salary parity entitled The Value of Early Childhood Educators. It outlines our proposal for unionized nonprofit settings who are members of the daycare council as well as those employed in New York City early education centers. Our goal is salary parity for the entire early childhood education system. We believe that all certified teachers are entitled to the same compensation as their counterparts in the DOE. This is the only way we will stem the tide of certified teacher departures from the nonprofit sec sector. We would also like to sincerely thank you for including $500 million in capital funding for NYCHA's community facilities where many of our members are struggling with serious maintenance issues. NYCHA's PNA, Physical Needs Assessment, projected a $31.8 billion in capital repairs needs across their portfolio. We will continue to advocate with Live on New York and UNH to expedite repairs and identify additional re revenue sources. Other members of uh, other colleagues have talked about what's going on with the RFP. I'm just going to go over briefly to mention this serious issue. I won't take long. With reference to the Department of Education's birth of five requests for proposals, we have expressed our concern on enrollment-based funding in previous testimony before the General Welfare and Education Committees. We recently learned that one of the priority status categories for public school kindergarten seats is prior enrollment in school-based pre-K classrooms. Many of our members continue to lose children to school-based UPK settings even when their parents' first choice was to keep Thank them you. with their nonprofit providers. We, 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 yep. we, we got it. Yep. So it's the real concern right now is the, the pay-for-enrollment system. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Yolanda McBride. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Children's Aid, and I'm actually reading testimony on behalf of my colleague, uh, Ronald Cope who is the interim acting deputy director at Children's Aid. And I just wanted to just quickly just thank um, Speaker Johnson and Chair Drum and the members of the council for your leadership on several issues. And many of my colleagues have already spoken about some of the pressing issues that are a concern for Children's Aid in terms of the early childhood education RFP um, and uh, an after school. Uh, but I wanted to focus this testimony um, on um, a request um, to the city to provide $3.2 million in funding to bring all um, 20 existing, pre-existing community schools that receive funding through the state under the Mayor's Community School Initiative. Um, beginning in 2013, the New York State Education Department awarded two cohorts of three grants to community-based organizations. There were 61 grantees statewide and 25 were in New York City. 20 remain, and these schools <coughs> Um, currently do not have funding under the mayor's um, community school initiative. They will lose funding June um, 30th of this year. And we are asking that um, the city uh, fund these schools. Uh, we do know that the state education department um, has, uh, that, the New York, that New York City will receive $117.6 million in foundation aid, community schools foundation aid for fiscal year 20. and that this is an increase of 27.7 million in funding for community schools from last year. And so we do strongly believe that the funding is there and we would like these community schools to be permanently baselined um, under um, the mayor's initiative um, and it, through um, $3.2 million, that is the ask. And we just thank you for um, just your time, thank you. Thank you very much, Randy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Randy Levine, and I'm Policy Director of Advocates for Children of New York. We've provided you with detailed written testimony. I'm going to speak now about a few children whose stories demonstrate the need for the Council to continue advocating for several education priorities you laid out in your response to the preliminary budget. Brylin, who's nine, and Shoshana, who's 13, live in a homeless shelter with their grandmother, Desiree Adonis. When they became homeless, the city placed them in a shelter in Queens, far from their school in Manhattan. Ms. Adonis did not want her children to change schools, but the commute was very long. Fortunately, their school has a bridging the gap social worker who secured a transfer to a shelter just a mile away from their school. Shoshana had a very hard time coping with life in the shelter and started engaging in concerning behavior. The Bridging the Gap social worker provided her with weekly counseling, proving she had the training needed to address Shoshana's needs. 
Ms. Adonis describes the Bridging the Gap social worker as an encyclopedia of resources for families who are homeless. However, 100 schools have 50 or more students living in shelter and no Bridging the Gap social worker. We recommend adding to the adopted budget $5 million to increase the number of Bridging the Gap social workers for students living in shelter from 69 to 100 and $500,000 to establish an education support center at PATH. We represented an eight-year-old Latino student with a disability who was sitting at lunch with other students playfully poking each other with a plastic utensil. The other students wouldn't let him play, so he used the utensil to poke at one of them. He became agitated when school staff singled him out and grabbed the utensil out of his hand. School staff contacted the school safety agents who further escalated the situation. NYPD officers were called in and handcuffed the boy and insisted that EMS transport him to the hospital in handcuffs. At the hospital, doctors determined that he did not pose a risk of harm and released him. We recommend that the adopted budget include $15 million for a mental health continuum to provide direct mental health support to students, $20 million to add at least 150 school social workers for high need schools, and $30 million to expand whole school restorative practices to 100 additional schools. Our testimony also includes the need for, to ensure that no child placed in foster care is forced to change schools due to lack of transportation and includes an example that we learned of this week of a kindergarten student who applied for busing with the Department of Education after being placed in foster care. Busing was denied. The Department of Education is only giving a Metro card. That's not going to be sufficient to get him to school. We need to fix this problem. We look forward to continuing to work with you as the budget process moves forward. Thank you so much for your leadership and support. Uh, Randy, I want to thank you always for your incredibly uh, thoughtful, granular, important testimony that provides a roadmap on critical investments that the council should be advocating for. Advocates for Children were really instrumental in key last year in uh, bringing to the forefront the issue of inaccessibilities in our schools, and the testimony that was given at the same hearing last year was instrumental in the council successfully negotiating $150 million, which is now up to $750 $50 million for greater school accessibility. So really grateful you're here as always, and uh, we look forward to looking over your testimony and working on some of the issues that were identified. Thank you. Just quickly, Randy, I'm sorry. Can I just ask, how old was the kid they, hand they, they handcuffed? The child was eight years old. Eight? It's gotta stop, really, it's gotta stop. Okay, Maggie? Good afternoon, I'm Maggie Moroff. Um, I am the coordinator of the Arise Coalition. Arise is made up of parents, advocates, educators, stakeholders that have been working together for about a decade to push for systemic reforms in special ed. I've attached a member list to my testimony. Um, I also happen to be the special education policy coordinator at Advocates for Children. And one of the things I wanna to talk to you today is the school accessibility that the speaker just referenced. Um, so I'm here today on, to speaking on behalf of Arise in support of both that $750 million to be spread out over the next five years to make schools more accessible and the proposed special education investments in the fiscal year 2020 executive budget. Um, as, you, as many of you know, a data brief released last year by advocates laid out a, a truly dismal picture of accessibility in the public schools. You know, two very basic highlights from that, so one then Less than one in five of the city schools is currently fully accessible. In seven districts, less than one in 10 schools is fully accessible. And in District 75, only about a quarter of the schools are fully accessible. So let me say first that we are incredibly thankful to the council and to so many of the people on the council for your leadership and for your strong voice in support of the accessibility funding. Um, given the embarrassing state of school accessibility, we're really excited about the five-year plan and you know, continue to look forward to your leadership in this. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the proposed investment of $33.4 million in the new in funding to improve special education services here in the city. There is a tremendous need for additional staff for special education teachers, paraprofessionals, psychologists, social workers, and related service providers. Far, far too many of our students with disabilities are going unserved or underserved in the city at this time. Um, that money is gonna be used for that. Um, also pleased that the city 
really quickly, plans to use some of that money to build new programs for students with autism in District 75 and for students with print disabilities, another issue that I've come before the council on a few times in the community school districts. Um, we, I'm gonna cut myself short, but we are thankful and we are here to answer any questions and we appreciate your continued leadership. Thank you, I know you will continue to be in touch with Chair Traeger of the Education Committee and of course, uh, Chair Drum of the Finance Committee on these priorities, so thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Thank you, uh, Chairman Drum and members of the committee. My name is Maureen Fonseca, and I'm here on behalf of the Sports and Arts in Schools Foundation, SASF, now doing business as New York Edge. Our, our mission is to help bridge the opportunity gap for New York City students by extending the school year uh, and the school day with wholesome skill building activities designed to improve academic performance, and we've seen huge impact there, health and wellness attitude towards school, self-confidence, character, and values. The overwhelming majority of youth served by our programs are black, Hispanic, and new immigrant populations from the highest poverty neighborhoods in the city. Uh, with the Council as our partner these past 27 years, we've become the largest school-based provider of free after-school and summer programming in New York City, and right now we serve 35,000 youth in those underserved communities at 128 schools. We're in 42 of the 51 Council districts. Our, additionally, our programs have proactively involved through the years to meet the needs of New York City's children and families. Academic instruction now makes up more than 50% of our programs. We also serve a lot of uh, students who are in temporary housing, um, and we understand the problems families have. We are also known to be at the forefront of social-emotional learning, helping children process the difficulties that they're facing in their lives and that impact their learning. Um, so in order for our free programs to operate this summer and, and next school year, we ask you to please continue to fund us in the upcoming budget under the Council's after school enrichment initiative. And if enhancements are available, we ask that you consider increasing that citywide funding to $1.5 million as our council citywide funding has stayed flat for the last 11 years while expenses have increased and we are trying to serve more ch children. With, with the support of the council, we continue to provide um, the, these experiences that are only available to more affluent families. So thank you again for all your support and help us give our 35,000 students students the edge they need to succeed. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Maureen. We love uh, SASF and uh, we're grateful you're here today. Uh, and we also love uh, former council member Jimmy Vaca, who I know works with you all. Yes. And so uh, we're grateful for the work that you thank do. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just also to say to the, about the RFP, we we're very aware of it. And I addressed it with the chancellor last week. So uh, we'll follow up with you more on that later as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Greco, Vice President of Local 2507. Oren uh, Barze uh, from FDNY EMS Local 2507. Vincent Virale from EMS Officers Union. Melissa Sklars from SAGE. Caitlin Andrews from Live On New York. And Rebecca Reed from NYCCAL. I apologize if I mispronounced anyone's name. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, good afternoon and thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and all the council members and the staff here today. My name is Michael Greco. I'm the Vice President of Local 2507, which represents the EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. First off, I'd like to congratulate and acknowledge the two FDNY EMS chiefs who were recently promoted. Uh, Chief Bonsignor and Chief Seriel represent 60 years of EMS experience, and it's nice to see two people who get promoted based off merit and dedication to our service as opposed to who you know. I want to acknowledge their achievements in EMS. While everyone else is focusing on their diversity, I wasn't going to because I didn't want to cause any embarrassment. Not embarrassment to them. 
Chief Bonsignor is well aware that she's a woman and she's gay. Chief Siriel is well aware that he is Hispanic. EMS is so diverse in those categories that that's the last qualification that we look for. The embarrassment is to the mayor. He justifies our pay disparity in EMS while promoting diversity. Understand these two chiefs are making $50,000 less than their counterparts with the same stars on their chest. This is outrageous. I sat and listened to questions given to the department about the budget and the answers were mind boggling. They justify our staff shortages and high response times, especially in the Bronx, by promoting 1,200 of our members to firefighters. They say it benefits them because the medical knowledge brought over helps them when they respond to medical calls. You know what would help those response times? 1,200 more EMTs and paramedics responding to medical calls. To fix it, they propose a two-year plan to increase class sizes by increasing capacity at the training center and increase the PRU program. That's gonna be two years before they even get a staffing level to fix those response times. The solution is simple. Pay parity for EMS. If you increase the pay, you increase the staffing, you increase the retention, treat us the way you treat other first responders, and you will get the great response times of other services. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Owen Barzillay. I'm the president of the FDNY EMS Union, Local 2507. I thank you for giving us the time and opportunity to speak. On May 14th, there was a hearing here regarding the finances of the FDNY. There were a few issues that raised our concerns as previous hearings were held where our demands were for more facilities, better wages, better work conditions, inhumane work conditions. We only have 35 stations citywide. Some of our members are still changing their uniforms on the apparatus floors. Women are still having one stall in their bathroom in the Bronx. They discuss how there's a 4% retention rate on the fire, firefighting side, while in EMS, it's 9%. The fact is the number is double. They don't include our members, 1,200 of our members leaving to fire, part of their retention calculations. They spoke about building bigger classes. It doesn't matter how big the class is. If people are not going to stay for the wages, they're gonna leave regardless. They talked about 180 people going per clip. That's millions of dollars that are being spent of taxpayers' money for people who are not staying. A $30,000, $40,000 gap, nobody's gonna stay. It costs about thirty dollars to $40,000 to train each individual. You multiply that by 180 times per class, per individual, that number is exaggerating. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Speaker Corey Johnson, distinguished members of the City Council. My name is Vincent Varigali. I am president of the Uniformed EMS Officers Union, representing over 500 EMS lieutenants and captains of the New York City Fire Department. This testimony is in response to the FDNY's fiscal 2020 executive budget. Uh, we heard testimony on May 14th. While funding for the new needs are always welcome, it is unfortunate the current needs are still being ignored. Many of the issues that continue to plague EMS were mentioned in prior meetings and in testimony provided at the city council hearings, yet, they remain un unaddressed. Our mayor continues to crack the whip over the EMS plantation by providing $15 million to expand the APRU fly car program. However, there is no compensation being provided for the over 100 officers in the Bronx who continue to work three jobs in this pilot program. Our mayor promised to bring fairness and equality, yet these men and women continue to work as a lieutenant, paramedic, and training officers. These dedicated professionals were already paid $40,000 less annually than other first responders and uniformed agencies. 
Now, to add insult to injury, they must continue to endure the increased workload, liability, and responsibility without the additional benefit or compensation. Let me be clear. This is not a pay, contract, or labor issue. It's a public service issue. The lack of adequate compensation creates a negative work environment and disgruntled workforce. It continues to negatively impact proper staffing levels for EMS. We heard testimony last week that the turnover rate for EMS is 9%, but that does not include the members who leave the EMS workforce to go to fire. In one year, EMS, which has a workforce of approximately 4,100, had lost approximately over 900 EMTs and paramedics. That's a 22% turnover rate. While our dedicated men and women continue to be underpaid and remain understaffed, we are also experiencing serious overcrowding at EMS stations. Many of the stations have locker rooms that have expanded out into the garage area of the station, creating little or no privacy to change and unsanitary conditions. <clears throat> Additional stations will provide and would improve working conditions uh, and morale and decrease response times by reducing the distance units would have to travel for, for tour changes. I appreciate the opportunity to provide this testimony. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Verali. I, I think Councilman will get someone to comment. Very quickly. Thank you again. I just wanted to personally, on behalf of my district in the Bronx, thank all of you for your incredible support and your advocacy for all of our EMS and EMTs. Particularly, there's no greater sacrifice than what we witnessed with EMT Yadira Arroyo. And I want to make sure it's reflected on the record. She is representative of what most EMTs endured. The day that she was killed in the line of duty, she was working overtime to take care of herself and her five sons. And so when you talk about working conditions and providing more services for not just the men, but also the women, um, I think it obviously has so much merit and validity, and this city council supports those efforts. And I also thank you for your support of Chief Alvin Surio. Um, Although he's in Brooklyn now, he's from the Bronx, and he served uh, in my district and certainly helped me personally through the Arroyo uh, tragedy and working with her family. And even to this day, we celebrate her every year. We have block parties in her honor. We've renamed the street, and we continue to keep her legacy alive. But I think there's nothing greater than keeping her legacy alive, than making sure that we improve the conditions for EMS and EMT so that a tragedy like that never happens again in our city. Um, and so I want to thank you for your work, for your partnership, for all that you have done for both myself and the Bronx delegation and the entire city. And certainly we have to keep talking. We know these issues are, are not going away. And as the population grows in New York City, there's only going to be more of a need. And so I recognize the pay parity issue and a lot of the working conditions you talked about that exists, and we want to be supportive and help as much as we can. So thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Melissa. Uh, thank you. On behalf of SAGE and the uh, LGBT elders we serve, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you, uh, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, Chair of the Aging Department, Margaret Chin, and the entire City Council. Uh, my name is Melissa Sklars. I'm the Senior Government Relations Strategist for SAGE. We were founded in 1978 by a small group of people in a living room. Today we are coast to coast, nationwide, with affiliates all over, including uh, SAGE centers in four or five boroughs here in New York City. The centerpieces, uh, besides our case management and the, the vast array of services, is LGBT affordable housing that will be opening this year first in the Ingersoll residence in Fort Greene and then early next year uh, in Cortona in the Bronx. In fact, our applications for Ingersoll start next week. Exciting times for SAGE. Um, because of our relationship with the council, uh, we've been able to achieve all of this. We have our SAGE centers in all of our locations. We will be moving into new SAGE centers. The problem is that um, in spite of your generosity, we've been trying to reach out to DIFTA, uh, and they've been supportive, but um, not supportive enough. And so we still need that final piece, and we're hoping that, that DIFTA, we've reached out to them numerous times. Uh, and so today we're asking that City Council support our effort, urging DIFTA to enhance uh, their support for our programming services that we offer throughout our SAGE centers uh, in both Ingersoll and Cortona. 
Uh, we're very grateful for the partnership that we've had with you. This is an exciting time for the LGBT community in New York. Uh, we're leading into the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. Our city is hosting a global celebration of pride. We cannot think of a more powerful message the city would send to the world that New York City takes care of its LGBT elders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. My name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm here to testify on behalf of Live On New York. Thank you, Chair Drum, Chair Chin, Subcommittee Chair Gibson, and the entire council for the opportunity to testify today. On behalf of Live On New York, at this pivotal time in the city's budget negotiations, I would like to clearly articulate the urgent and significant need for increasing funding that exists for New York's senior service providers. I also would like to fully appreciate and thank the City Council for your steadfast, steadfast support of senior programs throughout the years, and this year in particular, for your inclusion of the necessary increase to meals funding in your preliminary budget response. We are hopeful that this recommendation will rightly make its way into the final budget. <clears throat> Just this afternoon, thousands of lunches were served at senior centers across the five boroughs in every neighborhood. The majority of these meals go to individuals who report that this meal makes up more than half of their daily food intake. However, in spite of the clear value of these meals, they have for years been funded far below their worth, with the last across-the-board increase to providers being a mere quarter in 2014. Today, providers of both home-delivered and congregate meals in our high-cost city are funded at a rate that is 20% below the national average. The effect, mission-driven, community-based providers are losing money on every meal they serve, or to put it another way, they are supplementing the city for its true cost of doing business. This is unsustainable and unfair. It's time to become a fair city for all ages by investing $20 million in DIFTA's congregate meal program and $15 million in DIFTA's home-delivered meal program. And the picture that I just painted, it's not an anomaly. The underfunding of meals is not an anomaly. This is what happens across human services contracts. In many cases, the culprits are the, of pervasive underfunding are indirect costs and low reimbursement rates. And that's why we are also proud to stand with the Human Services Council and City Council in your call for $106 million added to human services contracts. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, Speaker Johnson has left and everyone else sitting today on the council. My name is Becca Reed and I will be testifying on behalf of NICAL, the New York uh, City Coalition <clears throat> for Adult Literacy. <clears throat> Excuse me. A coalition comprised of adult literacy teachers, program managers, students, and allies from over 40 community-based organizations, CUNY campuses, and library programs across the five boroughs. As we well know, today in New York City, there are approximately 2.2 million adults who lack English language proficiency, a high school diploma, or both. Over 75% of these are immigrants, and yet public funding for adult literacy education is so limited that fewer than 4% of these 2.2 million adults have access to basic education, high school equivalency, or English classes. NICAL wishes to express our deepest appreciation to the council and the mayor for the $12 million expansion for adult literacy funding and services over the past three years. We also thank Mayor de Blasio for including an $8 million one-year restoration for adult literacy programs in the executive budget. We also ask that in the FY20 budget that we restore and baseline that $12 million to bring the total baseline to $15.5 million so that DYCD funding can provide essential services uh, thwart the threat of closing programs, closing classes. Uh, and in order to do that, we also would like to raise the rate per student to $2,000, which would then allow us to reach 7,500 students per year. So we thank you for the time today. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you very much. Councilmember Margaret Chin. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to thank the panel um, for coming today and to talk about all these critical issues. And I wanted to especially highlight, um, you know, the fight for our older adults, our seniors. And with SAGE, I mean, we're very happy that these senior buildings are being built, but we got to remind the administration that senior building has to come with support services. And I think that um, the new commissioner, she's very supportive, so hopefully that will happen. And I also uh, wanted to thank Levon and, and all the senior advocacy organization that the seniors were out there advocating on the meal program with their aprons and the tray, highlight the importance of senior meals uh, at those center. So hopefully uh, we'll get OMB on board that money will be put in uh, before we finalize the budget. And thank you so much for all your advocacy. Thank you, and for NICAL, you know, we're fighting to get that baseline, so. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the panel for coming in. We appreciate everything, thank you. Our next panel, Carlin Cowan, CPC. Poling Ng, CPC. Jia Mu, CPC. Lin uh, Nakazawal, CPC. Amy Torres, CPC. Alex Kang, CPC, and Mary Sidewitz, CPC. So, Good afternoon. Um, Amy Torres, Director of Policy at CPC, the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC is the largest Asian American social services organization in the United States, providing social and economic empowerment programs and services for over 60,000 low-income immigrant and AAPI New Yorkers each year. Um, we're a proud member of UNH, NICAL, 15% and growing, Live on Human Services Council um, and FPWA, and we're um, in support of all of the asks that those coalitions are also uplifting today. I'm going to be speaking um, on behalf of CPC and our role in the New York Counts 2020 Coalition um, and uh, on our concerns for Census 2020 funding and planning. Um, CPC is incredibly grateful um, and glad to see the Council's um, support of immigrant communities and especially the fierce opposition that our leaders in the city and state have had against the addition of the citizenship question to the census. Without going into all of the unprecedented challenges associated with Census 2020, um, we would like to remind the Council that the state is far behind um, its plans for funding robust census outreach, and we worry that the city, without thoughtful planning, may be behind as well. Um, without thoughtful preparation and defense against all of the changes that may deter people from responding to the census, this census alone could be one of this federal administration's single most weaponized attacks for institutionalizing segregation, institutionalizing poverty and racism um, in our city and our state and across the country. For these reasons, CPC wishes to uh, remind the council that community-based organizations are the best tool to fight back about uh, over concerns and anxieties that immigrant and low-income communities have toward the census. Um, we acknowledge that 22 million has been put into the executive budget for census funding, but we wish to remind the council that in negotiations, community-based providers follow the same rationale of all other services contracted through the city, that we have the earned trust and the uh, relationships to compel people to fill out the census um, and fight for a fair and accurate count. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at CPC. I'm gonna talk about a few issues today. The first is immigrant legal services, 
As you may know, um, Asian American Pacific Islanders, about 80% speak a language other than English at home, yet there is not an Asian American legal services provider in all of New York State. At the same time, 20% of all active immigration court cases are Chinese American. We urge the city to invest in linguistically appropriate legal services for all immigrant New Yorkers. The second is salary parity for our early childhood educators. We want to support the asks that all of our other coalitions that we're a part of have uplifted today and simply add to it that one of our directors of our early childhood education centers who has been with CPC for 47 years is paid less than a first year DOE teacher. The last is you're gonna hear from some of our other amazing CPC staff and community advocates about a bunch of our different programs that we're fighting for funding for. But I'd like to uplift one of our programs at CPC that is perhaps less popular because its outcomes are so terrible. And that's the program where we subsidize the city to do the basic contracting for human services that the city is required to do. In that program, we subsidize the city for nearly a million dollars in indirect funding that is unreimbursed every year. We pay $157,000 each year in late fees on interest from late payments. And we wait for the city to pay us for over a million dollars in contracts that it has owed us in the past three years. With that money just from indirect, which the council has been a huge champion in advocating for on behalf of nonprofit providers, we could be using that $900,000 that we pay to provide 300 students with after school education for a year, 3,000 students with English language education for a year, or 75,000 meals for our seniors. Thank you to the council for your support. Thank you very much. Can you just refresh my memory? Uh, because I have been speaking at the immigration um, hearings in particular about the distribution of the legal services funding and why um, we don't have um, Asian speaking um, legal service providers. Yes, absolutely. So while the state does fund legal services through opportunity centers, of which CPC is one, um, what we really lack is community-based legal services providers. And although at CPC community members speak over 25 different languages, and obviously the Asian American community speaks many more languages, what we see is that actually lawyers through programs like NILAG or IJC will happen to have a lawyer that speaks the language rather than having specific providers, and so community organizations are left to fill the gap. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Paul Leng Eng. Uh, I, on behalf of the Senior Service uh, Division, want to share the very important information to you. May is a older American month, so I want everyone to respect us because we are the senior. We need your help. Who make the uh, country beautiful? Us. You know, when the senior retire, you should respect them, let them really enjoy their safe life. So that's why today I really want to raise my voice. And the uh, CPC is uh, 54 years. I served at the CPC 51 years. Why I like to stay in this organization, I think CPC, I feel power, power of that. Because CPC, even we had a very limited budget, we, everyone, open our heart to concern the needy people, make the country more beautiful. The children is our future, the senior is our, you know, and um, uh, contribute us. Today, I just want to thank you, all of you, Open door really facing our, not only open door, our senior services really facing about the money problems. Thank you. Thank you, our lovely, honorable chair of the agent committee, Margaret Chan. Margaret Chan is really very good listener, very good action person. But he, uh, she worked very really hard. She really makes it all the senior center, lessen our voice, and now find out what is our need. So I thank you, 
Last time, you know, and the department for the agent had the 249 senior center, but last year, suppose at the Mando budget. But I just wonder, Open Door is a very good office center. We don't get even one dime from the model budget. We cannot survive. But thank God, thank God, we had the lovely council lady, Margaret Chan. I really keep him, her very busy. I talked to her. I said, Margaret, I need your help. Without your help, we will going to die. Our center, my center's name is Open Door, should be closed door. But finally, Margaret Chan listened to me and gave me some money so I could survive. My friend, two, two minutes is over. I just want you follow our lovely Margaret Chan's step. Listen to us, concerning to us. Senior is very important for this country. You know that a government is of the people, by the people, for the people. How you do that? Please, you are very smart. Give us more money. Let us, you know, provide best quality and quality services. Senior power, senior voice, and thank you. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> Chair. Lovely chair, please. <laughs> After you listen my voice, Lord just keep smiling. Give us money. That's most important. <laughs> Not only smiling, money, money, money. <laughs> then we could uh, survive. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're a very powerful voice, and we heard you. Money, money, money. We hear you. All right. I, I am so glad I was here for this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next, please. My name is Jia Mui. I am the director of the Multi Social Services at CPC, Chinese American Planning Council. Thank you, Chair Jerome and the Speaker Johnson and members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify today on Article 6 funding and the Community Based Health Initiative. Today, we are deeply concerned about the New York City Article 6 cuts. While the New York City executive budget includes $59 million in funding to mitigate these cuts, it does not cover the million in lost Article 6 matching funding for the City Council discretionary budget public health programs, which supports immigrant health, education, insurance access, HIV AIDS prevention, treatment, child and maternal health, transgender health equity, viral hepatitis, and more. These programs give organizations like CPC the resources we need to connect our community members with much needed health insurance services and health care resources. The need for these programs is great and we should be expanding them rather than uh, fighting poten potential cuts. For example, in our first year of participating in the Health Access Health Initiative, our target set was 180 and to date we have already enrolled 248 community members and many more needs our services. At the time, in a climate of fear for immigrant New Yorkers, many community members have expressed concerns about whether their health insurance enrollment or use of services will impact the immigration status. This makes community-based health initiative all the more important. We are prepared to fight back at the state level next session, but we urge New York City Council and the city to fill the gap in the executive budget and ensure that community-based health initiatives like Access Health are expanded, not cut. CPC appreciates the opportunity to testify on these issues that so greatly impact the community we serve. Thank you. Thank you also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Drum and members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Lynn Nakazawa, and I am the Adult Literacy Program Director at CPC. Of all CPC's programs, limited English proficiency remains one of the top barriers for our community members. CPC adult, CPC's Adult Literacy Program serves over 800 adult literacy ESOL students every year, but our wait list grows every year and is currently at 533. One of the reasons our waitlist continues to grow is the unstable and unpredictable nature of funding for adult literacy programs. 
Each year, programs like CPCs are subject to a budget dance at the state and city level that prevents us from predictably scheduling classes. Anyone who has studied a foreign language knows that without daily, consistent practice, it is easy to lose traction and forget key concepts. However, many programs are forced to shut in the summer because single investment funding awards are not guaranteed, and those same students re-register in late fall or winter at a significantly lower literacy level than when we last saw them. This year, we have seen significant cuts to the state's Office for New Americans where ESOL classes have been eliminated entirely. CPC applauds the mayor's restoration of an $8 million one-year investment, but much more is needed to fill a now much larger gap. Adult literacy programs are a gateway for the newest New Yorkers to participate and thrive in our city. It is through adult literacy classes that students learn about labor protections, their rights with immigration and law enforcement, and upcoming issues like the census or elections. Losing access to these classes means losing access to a network of peers, allies, and resources. For these reasons, CPC recommends to restore and baseline the $12 million for DYCD funded adult literacy services. Combine these funds with the existing $3.5 million in baseline DYCD funding. CPC appreciates the opportunity to testify on these is issues that so greatly impact the communities we serve, and we look forward to working with you on them. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, the speaker and I did come, along with Carlos Menchaca, to, to see what was going on, and it was very, very moving, um, very emotional, actually, to see people struggling and wanting to learn English. It was a very, very nice day. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Drum and the members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify t today. My name is Alex Gong. I'm a student at CPC. I'm also a new immigrant. I came to America 10 months ago, and I've been studying English in America for five months. Since I'm living in America, I need to learn English well. Then my friend recommended me to come to CPC. This English class helped me a lot to improve my English. At first, I didn't dare to speak to English-speaking people. Now I can talk to them easier than before. I would feel frustrated if English classes were cut because I have to pay the rent, all kinds of bills, and f buy food for my family. Um, I'm the only one in my family who can speak some English. I have to handle everything for them, such as English letters, English telephone calls, bills, and my son's homework. Sometimes I have to spend three hours to assist him to finish his homework, uh, simply because our poor English. I have to translate everything uh, by ourselves. My son's subjects, like science and social studies, are very difficult for us to understand since our English is, uh, is not our first language. Please restore more money for adult literacy classes. Thank you. What country you come from? I'm from China. From China, and you spoke such beautiful English. So thank you for that testimony. It's very moving to hear someone like you uh, give testimony like that. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. We appreciate you coming in, and uh, your concerns are, um, we're taking them very seriously. Thank you. Okay, our next panel, Kelly Sabatino, Community Health Network. Singwen Chu, I think, New York Immigration. Juan Pintone, Managed Care Consumer Assistance. Annette Guadino, 
Treatment Action Group, and Kate O'Brien, Treatment Action Group. Yeah. Is Kate O'Brien here? Okay, I'm sorry. Annette Guardino? Okay. Juan Pintone? Okay. Sangon Chun, New York Immigration Center? Okay. I'm sorry if I said your name horribly. Kelly Sabatino? No. Is Kelly here? Okay. I'm going to also call um, Juan uh, Grahaden, Grahaden, oh, from, oh, Juan from Emerald Isle. I saw him here. Is he here? He left? Oh, okay. And Reed Vreeland from Housing Works? Reed here? Okay. Okay, Anthony um, Feliamo, Commission on the Public Health System. Is Anthony here? Okay, great. And Enrique Herves from Hannock. He left. Okay. Oh. <laughs> there you go. All right, last one. <coughs> um, Louis Sawi from the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Okay, very good. All right, would you like to start? Thank you, Chair Drama and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to tes testify. My name is Juan Pinson. I'm the Director of Health Services at the Community Service Society. And I'm here to talk about uh, the medical debt epidemic and healthcare affordability crisis that uh, New York City's uh, residents are facing. Um, uh, Medical debt affects New Yorkers every year more and more, and despite the Affordable Care Act gains in, affordab in, in affordable health care coverage, the issue with medical bills and people not being able to negotiate the health care system, uh, navigate the health care system is still a, 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 a big issue. Uh, and I'm not here to tell you, you know, how to solve the problem of medical bills or, you know, uh, why we have this problem, that this is an issue, a very complex issue that requires uh, legislative action at the state or uh, federal level. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that there is a program that can provide um, um, immediate relief to New York, to New York, New York City residents uh, who face these issues. And the name, the name of this program is the Managed Care Consumer Assistance Program. It was actually an initiative that was, that was funded by City Council between 1998 and 2010 and served 140,000 consumers. And funding, uh, so I'm here to urge the, the, the City Council to provide one million in funding for this program. Uh, funding for this program will basically allow our organization to train advocates uh, from community-based organizations to provide those services in the community. It will help us train them to um, uh, assist clients with negotiating the medical debt, applying for charity care, and uh, navigating the healthcare system in general. So I, I urge, the city, the, urge the city council to provide funding for this initiative as a speaker initiative. And I'm also here to uh, support uh, funding, 2.5 mi million in funding for Access Health NYC. And also we oppose the uh, um, Article 6 cuts that will really uh, hinder the ability of CBOs to provide these vital services in the community. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is sang Chen, and I'm the Senior Manager of Health Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you to Finance Committee Chair Drum for calling this meeting and for the opportunity to testify today. I'm here to talk about several key NYC priorities, including City Council-funded Access Health NYC Initiative and the Mayor's NYC Care. The NYC is an advocacy and policy umbrella organization for more than 200 groups across the state working with immigrants and refugees. As Access Health NYC initiative approaches its fifth year, it has become more important than ever, especially thanks to the enhancement in fiscal year 2019 to 2.5 million. However, in the most recent New York uh, State budget, the governor and the state legislator cut New York City's Article 6 matching funds, which affect essential 
NYC public health programs such as Access Health NYC. The mayor has proposed filling in the gap for some DOHMH programs. However, his proposal does not include replacing the law state matching funds to city council discretionary funding initiatives. First and foremost, we need the council to restore the existing 2.5 million investment in Access Health, but we also need at least 3.4 million gap filled to continue to empower trusted CBOs to provide culturally responsive and accurate information to ensure that all NYC New Yorkers understand their rights to health care coverage and services. NYC CARE. Um, the mayor has proposed $25 million in fiscal year 2020 for the initial rollout of NYC CARE starting in the Bronx, ramping up to $100 million annually at full scale starting fiscal year 2021. It is unclear how this is possible without a greater upfront investment. Given that h, &H is the sole entity that will provide services under NYC CARE, additional funding to more dramatically expand capacity is necessary to meet the demands of providing care to a larger number of patients, especially if the city declines to expand the network of NYC care beyond Asian age. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Um, Chairman Drum and, uh, and the committee members, thank you very much for the opportunity to meet with you today and to talk to you today. Um, my name is Annette Gaudino. I'm the local and state policy director for Treatment Action Group. Treatment Action Group, along with some of our very close partners, including Vocal New York and Housing Works, specifically uh, Reed Vreeland, who could not be here with us today, have been instrumental in New York uh, State being a leader nationwide in terms of declaring our intention to end the HIV epidemic in 2014 and then following in 2018 the hepatitis C epidemic. And we're working on TB. Uh, so while I'm here, I really wish I could be talking to you about, or I'd prefer to be talking to you about, baselining the $1.9 million uh, viral hepatitis initiative that the council funds every year and related programs, talking about um, adding an additional $875,000 to expand uh, community outreach, education, and screening, um, and prevention for TB, um, and talking about how we can shore up our sexual wellness clinics, which have been very successful and um, are moving us towards our elimination goals for HIV. But I'm having to talk about Article 6 cuts. So you know, you know the numbers. Um, the mayor has pledged, uh, I made a verbal commitment to throw in 50 mil $59 million to make up for DOHMH funding. Uh, we think that that's, we know that that's an estimate. It could be much more, so we really want to hold the uh, mayor accountable for that. We want the mayor to show some leadership and not just put it on the council and say it's the council's problem to solve the council, uh, to, to close the council gap, the $3.4 .4 million. He needs to show some leadership there. Um, I want to specifically call out some um, programs in addition to the ones I've already mentioned. Obviously, Access Health, Immigrant Health Initiative, um, trans equity programs, and maternal, maternal and infant health services, which also keep New Yorkers healthy and which also help advance um, our ambitious goals to end um, these infectious disease epidemics. So um, in conclusion, I again want to thank the council for the opportunity to speak on the mayor's executive budget. We uh, expect and hope for your leadership and that we can partner together to close these gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, the speaker and I are both aware of the Article 6 issue and, um, you know, trying to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I want to thank you guys for this opportunity to speak. Uh, Chairman Drum and the committee members, thank you very much. Um, uh, like many people here, I'm dismayed that Governor Cuomo and the state legislator um, legislation cut New York City's Article 6 public health funding. Um, so you guys seem to be familiar with it, but the city needs these programs um, and the healthy communities they support to function. Um, I, I really have to point out that this, um, the lawmakers are supposed to protect us or leaving the city's most marginalized, very vulnerable. Um, I'm not one of the city's most marginalized. Uh, I've lived a pretty privileged and easy life until I contracted an active tuberculosis infection when I was pregnant. Um, it was terrible, it was uh, an awful ordeal, and you can read more about it in my written testimony. Um, uh, but it was, I was isolated from the world um, <laughs> for 75 days up at Roosevelt Hospital. Um, in 2015, the year my uh, TB was diagnosed and treated, it was the first time in decades that tuberculosis cases in New York City rose. It's really important for me to note to you guys and for everyone here to understand that tuberculosis is difficult to treat even after diagnosis. Beyond hospitalization or isolation, each case requires a lot of manpower. A public health worker had to watch me take my medication for a year. I needed to visit a clinic regularly for scans and samples. A full contact investigation needed to be performed at my family, friends, and my job. I didn't have resistant TB, but those cases are increasing around the world and in New York City. We can't afford a resistant tuberculosis epidemic. It's extremely expensive. It'll be a huge drain on our public health resources. 
Um, I have to tell you that I've been in, all, obviously now I've been in a lot of these clinics, they stretch every single dollar. They make a dollar out of 15 cents every day for the people in this city. If you give them a little money, they will do so much with it. Um, public health initiatives are a small fraction of the multi-million dollar New York City budget. Each dollar works. Um, I see the time's getting short. I just gotta say, all of us are here. None of us wanna, none of us wanna live in a city where the families of Sunset Park are treated differently than the families like mine from Park Slope. That's not why people live here. That's not why they raise their families here. And that's not why they voted for Mayor de Blasio. I deeply appreciate that the mayor has said he'll commit to restoring funding to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's budget. I really do think that's great. Please restore this commitment as soon as possible. I also implore Mayor de Blasio to join the city council to fully fund all council funded public health programs, at least an additional $3.4 million. These programs are an incredible return on investment. That money will do so much for the safety, health, and well-being of this country, of the city that I was born in and that I love so much. Thank you all. Thank you. You have a lot of energy. <laughs> <laughs> I got yeah, you Next, kids. please. Good afternoon. I'm Anthony Feliciano. I'm the Executive Director of Commission on the Public Health System. Um, good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, members of the Council, uh, Gibson and Chen. Um, you heard from our colleagues, uh, similar to what we were going to say, we want to restore $2.5 million to Access Health NYC, which I want to applaud and, and commend our original champion, which was Corey Johnson when he was the Health Committee Chair, and now Mark Levine um, pushing this. And it's critically, I think, it's important given the, the federal climate, right, the threats all across the board for not only just immigrants but all marginalized communities, but also th these reckless ways and really racist ways of trying to change eligibility for options and coverage, um, now recently around the issue of, of the poverty line and so on. And so we need access help because these are 30 CBOs um, with five of us as being leads, really accessing and reaching out to hard to reach populations. But that can get all undermined. Um, part of it can get undermined because of Article 6 cut. And we agree with everyone here that even though the mayor put in 59 million, we have the programs that are not baseline. So they're not protected. And so we need to ensure that, particularly programs that align and support the baseline programs like maternity and infant child health, if you cut services to doula services, that undermines the other part of the program and the other services. Part of it is also to us to really work with the council in the future to really mitigate so we don't have to go back to this fight because it was the governor's doing. Um, the other thing I just want to add is I agree with immigration around NYC CARES and then also really to protect our public hospital system. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Louis Sawe. I know I am a policy coordinator of the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, also known as CACF. I also echo that I would like to thank Chairperson uh, Daniel Drum, Speaker Johnson, and the Committee of Finance for holding this important hearing on executive budget. Um, CACF is building a community that's too powerful to ignore. Since 1986, we have been the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization that leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support marginalized Asian Pacific American children and families. Um, with the cut of Article 6, obviously this is going to affect a lot of our member organizations, and there are over 50 of them, um, that uh, provide uh, services. Specifically, 11 of our Asian Pacific American community-based organizations provide um, education, outreach, and assistance on health services, and they are the most culturally competent, competent to do that in the most underserved of our uh, communities. So this elimination of the Article 6, fun 6 funding will impact our organization's capacity to conduct health literacy workshops, develop materials t tailored to different languages, hire culturally competent staff that reflects the APA communities that they serve in outreach, and more. So this is why we ask the City Council to call on the mayor to replace the $3.4 million law from the Article 6 state budget cut and restore $2.5 million for Access Health NYC for fiscal year 2020. So thank you for your considering our concerns and recommendations. Okay, thank you to this panel. You know, we got a fight ahead of us, and so we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next panel... Arlene Cruz from Make the Road, New York. Ray Briggs from Nysna. Roxana Garcia, Nysna. Uh, Robin Vitale, American Heart Association. Scott Daly from New York Junior Tennis League. 
and Mon Yuk Yu from the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services. Is that everyone who was called up? Uh, and I saw Scott here, but I don't know where. Oh, he's here. He is. Oh, okay. Oh, here, here he is. comes. Is Ray here? Okay. Roxana? Okay. Robin? Yep, Robin's okay. here. Okay. Um, Scott's here. Mon Yuk Yu? Okay. And Arlene? Arlene's not here. Okay. So, here, so we'll take this one. All right. Let's uh, call Carol Gross, Early Childhood Equity. Is Carol here? Okay, Carol, come Great. on up. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Roxana Garcia, and I'm an ICU nurse at Woodhall Hospital. This is not usually how I spend my day uh, giving testimony at budget meetings. Usually I work in the ICU where I take care of critically ill patients. Usually I should have about two patients, sometimes one, depending on the level of nursing care that is needed. But I have worked many shifts where I have had three, sometimes even four patients. Now that may not sound like a lot to you, but when you are taking care of patients that are on ventilators, that are on IV medications that need to be monitored closely, or, um, or if they go into cardiac arrest, um, when you're asked to care for that many patients, you are risking patient safety. We've had families say to us, we see you working so hard, running back and forth all day. They need to have more staff here. And all we can say is yes, we know. We know because we hardly get to take a full hour for lunch. We know because we skip breaks and don't use the bathroom all day. We know because we are haunted by the things that we may have missed during our shift or the mistakes made. Or by the patient that fell that would have never fallen if we would have had enough staff on the unit. We know because at the end of the shift, all we can say is, we wish we could have done more for our patients, but we just couldn't. New York City has the largest public hospital system in this country, but we still struggle to provide every patient with the care that they deserve. And the need is great. We serve everyone, regardless of their immigration status or their ability to pay. We serve everyone because we must. Public hospitals cannot run traditional business models because a lot of our patients don't pay for the care they receive because they can't afford to pay for the care that they receive. We serve everyone because we see them as patients and not as profits. That has created a two-tier healthcare system. New York's story of inequality continues. The tale of two cities, the tale of two hospital systems. Health and hospitals and our patients continually struggle for resources and bear a financial burden that the private hospitals do not. We need to do better. Every New Yorker deserves quality health care. Uh, health and hospitals needs resources so we can serve our communities. The budget proposed of 25 million is not enough. NISNA estimates that the system needs about $120 million just to hire an acceptable number of staff and ancillary nurses and ancillary staff to care for the patients that we already have. And it's also not just about money. We need to be wise with how we spend that money so that we can provide the best care for all of our patients. Study after study shows that when you I'm have, have to ask you to wrap up. Okay, sure. An adequate staffing, it improves patient safety and outcomes. Um, I know that the City Council is committed to providing quality health care to all New Yorkers, and so we are em emphasizing the need to provide enough money in the budget so that we can have enough nurses and staff to provide excellent quality care to all New Yorkers. Thank you. My name is Rhea Briggs. Red light has to be on. Yes, yeah, so on now. Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, committee members, um, um, but but at counseling committee. My name is Ray Briggs. I work at Coney Island Hospital, that's South Brooklyn. I'm from Nice, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. This is a, a considered SOS call on behalf of um, the public sector nurses, and uh, I would like to go on to say just to read a short story from our nursing week. It said um, this is a book that was comp composed of a lot of short stories of nurses' experiences with patients. He said, nursing means looking beyond what is written on a patient chart and understanding what is going on in a patient's life that impacts their health. A few days ago in the urology, in the, in the urology clinic, we saw a patient who had multiple com comorbidities noted on his, on his chart. The patient was diagnosed with urinary retention, which required him to come to, 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 come to, 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 to the clinic to, to, uh, for uh, change of his character. 
each visit he would complain that the, uh, uh, that, that, that the ambulance companies didn't want to transfer him to the hospital because he, he lived in a building with no elevator and the transporter would have to carry him four flights down. It would take him on an average two hours to get to the hospital and two hours to return home. I thought this was unacceptable and decided to see how I could help him. Visited nurses service referred me to Arch Care, who provided services for outpatients. The home care agency arranged for a nurse to go to the patient's house to change the catheter for him, right in the comfort of his own home. The patient was incredibly thankful for this. And even worse, a written, a written letter by hand, with his non-dominant hand, in quotes, um, was very touching. And this is basically one nurse, her name is Delgar Feono, our neurology department from Coney Island Hospital. Um, it just goes on to show that, I'll just make this very brief, that um, there's not equipment, there's not su enough supply to deliver the care at the public health hospital. And in terms of an HCAP score, we are suffering tremendously in terms of a low percentage in our HCAP score. And we have a, we have a triad which h and is proposing that is um, patient satisfaction, um, worker satisfaction, and efficiency of the system. And none can exist without the other. So if you don't have the resources in terms of the money availability to provide those resources, which um, is approximately um, $225 million, then we'll be shortchanging the, the, the people of New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. I want to thank you both for being here. Nisna is so important. Nurses are so important for our city, and I've been proud to stand with you on advocating for safe staffing ratios across the system so that nurses don't have to make uh, really, really untenable decisions on who to care for because there's a shortage of NORT nurses in units across the system, whether it be the ICU or NICU or any of the important units that are staffed and currently are not staffed with an adequate number of nurses. So for you to be here today uh, on the day that you should be resting at home, uh, since you're not at work, you're not at Woodhull or Coney Island, I'm really grateful that you're here today. I'm really proud of the work that Nisden does every single day and we look forward to continuing to work with you and advocating on your behalf. Please. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Robin. Thank you, Speaker. Yes. Thank you, Speaker, Chair, and committee members. My name is Robin Vitale. I serve as Vice President of Health Strategies for the American Heart Association here in New York City. Our testimony has numerous proposals relative to how the city can leverage um, important public funding in support of our mission, which is essentially to save lives. Um, we do break down to several proposals, um, initially looking at healthy eating and nutrition access, making sure that New Yorkers, uh, regardless of what neighborhood they live in, can access and afford healthy food. And we do ask for city um, uh, expenditures focusing in on both the built environment, um, the establishment of a city-specific HFFI, as well as expanding the work of programs like Shop Healthy, which support business owners to bring fruits and vegetables into existing bodegas or corner stores, um, as well as helping to expand the reach of Health Bucks, um, the, the SNAP incentive, which obviously has tremendous evidence um, supporting low-income New Yorkers to um, have improved nutrition with uh, access to produce. We are also looking at improvements to physical activity, making sure that, again, regardless of where you live, you can access safe space to be physically active. We applaud all the efforts looking at protected bike lanes and expanding greenways, um, as well as um, efforts within the school. And the chair is uh, keenly aware of the work that has been achieved under physical education. And we applaud the impact that's been done under the PE Works Initiative. Um, we understand that some funding might be baselined um, in this current budget, and we are very excited about that. We do encourage a continued focus around um, the infrastructure within our schools to make sure that students have a safe space to have quality, effective physical education as well. Um, we're also very interested in um, after-school athletics and activities and making sure that our recreation fields um, are in appropriate shape and obviously there's an, a, a provided need um, for investing in that space as well. Um, we are also very um, focused on our patient care, so after uh, an individual experiences um, a heart attack, cardiac arrest, or stroke, what happens then? Um, we are encouraging the city to look at the Article 66 funding, especially around the heart and, uh, Beating Hearts Initiative, to make sure that that program is kept in place and ultimately expanded in its reach. And of course, we want to make sure that uh, tobacco control and other programs like that are not going to be impacted. 
Thank hey, you. thank you. Next, please. Robin, you're amazing. We are always grateful <laughs> to be able to. one second over, sorry. No, we're, we're grateful to always be able to work with you. And I had the pleasure of doing it when I chaired the health committee. I know you've been doing it with Councilmember Levine, the new chair of the health committee as well. As some recent bills you worked with Councilmember Kalos on, Healthy Happy, Happy Meals bill. So thank, thank you for you. being here today as always. Thank you for that. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Manyak Yu. I'm the Executive Vice President at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services, a public health not-for-profit organization in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, we provide free clinical health screenings integrated with individualized health and literacy education and social services to the immigrant populations of New York City. Our priorities in FY20 are to address social determinants of health by removing barriers to health care, providing preventative health and screening health screening services, mental health therapy, improving community literacy in, um, in the English language and enabling our communities to reach socioeconomic stability and advocate for their own rights as New York City residents. Currently, um, nearly 90% of our AMPs of clients at our organization do not, have, have, do not have health insurance and have not seen a provider in decades. Over the past years, federal immigration threats, hate crimes and violence Assimilative stress and migratory trauma have increased anxieties among immigrant communities. Threats to rescind DACA and terminate TPS programs will further disenfranchise more members of this community from accessing health care, leading to an unprecedented increase of uninsured immigrants seeking health care services through our organization. Sliding scale fees, even through the NYC CARES program, despite being reduced, will still be unaffordable for many of our clients. Mental health services will average at around $90 to $200 per client, even under the system. Recently, the mayor announced detrimental Article 6 cuts to the Immigrant Health Initiative. Again, there are about 130,000 New Yorkers who lack health care access in New York right now due to their documentation status. In our current environment, community organizations like ours play an important role as a safety net to a safety net to help fill the gap that our federal and state governments have created. This investment in Article 6 funding will be detrimental for our, free, for our free health, mental health, and social assistance programs, threatening not only the health outcomes of the immigrant communities, but also the public health of our city. The proposed cuts will lead to further limit our health programs, including limiting our free mental health counseling to only 15 hours per week, reducing a third of our public health outreach initiatives, um, which are provided in a culturally competent manner by our community health workers. Thank, thank you. We appreciate you Thank being you. here and your testimony. We'll review it. Thank you. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, Council members, staff. My name is Scott Daly, and I am the director of NYJTL's free tennis program for kids throughout the city. New York Junior Tennis and Learning has been a partner with the city of New York for many, many years. We serve every council district throughout the city every year with the free programs for kids. No one is ever, ever gets rejected from the ages of 5 to 18. They can come to us. Most of these kids never have seen a tennis racket, never have played before. As I speak to you right now at 3.30, we have 31 different locations throughout the five boroughs that are up and running providing something to do for these kids with trained coaches on a daily basis for five days a week. We've extended into Saturday programs because many of these kids can't make the Monday to Friday programs. In addition to the free community tennis programs, we have what we call STP, school time tennis program. We train the New York City DOE gym teachers to teach gym to kids during the school day. We further support that by sending in our senior staff to further implement and get it off the ground in the schools with the hope that these kids will come out and play at our community tennis sites. We have advanced training for the kids. Let me just break down some numbers that you'll see in the testimony. Our demographics last year, uh, in total we served 85,000 kids. Uh, a lot, many of them through the STP, some through, most through the community tennis program. 25% are Asian, 25% are African American, 25% are Latino. We're open to everybody, anytime, all through the year. Here's the big ask. 11 years ago, we got cut. Our funding got cut. We're funded under the Physical Education and Fitness Initiative. 
We have remained stagnant at that number. It is increasingly impossible and difficult to go through this. Seven years ago, just let me leave you with this one thought. The minimum wage, 11 years ago, I'm sorry, 11 years ago, minimum wage was seven bucks. We're up to $15 now. Everything has increased. I need an increase. I want to thank the City Council for all you've done for the kids of the City of New York. How much do you get right now? 800. 800,000? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Carol Gross. Um, I'm a retired teacher, early childhood teacher educator. I work with teachers in the Bronx in pre-K and community-based organizations. We thank you for your commitment to the children of New York City. Through your pre-K for all and 3K initiatives, and our, our communities are receiving high quality education that would not be available otherwise. We appreciate your willingness to come to the table to discuss equal funding for early childhood services that occur outside the Department of Education buildings. More than 1,300 programs are affected by the outcomes of these conversations. We send our support we send our support as the committee works to achieve a successful solution. We are community-based organizations. Um, the outcomes of negotiations will have a critical and far-reaching impact on low-resourced communities. Many of our programs were started by parents and neighbors uh, in the community who set out to bring early childhood education options to their community. We are central to our communities that we, and we employ families and neighbors. Community-based organizations are 60% of your signature 3K and pre-K programs, over 1,000 programs in the city. The work is a joy and we are proud to do it. When you enter our schools, you see passionate educators who give children an education equal to the, their Department of Education colleagues and you see happy children learning. We have a unique opportunity to bring equity to your education. You have a unique opportunity to bring equity to your education initiatives. This is a necessary step to make it su a sustainable network of early childhood education. Uh, with equity in, in funding per student and fair enrollment practices, we can equalize salaries. Right now, teachers who have equal qualifications to the Department of Ed teachers are making far less and working far longer hours in these programs. We can eliminate pay for enrollment. We can provide adequate funding for indirect costs and stabilize our communities. We urge you to pass the council proposal and embrace equal funding for equal work, and we invite you to visit our programs. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Great. Right. Here. All right. Uh, Grace Yunhe Kim, Korean Community Services. Tasmin Udin, Turning Point for Women and Families. Sylvia Sichter, India Home. Uh, Zara Ali, Arab American Family Support Center. And Tasfia Rahman, Coalition for Ch Asian American Children and Families. Okay, good. So why don't you start? Good afternoon. My name is Inhei Grace Kim. I'm an assistant director at Korean Community. Just pull a little closer okay. to you, and so it's okay. a little hard to hear. So good afternoon. My name is Inhei Grace Kim, and I'm an assistant director at Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York, known KCS. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you how the New York State Article 6 budget cut will impact by uh, if impact the lives of our community members and the importance of the restoring MCAP program. Um, and the 15% growing campaign for Asian Pacific American communities. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the speaker and the chair and the finance committee for holding today's hearing. Um, KCS um, has been the first um, social service nonprofit organization in New York serving Korean community, and today KCS serves daily average of 1,100 individuals through its six program sites. Um, first, I'd like to share some of the, our successes through Article 6 funding. Um, FY20, with Access Health Funding, we were able to conduct culturally and linguistically ap appropriate outreach event and educate 670 community members about basic knowledge of health insurance, Medicare, and their health care right. 
And furthermore, through the vital hepatitis B funding, our team discovered 26 new chronic patients and provided service coordination for 76 active happy patients. Um, because of this funding, we educate chronic happy patients on how many their diseases as well as offer follow-up examination to the patient who do not have and cannot afford health insurance. Um, Article 6 budget cut will affect these great services. And we expect about like fifty thousand dollar cut from this um, um, from this funding. Second, I'd like to urge um, city council members to support the MCAP program, Managed Care Consumer Assistance Program, as a speaker initiative by providing one million dollar in funding in the um, FY20 budget. Um, MCAP is designed to help New York City residents by providing one-on-one -on -one assistance to understand their medical bill and the case management. Um, just one, one thing uh, specifically, the, um, there are many LEP uh, limited English proficiency issue in our community, and there is no place for us to refer them for this issue. So with this MCAP program, we will be able to hire one, at least one staff and provide necessary service for our um, community members from the community trusted organization with appropriate languages. Thank, Thank you. you. We love KCS. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Tasfia Rahman, and I am a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and Chairperson Drum, um, in your leadership for advocating for key funding and resources necessary for our communities to thrive in these challenging times. CACF leads the 15% and growing campaign, a group of over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations that work together to ensure that New York City's budget protects the most vulnerable Asian Pacific American New Yorkers. Campaign members employ thousands of New Yorkers and serve hundreds of thousands of our members. Currently, the APA community is the fastest growing group in New York City, nearly doubling every decade since 1970, and currently making up 15% of the population. Unfortunately, current levels of public funding for APA community remain disproportionate to our community's needs. Um, nearly a quarter of APAs live in poverty, the highest of all racial groups in NYC. A majority of us are foreign born, and we also have the highest linguistic isolation rate at 42%. So I have a longer written testimony listing out yes. the recommendations, but I just wanted to highlight two. Um, what this means is that we have people struggling to find suitable high paying jobs to support their families in these hard times. Rising housing and living costs have forced our communities into overcrowded housing and schools. Contrary to the Asian model minority myth, we still hear about stories of APA immigrant children that continue to interpret for their parents, parents to just have access to vital services such as health insurance or care. We have immigrant parents wanting to be more involved in their children's schools, but being too uncomfortable and embarrassed by their limited English proficiency to do so. As a result, feelings of isolation are common among our children. Yet our communities, as well as organizations that serve these communities, still lack the resources to provide critical services to the most marginalized APAs. Therefore, we do thank the council for calling on the mayor to invest in initiatives and programs such as the $70 million in annual bridge program funding that was promised by the mayor years ago. We want to ensure we still want to ensure that there are opportunities for largely immigrant and limited English proficient populations to access resources and programs to attain the skills that you need for well-paying jobs, especially for individuals like my mother who still sees herself as undereducated Muslim woman and that she would never meet the requirements for current bridge level program. I just wanted to add this one thing. We also thank you for your leadership in calling for investments in social and emotional well-being of children. Right now in our community, we have students telling us that they don't know why they bother getting out of bed, why it's worth going to school when they don't know why they're going. I don't blame them because many of our families are in survival mode. Our students are not given the opportunity to discover their own interests and unique talents. Instead, schools are forced to assess the value of our students through over-testing and state standards that do not meet the, address the needs of our students. Thank you so much for Thank giving you. me this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Thank you to the New York City Council Committee and the Finance Committee for inviting community-based organizations to comment on budget proposals for FY20. My name is Zara Ali. I'm the Development Communications Manager at the Arab American Family Support Center. I'm honored to testify with the 15% and growing campaign today on behalf of immigrant and refugee families throughout New York City. At the Arab American Family Support Center, we've strengthened immigrant and refugee families since 1994. Over the past year, our trauma-informed home-based services kept 830 children from 329 families safely in their homes and out of foster care. We assisted over 1,200 survivors of gender-based violence, offering case management, crisis intervention uh, support at family justice centers across the city. 
We also launched a new mental health initiative to address the heightened risk of depression and anxiety immigrants face in this atmosphere of uncertainty and hostility. Immigrant community members face multiple challenges, including language barriers, limited education and resources, and unfamiliarity with our complex social service and healthcare delivery systems. We understand the needs of our community members and we recognize the City Council is committed to their health and well-being. Today we call on the New York City Council and the Committee on Finance to ensure our budget safeguards and expands programs essential for immigrant New Yorkers. For FY 2020, we respectfully request continued and full funding of City Council initiatives that provide life-saving and transformative services for immigrant families, including the Domestic Violence and Empowerment Initiative, the Initiative for Immigrant Survivors of Domestic Violence, as well as Compass and Sonic Elementary School programs. We also request increased city support for, uh, for community-based organizations that have relied on Access Health Funding and the NYS Match, robust funding for census outreach, and finally, we thank the Council for your advocacy to ensure adult literacy initiative is set to 12 million for community-based organizations. Thank you for your attention. We hope the City Council will continue including organizations that work intimately with immigrants and refugees in conversation about community needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and Chair Drum and the members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Sylvia Sigdar. I'm the program manager at India Home. India Home is a nonprofit organization founded by the community leaders. And we have the population who are 100% of uh, foreign born and 80% of them are limited English proficiency which limits their access to mainstream services. India Home and other immigrant-led organizations that serves seniors fill a critical gap in the serving an intersectionally vulnerable population. The City Council has been an invaluable partner in our efforts to provide these critical services to the immigrant older adults. However, our community resources are running thin. Despite our senior clients increasing day by day, the ch changes in the mayor's budget do not reflect the growing need of the seniors population. The budget cuts from the mayor's executive budget for FY20 will affect the operational support to culturally competent and linguistically accessible non-deaf senior centers like ours. India Home ties to address the growing needs of senior center services. However, we are in need of more expense funding. We understand the city is facing budget cuts in the state level. However, the community we are serving are facing increasing challenges to live a safe and steady life. Therefore, we have some recommendations. Creative aging funding should be expanded to include more diverse arts organizations. Funding for technology support in senior centers should be made a priority the way that is in the school. Transportation is a dire need for the seniors. Funding needs to go beyond capital to the include operating expenses for the vehicles. The demand for the case management is extremely high in immigrant population due to the language barriers. Funding for case management has to be increased for this population needs to be met. Housing for diverse uh, population needs to be funded for a smaller numbers of units to accommodation of cultural needs of this group. Asian-led organization provides the most effective culturally co competent and language accessible services that have the largest impact in addressing the needs of our community. New York City Council must continue to support the increase of the discretionary dollars given to the Asian community-based organization. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Desmino Dean. I'm the Youth Program Coordinator at Turning Point for Women and Families. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Turning Point for Women and Families was founded in 2004 and is the first nonprofit to address domestic violence in New York City's Muslim community. Turning Point helps Muslim women and girls affected by domestic violence empower themselves and transform their lives through a wide range of culturally competent services focused on safety and self-sufficiency. To date, we have worked directly with over 2,500 women, adolescent girls, and children. The situations of our survivors are made more difficult by language or cultural barriers, poverty, and limited knowledge about their rights. Turning Point is grateful that the City Council has not only restored but increased funding allocated for the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative. This increase will help provide better access to legal assistance and programs that will help our survivors obtain the language skills they need to secure citizenship and decent jobs. Since 2015, Turning Point has offered ESOL classes to help senior Muslim women, all of whom are immigrants, learn English and pass the citizenship exam. 
In this past year alone, four of our seniors have obtained citizenship and six more are in the pipeline. Programs such as ours that provide adult literacy services in native tongues are crucial to sustain, especially in the current anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant climate. Turning Point urges the City Council to increase funding for adult literacy programs and senior centers for immigrant populations. While City Council has allocated 10 million for senior centers, Turning Point joins the 15% and growing campaign in asking for 2.8 million to be allocated specifically for senior centers for immigrant populations. These centers provide immigrant seniors with a place to find community and break isolation while learning to be independent. When our seniors participate in our ESOL classes, they are not only learning English, but are also learning to advocate for themselves. Nine of our seniors attended APA Advocacy Day on February 27, 2019. They stood on the steps of City Hall to advocate for more equitable funding for immigrant senior services, and they are counting on your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very familiar with everybody on the panel. Uh, I know your needs well, and uh, we're going to fight for you, so let's see. Okay. I, I want to thank you all for being here. You all have been uh, really tremendous allies and advocates, not just course in the current year that we're in but year after year after year the organizations that you represent do such a tremendous amount of work and provide a tremendous level of service for New Yorkers and it is really amazing to see it was five I believe but four women of color up there advocating in a strong bold amazing way uh, for New Yorkers the greatest part of New York City is our diversity the fact that 38% of New Yorkers were not born in the United States of America, but came here with dreams and aspirations for themselves and for their families. And so to have you up there advocating on behalf of so many New Yorkers, especially vulnerable New Yorkers, is really, really uh, key. And we're tremendously grateful for your advocacy and for your leadership and for your partnership. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Don Cal, uh, Levka. Strakova, Quandell Freeman, Asia Avery, and Emma Rehak. Do we have to? Okay, should we start over I, here? Okay. Yep. Um, okay, I thought I had three minutes, so I'll go fast, but apologies in advance. Um, I'm here on behalf of Project Reach, a program within CPC. My name is Emma Rahak. I am 17 years old. I live in central Harlem, and I'm currently a junior at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. I'm a member of my school leadership team, or SLT, a co-founder and leader of my school's equity club, and I'm also a senior member of a restorative justice program called the Harlem Youth Court. My involvement in these clubs and organizations over the past two years has allowed me to develop a very close and personal relationship with Project Reach. A full description of the things I have learned and the support I have received from Project Reach cannot be translated in a three-minute testimony. I am Asian. But my first words were in Dutch. I live in the majority black neighborhood of central Harlem with a white immigrant single mom. The process of acknowledging my privilege while also uplifting the less, un less represented parts of my identity is an experience that I struggle with daily. Project Reach has taught me what it means to live an intersectional life. They have taught me how to di differentiate between race and ethnicity and how to differentiate from gender, ge sex from gender. Project Reach has taught me the history of racism that we don't learn in school, and they have taught me how to be aware of my own unconscious biases. Project Reach taught me what it's like to be part of a safe environment that empowers rather than protects. And they've taught me how to create that kind of safe space on my own. Project Reach has taught me how to turn anger into productive energy they have taught me how to care and take care, and they have taught me how to ask for help. Had I been exposed to Project Reach and the work that they do earlier or more extensively, 
My experiences as a student and as a human who is part of society, those experiences would have been much more positive, much less strenuous, because from Project Reach, I have learned that the things I carry are not burdens. They are tools to empower. So I hope Project REACH will be given the resources necessary to expand their work as much as possible, because the work that they do does not simply educate or support. It shifts culture, dismantling systems of discrimination one conversation at a time. Thank you. Tell me your name again. Emma Rayhack. You're unbelievable. Thank you. You give me hope for our future Thank and you. for the city. You, that was such moving. I, I, I feel like we've met, I, um, I was Harvey Epstein's field director, so oh. I, I feel like we've crossed paths. Well, you're amazing, and I'm so grateful <laughs> that you're here today, and it was so moving to hear that just incredibly heartfelt and um, wonderfully eloquent testimony from you today, and I'm Thank really, you. really grateful that you're here today, so thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Asha Avery, and I am a senior at Eleanor Roosevelt High School, and I'm here to testify also on behalf of Project Reach and the CPC. Um, I am the granddaughter of immigrant, Colombian immigrants while also being African American on my father's side. I can trace my family's history back to the 1700s as slaves um, in South Carolina, and our family has continued to live there to the present day. I graduated from Manhattan Country School when I was 14 years old. I went there my entire life, and I've had the honor of working with um, Chairwoman Helen Rosenthal with her work that she's also done with our middle school. I know she's not here right now. But as I entered high school and got to Eleanor Roosevelt, it was one of the first places where I was really able to see the important work that has been done by Project Reach, and it was the first time that I was ever able to see actual meaningful work done post Brown versus Ed to address the inequalities that have been built into our system from the beginning of our school systems, but really addressing the inequalities that don't go just between integrating schools that go beyond simply race, but also the intersectionality of privilege as a person who have, has had a lot of privileges in life to gone to private school for most of her life and who has lived a very privileged life. Also understanding the complexities of race and gender and how those things play into interactions and the microaggressions and the different things that happen within a school system when you have mostly white students with few students of color. Project Reach has been the first organization that I've ever seen and has done such meaningful work with me and empowered me in such a serious way to understand and be able to have these conversations with my classmates and to have these conversations to reach out to students who might feel marginalized for different reasons and to acknowledge and accept their um, experiences within also the context of different privileges. So thank you. That, yeah. How old are you? I'm 18. <laughs> I am like slack jawed sitting up here. I am like in awe of, of the amazing, amazing young adults that are here today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lovka Starkova. Um, I am here on the behalf of Project REACH Internship. Um, I am pansexual and gender fluid. My pronouns are they, them. And for most of my life, I have not been able to express myself the way I wanted to. Uh, the Project REACH Internship for me personally is a very safe space, um, a safe space that my home and my family has not been able to provide, but I believe in chosen family because, as the saying goes, blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. So to me, many people in the internship are my new family, or at least the family I chose to have. And um, also Project Reach has helped me uh, learn to discuss topics that are never brought up in schools or in families. And thanks to um, Project Reach, the Project Reach internship. Um, I know I now can facilitate discussions within my school and um, within other communities. And the internship has helped me connect with other members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so to me, it's 
a safe and secure space where I can express my views and opinions without fear of being harassed or judged for what I believe in. It's very brave uh, of you to be here today and to, and to talk about that experience. And one of the things that, that I've learned, even though our experiences are, of course, very, very different, but as uh, someone uh, who is part of the LGBT community um, that has had an affirming family, I still have had the ability to have a chosen family as well. And I know that uh, Councilmember Drum would, I think, shimo similarly say that one of the things that you learn as an LGBT person, not just LGBT people, but uh, people that have been marginalized is the ability to make decisions on how we choose, who we get to spend our lives with, and who we get to interact with and bond with. So to hear that experience uh, is very, very moving, and I'm really grateful for uh, your bravery and being here today and discussing it so openly. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Quan. Oh, this oh, mic's on too. Sorry. Um, my name is Quandell. I'm 17. I'm, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm black, uh, Native American, and Latino. I've pretty much grew up in the military background, been a little bit of everywhere. Um, so I've interned at Project Reach over the year, and pretty much I go to the school Urban Assembly for Emergency Management, where I'm currently head captain for my wrestling team. One of my closest friends and fellow teammates is gay, but he's scared due to the fact of society. So he identifies as bisexual. He's scared of the sexism that comes with being gay and pretty much the fear of what, not knowing what's gonna happen and like not being accepted of by his teammates, by his classmates, or even by his opponents due to the fact of him being openly gay. So he identifies as bisexual. With Project Reach, it's more of a anti-discrimination like environment. And if there was more environments like this and pretty much help kids broaden, broaden their view, I feel like you wouldn't have this fear and wouldn't fear coming out and wouldn't fear pretty much being truly who he is on the inside and that he knows he's gonna be accepted by everyone. But it's not like that. But if it was more like place like Project Reach, it would be. Thank you very much. Uh, it's so uh, moving to hear uh, all four of you uh, today. And Don Cow, you have a tough act to follow after uh, these four incredible uh, testifiers that are here today, and I want to thank you all. Uh, I'm glad I only have two minutes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I've been with Project Reach for 35 years. Um, unlike these young people, um, I wasn't able to move on, <laughs> so I stayed. Um, I'm a little emotional because, uh, you know, we all do what we do, hoping that we can have some impact. And this is the second year in a row that Catherine Chambers, my coworker, has not been able to be here with us because of challenges she face, faces in spite of the fact that she's an excellent trainer. She came to us, uh, Catherine is a Bengali Muslim transgender female, came to us at 17 and is now 23 and is my, is my uh, partner in crime, if you will. Um, we do the internship, we've, uh, be, as a result of the anti-discrimination clinics we've done, and in your, in your packet you'll see that we have five of them that are two-day clinics, uh, 12 hours each, working with young people, and then we repeat it with adults who work with young people, because we feel that the only way that you can change culture the way that Emma described is by working with everybody. Uh, but it's been a real challenge because we lost quite a bit of money, and if it were not for the speaker and council member Drum, council member uh, Chin and a number of other, and the city council in general, um, we wouldn't be doing our work. We would have been closed down. In spite of that, I would say that uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, well, last fiscal year, uh, two years ago, we served about 5,000 people, the two of us, after we reduced our staff by four 
And this, this past year, we served over 7,000 and still had to find the time to do an internship, which is in our in-house program, and to be in places like Scholars Academy out in the far Rockaway. We were just there for two days. We we're up at Destination Tomorrow, which I'm proud to say is the, is the new um, uh, LGBT center in the Bronx that is actually run by transgender, fo of transgender people of color. Um, but we're getting tired. And so um, we appreciate what the city council has been able to do. We see, don't seem to be able to get state funding. And so we're asking for an increase so that we can get more uh, staff people, more trainers, uh, because um, as a result of our wonderful uh, government in DC, we have more work than we can handle. And we would like to be able to do more work. And uh, I would have to say that our soldiers are sitting here with me. <laughs> And um, well, we're hoping we can get more support. We've also applied for the trans, uh, trans equity um, uh, initiative because Catherine uh, is, has been a magnet for transgender and gender nonconforming and non-binary young people. And we're hoping to be able to get enough money so that they can run, have a youth run transgender uh, safe space called, um, I can't remember, what was the name of it? A, a, a room, it, it was something, a room of one's own or something like that. Anyway, so with your support, we're hoping to, to grow our work. Uh, the last part I want to say is that we actually have a center that we can't afford anymore because we had it with half a million dollars of state funding, and we now house the American Indian, Indian Community House, which lost all of its funding, and the own, uh, and fortunately, Council Member Chin uh, has provided some funding for them, and we're still trying to figure out how to access that funding, but they are the only organization serving indigenous and native people, and we're trying to get the council and possibly the mayor to re bring back something that David Dinkins had, which was a commission on indigenous people. And right now, the only people we are talking to at the moment is uh, um, Nick Galata, who is under immigrant services through the mayor's office, and so we ask you to consider Thank you. helping us Thank you, Don. that community. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much. Okay, next up we have Jessica Yeager from uh, WIN, Women in Need, Mercedes Jennings for the Partnership for the Homeless, Catherine Trapani for Homeless Services United, Marcus Diego from the Fair Futures Coalition, Annie Juano from the New York Junior League, and Sarah Childs from the Fair Futures Campaign. Okay, uh, begin in whatever order you'd like. Just make sure the red light is on on the microphone in front of you. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Yeager, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Planning for Women in Need, New York City's largest provider of shelter and services for homeless families with children. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. First, I'd like to address two issues currently pending before the Council. First, social workers in schools. There's substantial evidence that housing instability and homelessness have serious consequences for a child's education. Wynn is asking for the council's continued leadership in ensuring funding for our 100 Bridging the Gap social workers to help homeless students stay on course. The second pending issue is housing set-asides. Among the most daunting obstacles faced by homeless families is New York City's scant supply of affordable rental apartments. To afford the 2016 median asking rent of $2,695 in New York City, a family would need to work about four jobs at the current $15 minimum wage. Wynn strongly supports efforts to increase the set aside for homeless families in city subsidized properties. Next, I'd like to highlight for you two other key issues that Wynn plans to work on in the coming year. The first is housing voucher reform. 
The current city of HEP's rent limit of $1,557 a month for a three or four person household is too low for New York City. Increasing the limit to $2,100 a month would open access to two bedroom apartments in 16 different neighborhoods, dramatically increasing the pool of units affordable with the voucher. SODA, the city's one year rental voucher, assumes families will be able to pay the full rent without assistance at the end of the year. SODA families with continued financial need should be eligible for continued rental assistance without needing to return to shelter. The final issue I'd like to mention quickly is the need to support children not only in school as noted, but also in shelter. Shelters must be equipped to help families address their children's social, emotional, and educational well-being. At Wynn, we've been able to do that because we have that flexible funding, but social workers are not widely available across the family shelter system for children. Um, there's more detail in my written testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Council, for allowing me to speak today. My name is Mercedes Jennings, and I have been working for the Partnership for the Homeless for four and a half years. Um, the Partnership is a not-for-profit um, that strives to eliminate the root causes of homelessness, and we actually believe that it is solvable. Um, and then with that, the partnership defines homelessness as an economic circumstance and a housing affordability issue that continues to neg negatively affect families. Currently, the vast majority of the population in the shelter system are families, making the largest group residing in shelter children. Children miss an average of 10 school days um, from the moment a family is evicted from housing to being found eligible for shelter placement at PATH. As DOE staff are aware, anyone who's worked in the Department of Education, 10 consecutive school days would make them eligible for promotion and doubt of being held over in school. Suffering from homelessness should not be the reason children continue to be disconnected from their schools. The partnership applauds the administration's efforts so far by bridging the GAP program, as well as adding more staff to PATH. However, all the efforts that the city has put forth thus far will be in vain if the root problem, keeping ch people in their homes, isn't uh, also addressed. For families that are entering PATH, the partnership supports the position of having newly constructed shelters placed in the neighborhoods that the children were evicted from. This solution limits the number and severity of school disruptions that typically impact families transitioning through homelessness. Additionally, in order to keep children in school, we must first keep children in housing. Preventing eviction is not only cost effective, but prevents homelessness today and tomorrow. The most effective way to ensure children's access to education is for the administration to make a robust investment into financial assistance services. The partnership has already met with a couple, a couple of council members and will continue to do so in order to advance this effort. We ask the administration for the 2020 fiscal year, I'm about to finish off, to focus on investing more at funding and to eviction prevention work. This policy focus will help keep children stable so they can stay in school, thus preventing the likelihood of future homelessness in New York City. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Trapani. I'm the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. We're the coalition of the mission-driven nonprofit homeless service providers in New York City. Um, I want to first just express my gratitude to the council, to the City Council and Speaker Johnson. Um, you included many of our priorities um, in your budget response and the preliminary budget, including social workers for homeless families placed in hotels, which is hugely important, uh, bridging the gap social workers in schools for students living in temporary housing, educational support center at PATH, and funding to fill the gap between providers indirect costs and the contract reimbursement rates from the city. So all of those things are hugely important and we thank you for your support. Um, I want to touch on a couple of things that weren't in there in, in, in the next minute. Um, one is the model budget implementation for Department of Homeless Services shelters. We are still waiting for money to be out the door. Um, that was committed at least two budget cycles ago at this point, so uh, we need urgent action um, to accelerate the pace of registering the amendments and contracts on the DHS budget side. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about prevention to piggyback on the uh, 
Partnership for the Homelessness testimony. Uh, the city has recently, um, be, due to a budget shift from the state, taken over the state FAHEPS program. Um, and the HRA budget, um, while it does uh, increase funding to account for the differences in the rent levels for state FAHEPS, it does not uh, provide funding for the CBOs to actually facilitate enrollment, and that is a huge loss. We need to keep people in their homes, and we need the $3 million for the CBOs that are facilitating perhaps re uh, uh, enrollment to be put back into the budget. So that's a huge need on the prevention side for, frankly, very little money. Um, and I just want to uh, make sure that you're aware of that shift because it hasn't really been talked about that much, um, but uh, reiterate my support for certainly the uh, service-rich environment within the shelters for those that do become homeless, um, including Bridging the Gap social workers and, and the social workers at hotels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, keep, of course, speaking to the chair of our general welfare committee, Steve Levin, about these issues throughout the cycle, throughout the process. It would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marcus Diego, and I'm here to advocate for funding for Fair Futures model for foster youth. All young people in foster care need individual support with their academic and career goals, and we are not ready to be on our own at age 21. Mm -hmm. We need someone who we can trust and who will be here for us until age 26 through all, through all of the transitions in our lives. That said, um, through the Fair Futures campaign, we are asking the city for, fair, um, for 50 million so that all young people in foster care can have a coach and the support that they need from six, sixth grade through age 26. We as foster youth as well as needs to get support for the next generation. I, w I was at a foster care agency and I grew up in the system for 16 years and they didn't have a coaching program. They told me that they didn't have enough funding for a program like that. But I eventually found a mentor. My mentor helped me become the person that I am today. He's been there for me through the beginning of my college career and will be there to the very end. All young people in foster care need a coach because we grow up, we grow up every day without families and have caseworkers who don't really care for us. We have to move to home to home with no, when no one understands us. We are asking the city for 50 million so all young people can have support from six, sixth grade through age 26. Thank you. Marcus, thank you for being here. Very important to, to hear your personal testimony, so thank you. Hello, my name is Annie Huang, and I'm a member of the New York Junior League, which is a nonprofit organization of women committed to promoting volunteerism, developing women's potential, and improving communities through the effective action leadership of trained volunteers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the importance of increasing the number of bridging the gap social workers for students living in shelters. I'm reading the following testimony on behalf of Jean Delaney, a parent who was homeless and was unable to be here in person due to her child's schedule. She wanted to make sure her voice was heard. This, was, this is the testimony of Jean Delaney. I live in a shelter with my child, Riley, who is seven years old and is diagnosed with autism. My son and I entered a shelter in Manhattan toward the end of the school year last year. My son began attending PS 129 in Manhattan, which had the 1211 special education class he needed. I was very lucky that PS 129 has a bridging the gap social worker, Ms. Friedman. Ms. Friedman made sure that Riley was the most comfortable he could be at a new school. He could get, she could get all the paperwork in place for his individualized education program, IEP. She reached out to me more than anyone in any school ever had before. This was a point in my life when Riley and I needed support and Ms. Friedman was truly a godsend. The city then transferred Riley and me from our shelter in Manhattan to a shelter in the Bronx. I faced a difficult choice. As a child with autism, Riley has a lot of trouble with transitions and I did not want him to switch schools. PS 129 had the special education class he needed and he was used to his teachers, his friends, and classroom routines. However, a long bus ride was also very hard on Riley. Ms. Friedman got right to work. She reached out to the right person to get us moved back to a shelter in Manhattan near his school. 
Ms. Friedman provides counseling to my son once a week, helping him with his social emotional skills. When he has had a bad day in class, his teachers can call Ms. Friedman to help. As a social worker, she has the training to know what to do to address Riley's needs and help him. So I'm truly grateful for Bridging the Gap Social Work Program, but what about all the children whose schools don't have bridging, a Bridging the Gap Social Worker? Every child and every parent deserves to have this support while living in shelter. I hope the city will pay more for Bridging the Gap Social Workers. Just think about all the children who could be helped. The children are our future and we should give them what they need to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really proud of this council. We were the advocates and champions for bridging the work social workers last year, bridging the gap social workers last year. We fought for it in our budget response. You saw some money show up in the mayor's executive budget. We're going to continue to beat the drum on this because we know how important it is for homeless families and children uh, in the shelter system, but also in hotels. And we need to ensure that these young people, especially when you have a significant number of schools where a large percentage are unstably housed families and homeless families, that those schools have social workers, but also the shelters and the hotels themselves have it. So I'm really grateful to hear Ms. Friedman's personal testimony, and I thank you for reading it here today. Yes, of course. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Childs. I'm the executive director of the Red Lick Horowitz Foundation, and we provide financial support for the Fair Futures campaign. We're a philanthropy dedicated to improving the foster care system in New York. In recent years, we've granted close to $1.5 million to ACS for technical assistance and over $4 million to New York City foster care agencies. I want to thank Chairperson Drum for permitting this testimony regarding Fair Futures to support youth in and aging out of foster care with critical coaching and education supports from age 14 to 26. And we thank the entire council for recognizing the value of Fair Futures in its response to the 2020 preliminary budget, and especially to Speaker Johnson. Thank you very much. With 100 organizations in the Fair Futures Coalition, rallies in all five boroughs, and tons of press, we know you've heard a lot lately about the critical improvements in education and career outcomes this model achieves for young people who have experienced foster care. But what you haven't heard a lot about is the important role coaches play in stabilizing foster care placements, reducing our city's reliance on expensive residential care, and improving permanent permanency outcomes for our youth in foster care. Often the behaviors of young people in foster care stem from trauma and the need for attention, emotional support, and someone to believe in them. Coaches meet all these needs and help young people thrive in homes rather than in institutions. In fiscal year 2018, Graham Windham, a terrific foster care agency here in the city, their permanency rate where most youth received coaching in residential care is 14.5%, compared to a system-wide average of 10.3%. If this model were taken system-wide, it's estimated that the improved permanency for youth in foster care would save the city up to $7 million annually. I'd also like to just note that uh, several foundations have committed $2 million to match public funds, uh, and we're investing in infrastructure to track results and train staff, but we need $50 million in public funding to scale these su successes across the city. Lastly, I'd just like to note that several young people have submitted testimony today in support of Fair Futures. They were not able to come uh, because they are at a training for the Foster Youth Shadow Day, which is on May 29th. And and we invite you and all council members to please talk to these young people about Fair Futures and uh, the important services that coaches have provided them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for being here today. Okay, next up is uh, Michelle Jackson from the Human Services Council, Maria Lazardo from uh, NMIC, Osman Ahmed from FPWA, uh, Faith Behem from uh, UJA, Federation of New York, Nora Moran from United Neighborhood Houses, and Laura uh, from Supportive Housing Network. Okay, why don't we start on this side? Just make sure that red light is on. Thank you so much. Um, 
Speaker Corey Johnson and to Council Member Gibson and Joe and I for sticking it through all the way. Um, I'd especially like to thank my council member, uh, Daniel Drum, for hearing all the testimony that was presented today. While a lot of uh, talk has been about executive budget, I'm here to talk about two city council discretionary funded initiatives. Um, my name is Osman Ahmed. I'm a senior policy analyst at FPWA. FPWA is a anti-poverty nonprofit with a human service membership of around 160 providers all throughout the city. I'm here to talk to you all about today about Access Health NYC, um, a city council funded initiative that provides outreach services and connects low income and marginalized communities to healthcare in all five boroughs. And the reason I'm here to talk to you about that today is because of Article 6 that are coming down from Albany. And the fact that while the mayor has put, to, uh, put forward $59 million in the city budget to mitigate those cuts, um, he has not provided funding um, to mitigate cuts to discretionary funded campaigns as other folks have talked about uh, on this panel. So I'm here to ask City Council to not only restore Access Health NYC at 2.5 million in the next fiscal, fiscal year, but to also provide um, $3.4 million to mitigate Article, Article 6 cuts. On top of that, I'm also here to talk um, about the Day Labor Workforce Initiative, another City Council discretionary funded initiative which um, has been funded for the last four years. Uh, I'm here to talk about that initiative because in the past month alone, four day laborers have fallen to their deaths on construction sites in the city. Um, and as the city tries to enforce construction safety, it also needs to invest in workforce development for this community of laborers that provides a really flexible workforce for the city, but it's also on the front lines of construction safety accidents. So I'm going to stop there and thank City Council for their continued support. Thank you. Tell Jennifer that uh, we send our love. She's the I best, love. and uh, we love FW FPWA. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Human Services Council. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chairperson Drum, for having me today to testify about the human services sector. So we represent about 170 human service providers in New York. You've heard from many of them today. I think you've heard a lot of really impassioned testimony um, from CPC, from SAGE. You'll hear more. Um, from people on this panel, and really what they all have in common is that they're telling you that the nonprofit sector is under-resourced uh, in every program that the city funds that are so, 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 these programs are so instrumental to the fabric of New York, and we're not funding them appropriately. We will really want to thank the city council for your commitment to the $106 million for indirect funding and that investment. We're um, disappointed that the mayor has not made the same commitment. While there has been an expansion in dollars in, for programs uh, over this administration, it's still being, it's money being put into a broken system. We need to better invest in human services organizations, uh, and this $106 million for indirect funding is a real um, step in that, in that direction. Indirect funding is super wonky. It's not as sexy or interesting as what you hear about from the programs from providers today, but it's really essential to the operations of nonprofits. It makes sure that they can keep the lights on, literally. It means that they can pay accounting staff, invest in outcome measurement, computer systems, phones, really essential services. Why does this really matter? 80% of the largest human services organizations are 90% government funded. The largest 5% of those organizations provide almost 50% of city services, which means how the city funds them matters. So if the city is not investing its dollars appropriately, it means that those organizations are at risk of closure. 20% of New York City human services organizations are insolvent on their books, which means that they have less than three months um, cash reserve, which means any one disaster can put them under. We really appreciate that the city council acknowledges the need to invest in these services and in these organizations so that they're strong and can really de deliver quality services to New York. And we hope that the mayor will also see that and make this investment in the final budget. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Maria Lizardo. I am the executive director of a settlement house called NIMIC. We serve 14,000 community members that reside in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, and we do this through the provision of legal services, social services, weatherization assistance, education and career services, and legal. And I'm here today with a simple ask. Although as an organization, we ha definitely have different um, asks before the council, My I'm here today on behalf of the rest of the human services sector to ask for the $106 million to go into indirect costs. 
Thank you for putting it in as a council, and the mayor saw it fit to cut it. But unless we have this investment in the human services sector, we will be forced to close our doors. Many of the, we have contracts that for the last 10 years have remained flat. We have contracts that are severely underfunded. We get paid 80 cents on the dollar. And we have contracts that are registered extremely late, causing us not to be able to pay our staff, to cover insurance costs, and to keep the lights on. NEMIC alone has been threatened with eviction several times. It is unrealistic for us to continue as a sector to serve New York's most vulnerable under these conditions. NIMIC, along with many other organizations, will be forced to take a really good look at, our, at our, our contracts and decide whether or not we will continue to do business with the city. And this will hurt our communities. We refuse to be one of the nonprofits that closes its doors or merges with another organization because the city refuses to pay for our services and pay for it in full. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nora Moran. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at United Neighborhood Houses. We're New York City's Federation of 42 Settlement Houses. Um, you have my written testimony. It covers a whole host of issues. I'm just going to emphasize a few. The first uh, is the ongoing issues with the DOE's Birth to Five RFP and the urgent need for salary parity for the early childhood education workforce in this year's budget. Um, our teachers can't wait another year. We're grateful for the council's support on this issue as we continue to move this forward. Uh, the second is senior meals. We hear all the time from settlement houses about the challenges uh, maintaining current levels in, in senior center meals and home delivered meal programs. Um, and we also know that New York City spends 20% uh, below the national average uh, for its congregate and home delivered meal programs. Um, so we're calling on the city uh, to invest $20 million in congregate meals and $15 million in home delivered meals um, so that these services can continue and, and frankly so that seniors can continue to eat. Um, third, uh, just about NYCHA community spaces and community centers. Many settlement houses and other nonprofits are running uh, programs in NYCHA community spaces. Um, the needs, uh, uh, the capital needs in these spaces are often great. Um, things like HVAC repairs, uh, security needs, lighting, painting, all that sort of stuff. Um, there was some funding in the mayor's executive budget uh, for NYCHA community spaces, but we know it's not enough. And we're hoping that the city council can uh, invest $5 million in a citywide initiative that would address data day repairs in nature community spaces. Um, and finally, uh, echoing uh, the calls of my colleagues on this panel uh, for the need to invest in indirect costs for the nonprofit sector. Um, relief is sorely needed. We're grateful for the council to, uh, for putting in that $106 million for indirect, um, and we, we hope the mayor steps up and does the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for allowing me to testify today. My name is Laura Mishu. I'm the Executive Director of the Supportive Housing Network of New York. I want to thank the Speaker and the Chairman and all of the Council members for their continued support of Supportive Housing, the answer to chronic homelessness. Um, I'm here today to focus on two issues. One is the urgent need for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to receive an additional $20 million for the Supportive Housing Scattered Site Program. We currently have 1,800 vulnerable households who are at risk of losing their homes and returning to homelessness, which would cost the city $70 million. Um, I presented similar testimony before. We were so grateful for the council and their budget response adding the 20 million, and unfortunately it was not reflected in the executive budget. Um, we are also here to echo the call of my colleagues and what, much of what you've heard today for the addition of the 106 million to fill the gap between the provider's indirect costs and the contract reimbursement rate. Just quickly regarding the 20 million, we currently are focusing on new supportive housing, but it's imperative that we not abandon the existing housing stock. We have 14,000 formerly homeless individuals and families residing in scattered site housing programs. These contracts have been stagnant for a number of years with rates between 11,000 and 16,000 for both services and rental. And the fair market rate right now for a studio apartment is over 18,000. So you can see the math does not work. In contrast, a new program is funded at $26,000 per unit. The human services sector is in a crisis and the providers of scattered site housing are no exception. 
the board of directors are really questioning why these con contracts continue to be renewed. And we currently have 400 units that are threatened with non-renewal because really the private fundraising and the borrowing from Peter to pay Paul to keep the lights on is no longer working. So the addition of this 20 million is crucial to stem this tide. I also wanna just echo that we are at a crisis as a sector would appreciate that we appreciate the council's support on the 106 million. As we know, we're paying 80 cents on the dollar on services and nonprofits are floating the city hundreds of millions of dollars to care for New Yorkers. It's an untenable situation and one that the private sector would never tolerate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chairperson Drum, members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Faith Bayham. I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UGA Federation of New York. On behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the fiscal 20 budget. Uh, to echo my colleagues on this panel, we, we greatly appreciate the support the council has shown the human services sector in the past. Um, specifically, we are grateful for the 106 million the council included in their preliminary budget response to fill the gap between providers' indirect costs and contract reimbursement rates from the city. We urge the administration to include that 106 million in the adopted budget to support the nonprofit human services sector. Um, we also appreciate the support the council has shown the early childhood. Uh, education workforce and community-based organizations. I'm not gonna restate the issues that you've been hearing all afternoon with the uh, issues for the birth to five and early head, early head Start, Head Start RFPs. I am going to say that despite this due date rapidly approaching for the RF, RFPs, um, U, UJA stands with our colleagues in urging the DOE to plead, please address these issues or withdraw the RFPs. Uh, we thank Council Member Rose and count countless other council members for their tireless efforts for restoring the funding for Sonic summer programs for middle school students. We ask the administration to include $20.35 million for Sonic summer programs for 34,000 middle school students in fiscal year 20. Uh, we applaud the leadership of the City Council and its continued investment in New York City's Holocaust survivors. New York City is home to roughly 45,000 Holocaust survivors, almost half of the total population of survivors living in the United States. Approximately 40% of Holocaust survivors live at or below 150% of the national poverty line. We request that the City Council increase funding for the Holocaust Survivor Initiative and invest $4 million in fiscal year 20. Um, and also one last plug is that we urge the Council to work with the administration to invest an additional 20 million for congregate meals and 15 million for home de de delivered meals to account for unfunded costs of running senior center kitchens and the increased need among this population. Thank you. Tell Eric that I said hello. Uh, UJA awesome. is so fantastic and the, uh, the organizations that are represented here today and the organizations that you represent as part of the federations or the networks that you represent are so incredibly crucial for the future of New York City. You really, the groups that are here today, take care of the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, the most dispossessed, the folks that have been left behind. And every year your advocacy coming here and asking for the city to do more, both just do the right thing for the groups that are um, uh, providing these services, but also the direct services that you provide to the most vulnerable New Yorkers is so unbelievably important. And it really, of course, aligns with my values, the values of the council members that are up here today. And I just really want to say thank you on behalf of the city of New York for the work that you do day in and day out in providing services and care for the people who need it most. So thank you all very, very much for being here today. Thank you. Okay, I want to call up next uh, Lauren Shapiro and Emma uh, Ketteringham from Brooklyn Defender Services and Bronx Defender Services. Cristobal Gutierrez from Make the Road New York. Shane Correa from the Center for Court Innovation. Julia Davis from the Children's Defense Fund. Sophia Chowdhury from the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. There may not be enough chairs, so just pull up some of the smaller chairs if there aren't enough chairs for the panel we call up. Alexandra Zeitz Moskin from the NYC Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Saswati uh, Sarkov or Sarkar from the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. And Michaela Bobrow from the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault.
Great, so uh, let's, let's start on this side and, and work our way down. You may get, begin, just make sure that the mic is close to your mouth and that the red light is on. It's on. Okay. Um, good afternoon, thank you so much for having us. My name is Lauren Shapiro. I'm the director of the Family Defense Practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. And first I wanna just thank you for the support that the City Council has given to our programs. Um, in particular, I just want to mention our NIFA program, which allows us to do really crucial, amazing work on behalf of, um, uh, on behalf of detained immigrants facing deportation. Um, today I wanted to specifically talk about a new and innovative program that four family defender offices are proposing, which is the Right to Family Advocacy Initiative. And there's two components to the program. The first is uh, assisting parents who have child welfare involvement when they're uh, being investigated by ACS before they have a court case. And the second component is assisting parents who have indicated cases on the state central registry um, with trying to get their names cleared so that they can um, get employment. So first I wanted to talk about the pre-petition advocacy, which is a really, really important program for low-income parents who have child welfare involvement. Um, the family defense offices are seeking funding for social workers and parent advocates to help parents who are being investigated by ACS um, before a court case is filed. We're currently doing this work with, um, on a very, very small scale, but we believe that with additional funding um, that we can really make a difference in terms of reducing the number of children that are separated from their families unnecessarily. And I should mention that the four offices are Brooklyn Defenders, Bronx Defenders, Emma Ketteringham from Bronx Defenders is with me, and also the Center for Family Representation and the Neighborhood Defender Services. Um, so we, our offices are currently funded by the city to represent parents the first day that they appear in court, but that often happens oops, months after an ACS investigation has started. Um, we also find that parents aren't told about the for, first court date, um, and so they, by the time, and orders are entered at that time, so by the time they come to court, um, their investigation may have been going on for months without the advice of an attorney. So um, I know I'm running out of time, but I just quickly wanted to mention that we hear that the number of children in foster care has gone down to 8,000 children, but there are still so many children who are entering foster care unnecessarily. Many of the children are entering for very short periods of time, so while the population looks like it's going down, kids are coming in and out of care, and those short-term family separations um, cause unnecessary trauma to children and their families, and this trauma can affect families for years. Um, thank you. We, thank you so much. We have the proposal, and I really appreciate it, and I want to tell you that. I waited all this time for <laughs> I know. It's okay. I really appreciate the work you guys do, and I was so moved to uh, be with uh, Sarah Ashiro um, for through NIFA at on Varick Street to yeah. watch the the work that the amazing and they were all young women, the attorneys who were representing detainees. Uh, just incredible, incredible work. So we believe in the work you do. Uh, we have the proposal. We will look at it. Our staff will be in touch. I'm really grateful that you're here, um, and we're happy to hear from um, your co-panelists from the Bronx Defenders who can maybe fill in some of the gaps. Thank you. My name is Emma Ketteringham, and I'm the managing director of the Family Defense Practice at the Bronx Defenders, and I'll try to pick up where Lauren left off. Um, you know, we all watched with horror as children were separated from their parents on the border. We watched as Jasmine Healy's young son was taken from her arms. We know that forced, abrupt family separation causes children short-term distress and long-term emotional harm. And we know that when it happens, as a result of a child welfare investigation, no matter the intent or reason, it is the same harm. This funding will ensure that those traumatic family separations that occur in the poorest neighborhoods of our city, almost entirely to families of color, do not needlessly occur when they can be avoided. Many child removals that occur during an investigation and before a judge has reviewed that decision are in fact avoidable. 
They wouldn't occur if parents had access to attorneys and advocates to guide them through the stressful and terrifying process of an investigation. Right now, parents don't receive an attorney until they appear in court after the investigation, often after their children have already been removed and after um, a decision to even file a case has been made. This initiative would give parents access to the advice and counsel that they need during the investigation to prevent those traumatic separations. Because even though these removals are often reversed once the family is brought into court and a, and a lawyer assigned, the family's already broken. The harm has already been done and the children are deeply wounded. And the parents are often then distrustful of the agency that is there to help. With this initiative, parents will get access to the advice of an attorney, advice that any parent of means would be able to access and would access if they were faced with the awful prospect of their child being taken from them. Just quickly, in fiscal year 2018, we funded a pilot to provide the same early representation we seek now to have funded. The results are astounding. We, we, rep, we basically advised 378 parents of those, only 16 of those cases of those families were separated. Wow! Only 16. Um, and in addition, I, I hope the City Council is aware that the Commission on Parent Representation, which studied the quality of parent representation in the State of New York and made recommendations, has this provision of attorneys during the child welfare investigation as its top recommendation. How, how much do you, if the two million dollars that are being sought for this new initiative, how many families do you think would be served with that two million dollars? Hundreds and hundreds. So, but the 360 something that's, you mentioned. That's that, what we were able to do with a small grant. With we how much no, money? We have no funding to do that now. But how much money was able to serve those 360 Oh, Something it was family. about a quarter of what we're asking, but we're also asking for this initiative to cover SCR representation, which we haven't really been able to address. Those why, why don't you quickly address that? So the second part of the initiative address asks for um, funding to represent parents during the name clearing hearings before the state central registry. Anytime a parent is investigated by ACS, there is, there, there's an investigation and a determination, whether that investigation is founded or unfounded. Many parents, who have a founded investigation for child maltreatment against them don't ever even have a case filed against them in court. That means they never meet a lawyer who can advise them through this process. And they remain on that state, because the, the inve investigation is founded, they remain on the state central registry for up to 28 years, limiting them from many, many types of employment that would otherwise be available to them in New York City. So they're unable to support their families. Um, and they don't have access to attorneys to assist them and represent them in these hearings to have their names removed. So this initiative would seek to provide parents with that much needed service as well. And, and as you know, I mean, it is mostly families of color, mm -hmm. parents of color who are restricted in this way by having their names on the registry. Laura, was, Laura, was there, Lauren, was there anything else that you wanted to say on this? Oh, just to add to that in terms of the numbers, there are 21,000 indicated cases just in New York City alone. And as Emma mentioned, those come from uh, most of the investigations that ACS does are from the community districts that are all black and Latino, like 96%. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both for being here. Good afternoon, my name is Cristobal Gutierrez and I'm a staff attorney at Make the Road New York. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and Chair Chairperson Council Member Drum uh, and the members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Make the Road New York and our 23,000 members. We would like to th thank you for supporting important increases in funding for immigrant services over the past two years of unprecedented federal attacks on the immigrant community. That said, current funding levels still comes nowhere close to the meeting demand for services and organizations like ours have to turn people away every day. First, we ask that the City Council renew its commitment to the low-wage workers by ensuring 2.5 million low-wage worker initiative awarded last year in this year's budget. We deeply appreciate this funding, which has allowed Make the Road and many other groups to represent hundreds of workers on wage theft and discrimination claims. 
This initiative is just getting started and without renewal, we will be forced to reduce our low wage worker legal services and lay off higher staff with its, fun with its funding last, last year. Second, we ask that the city council allocate half a million for the immigrant protection services program. 5.3 million for the jobs to build on program and 2.3 million for the worker service centers program. These programs will enable Make the Road to run health training programs to connect people to jobs in healthcare and have resulted in tens of, of thousands of New Yorkers gaining meaningful family sustaining employment. Third, we request that the city council maintain the funding for ending the epidemic at 7 million increase its allocation for access health initiative to 2.5 and maintain 1.5 allocation to the immigrant health initiative. Fourth and finally, two seconds, um, 30. Uh, four, fourth and finally, we ask that the city council restore the baseline of 12 million in adult literacy funding so that thousands of immigrants can continue to learn English and access economic opportunity. Without the restoration of this funding, 8,500 adults, students will lose classes this year. Thank you again for your time and your ongoing leadership. We agree with you on all that. Shane. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Shane Karaya. I'm the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Center for Court Innovation. At CCI, our mission is to create a more effective and humane justice system. And to that, we would like to thank the Council for their support over the past year of our bail alternatives for young people in Brooklyn, as well as supporting our core continuation ask. It's that continuation ask that funds programs such as the, uh, the Youth Justice Board, of which I was a member of 15 years ago as a truant high schooler with two siblings convicted of murder. It's thanks to this program that I have a different relationship with the justice system that made me through law school and here today asking for continued support so that other youth of New York City can change their relationship with the justice system. I additionally would like to thank Council for allowing us to be a part of fixing the system by investing in the citywide expansion of Project Reset, which permits individuals who received offline arrests to avoid the justice system entirely including the collateral consequences in immigration and credit and employment that come with prosecution. Uh, it additionally is a program that's been founded by researchers to successfully uh, decrease the amount of time that people spend in the justice system and increase the amount of time that they spend outside of police contact between incidents. Finally, though, with these investments, I would like to bring to Council's attention the application packets that we have at the bottom of our testimony requesting additional investments in mental health, not just in the criminal justice system, but also in the family uh, support systems in family court. Additionally, we have a pending proposal in Far Rockaway that due to the geography of Queens makes it so that court-mandated program can require a two-hour trip between the neighborhood that the defendants live in and the court that their jurisdiction requires them to report to. Thank you so much for your time, Council, in the work that we've been able to do together and hopefully in the work that we'll be able to do together in the future. Thank you, Shane. We love uh, CCI and uh, we're grateful for the work and partnership that we have in your story is incredibly inspirational and moving and I'm really grateful that you're here today. Good afternoon, I'm Julia Davis with the Children's Defense Fund. Um, thank you so much, Chair, Council Members, uh, for this opportunity. I want to focus on four things and I'll be very quick about it. We work in healthcare, in juvenile justice, in child welfare, and in education justice. There's an issue that has not come out today that I want to raise for you all, which is that the city has been focused on a new lead-free New York City roadmap. This is an incredibly important endeavor. Lead poisoning is a completely preventable and irreversible problem for children and families, and yet the preliminary budget, as identified it by the Independent Budget Office, notes a $108 million gap in actually the funds required to implement that roadmap. So that's the first part of the testimony that I would love to draw your attention to. The second is, Council Member Drum, thank you so much for your um, dialogue yesterday with ACS around the youth justice work they're doing and raise the age. We completely support the budget uh, that's been set forth for ACS, but agree with you that there needs to be more oversight and opportunities for data and information to watch as the law is implemented, especially around the young people that are in ACS's custody. I want to also talk about a couple of child welfare issues that you've heard about today. 
The first is that school communities are a critical source of stability and help for children in the foster care system. It is absolutely essential that transportation not become the motivation for moving children out of their home schools. And so we urge the city council to fund this transportation and Department of Education coordinating um, office to support children who are in foster care to ensure that they receive busing and to ensure that their care gets the right attention at the Department of Education, which all of these recommendations came out of the task force um, that brought together ACS and DOE and others that are engaging in um, ACS reform. My final request is related to something that you, council Member Drum have great leadership around, which is around restorative justice, and that's that we include and baseline 30 million for whole school restorative practices in 100 of the highest need schools in our city. Thank you very much for your leadership and for your engagement today. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for having us. My name is Alex Seitz Moskin, and I'm the Director of Development and Communications at the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. And I'm here on behalf of the Sexual Assault Initiative, which is a group comprised of five organizations, including ours, uh, the Kingsbridge Heights Community Center, Mount Sinai Savvy Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Program, the Crime Victims Treatment Center, and the newly added North Brooklyn Coalition Against Family Violence. Last year, we added the North Brooklyn Coalition in order to provide much needed rape crisis services throughout Brooklyn which as the largest borough has only two certified rape crisis response programs. Uh, we have a long-term goal, which is laid out in my written testimony, of rectifying this disparity to bring services throughout Brooklyn. Um, and you can read more about that throughout that proposal. So we're asking that you maintain our current level of funding in the next fiscal year. Uh, as you well know, in recent years, the rates of sexual assault in New York City have increased dramatically. Um, and we have experienced a six-year-long upward trend um, with a total of 1,795 rapes reported to NYPD in 2018, which is a 22.4% increase from the previous year. Last year, the Sexual Assault Initiative served over 3,530 survivors of sexual assault and conducted over 15,557 free training and counseling sessions and the statistics per group are detailed in the written testimony. Uh, in f the upcoming fiscal year, we are committed to increasing rape crisis services and will continue to support the North Brooklyn Coalition as well as increase our support to multiple hospitals throughout Brooklyn. Uh, and we want to basically just thank the City Council for and Speaker Johnson, Chairman Drum, and the committee for their time and support. We look forward to continuing to work together. I don't think there should be, uh, of course, I want everyone to speak, but I don't think there should be any fear on uh, your current funding is safe, and, and uh, we are grateful for the work that you all do uh, through the Alliance and the different provider organizations, but I think it, we still want to hear about the work that you've done throughout the year and the state of current affairs and what we can be doing to further help survivors and victims. Um, so, but yes, you, you guys are going to be fine with that $1.6 <laughs> million. Dollars. Go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Michaela Bobro, and I am the Senior Program Coordinator at the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Um, the New York City Council funding supports the Alliance's Sexual Assault Forensic Examiner Training Institu Institute, Safety, the largest New York State Department of Health certified training program for emergency department and me medical professionals in New York State. Safety is the only training program in New York City that is open to all licensed doctors, registered nurses, nurse practitioners, practitioners, um, and physician assistants. By providing high-quality trauma-focused training for medical prof professionals and sexual assault forensic examiners, it seeks to ensure best practices for victims um, and survivors post-assault. As of Ch January 2019, the Alliance is now qualified to offer certification through the International Association of Forensic Nurses, IAFN. Um, this allows healthcare providers who have taken our course to sit for the IAFN exam uh, IFN SANE A exam, which certifies them to practice as SAFEs internationally. Safety also trains staff of various organizations aiming to improve their services to survivors of sexual assault. Um, in fiscal year 2018, we trained over 900 health and human service professionals thanks to City Council's support. Um, and thus far in uh, this fiscal year, we have trained over 580 health and human service professionals. 
Um, we doubled our most labor intensive course, the SAFE 40 hour training from two to four courses annually um, with the increase in city council funding. We also redirected staff time and energy to some new programming that we were able to undertake with the increased city council funding. Since our last report in March, we have completed four additional trainings and I have our final SAFE 40 hour course scheduled for June. With the trainings we have completed and scheduled, we have no doubt that we will exceed the number of health and human service professionals trained in fiscal year 18 for this fiscal year, and will have offered this year's trainees more robust and substantial training than in uh, years past, thanks to City Council. Um, additionally, we are currently in the process of expanding our SAFE program to include a pediatric component, um, which we are really excited about and hoping to get started in the fall of uh, this, this coming fall. Um, in addition, the Alliance was able to undertake a public engagement campaign in coordination with FDNY, TLC, and other public and private partners, um, in addition to our social media and optimized digital platforms in order to raise awareness of where survivors can receive optimal care at safe designated hospitals. Um, we want to thank City Council so much for all of your support. Um, so thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, um, Chair Drum, Speaker Johnson, and uh, members of the Council. I'm Shashiti, I'm the Director of Finance and Program Administration at New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. I'm here to testify um, for our funding request of $100,000, which is a modest increase from last year to support our youth program um, that specifically works with communities of color, immigrant youth, um, gender non-conforming, and LGBTQI youth. Um, across New York City. Um, you, you have our um, written testimony as well as some sample work from the youth who have participated in this program. I'm here to emphasize some of the urgent needs that we are seeing around the city uh, expressed by youth and the communities they come from. So um, past year, with your support from uh, the City Council, we have been able to reach eight different communities, including Muslim-identified communities, communities of youth whose mothers and parents have been incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, as well as young people from low socioeconomic and non-traditional housing. These are really critical communities that are usually left out from most of the prevention efforts. And what we have seen over the past year of doing this work and having spoken with many, many youth who have accessed our services, that young people that are either ready to date or dating are out in the community, have no resources. Many of them who are new immigrants are reaching out to pornography to understand what consent is, what healthy relationships sh should look like, turning to their peers who know as little as they are, and that is dangerous. So in our program and through your support, we have been able to push so much of that conversation and we thank you for all the support you've provided us and requesting this additional increase. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sophia Chowdhury, and I am a youth educator and a former Project DOP participant um, at the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. I joined the Project DOT um, as a youth leader participating in this semester-long project with a group of South Asian young men and women. Together, my peers and I learned about healthy relationships, the importance of consent, and how to be an active bystander. Now I am a youth educator for Project DOT, where I co-facilitate a group of 16 young Muslim women. I remember when I first joined Project DOT as a senior in high school, I felt very uncomfortable. I did not think that Muslim women should be talking about healthy relationships, sexual violence, or even consent. These were not conversations I ever had with my parents or with my peers. I was hesitant to even tell my parents about what I was doing in this project and the important discussions that we were having. Project DOT broke down that stigma around sex and sexual violence. It emphasized how important consent is in teen dating and did not shy away from any difficult conversations. Being a part of Project DOT was about unlearning actions and toxic ways of thinking that I had begun to normalize. Working now with this group of young Muslim women made me realize how much Muslim women are left out of this conversation about sexual violence and relationship abuse, yet they are desperate for their voices to be heard. Preconceived stereotypes and biases have stopped them from speaking up once they are given, but once they are given a safe space, these young women have shown me that they too want to be part of this discussion and be part of the movement that ends sexual violence. 
While there are a vast number of resources and programs for the youth, immigrant and minority communities are still being left out. We need real people with real experiences that we can relate to. The most effective way to influence the youth is to be relatable and to create a comfortable environment. Project, youth, Project DOT creates a space where youth can have their voices be heard. Our curriculum is dense, educational, and engaging, while still having enough room to change the conversation to relate to each respective community. The youth from underserved communities deserve the support of the City Council and the Committee of Youth Services. Their voices are crucial as they are leaders that can help to end sexual violence in our city. We hope that you will consider allocating the requesting funding. Thank you. Sophia, thank you for being here today. It's so uh, wonderful to have you here and to have you uh, particularly shed light on, of course, issues that uh, focus on Muslim women in New York City. It's so important that we hear from all voices in our great city. So I am super grateful uh, that you all are here, and I want to thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. And if you have written testimony, uh, please submit it if you didn't already. Um, so we have, I think, 18 more speakers uh, today, and I'll call it the next panel. I unfortunately cannot stay, and I apologize for that. I tried to be here for the entire uh, length of the hearing, but uh, I review all the testimony. Uh, Danny and I speak multiple times a day, uh, so do not feel like just because I may not be here for your testimony, I'm not going to look at your testimony. I know, I'm so sorry, um, but there's an event that I can't get out of. Um, so I'm going to call up the next panel, Rachel Sabella, who I uh, thank the world of, uh, from uh, No Kid Hungry NY. Uh, Jerome from City Harvest, Liz from Community Food Advocates, Lunch for Learning, Nicola Daru from the Food Bank for New York City, Celia Green, Diane Drozek, and that is the next panel. Is everyone here that I called? Oh, great. They're coming down. Take your time. Don't rush. <laughs> Take your time. Don't trip. Don't rush. You want to start? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I just want to say before this, before, before, I, before I depart and while the other folks are coming down, before I depart and, and as this very important uh, panel is about to testify, I, of course, am incredibly, incredibly proud of the advocacy and work the council did with all of you last year on significantly increasing the EFAP program to serve and help uh, more hungry New Yorkers in a variety of ways. Your partnership, all of you, has been incredibly crucial in the work we've done in providing uh, more food for children in our school system, whether it be breakfast or lunch. And so I am uh, extraordinarily grateful for your advocacy and hard work. We know that there is a proposed cut on the table for breakfast in the class Classrooms. That is not something that the council supports in any way whatsoever. We are fighting uh, that in a very, very big way, and we want to continue to build on the success and support that we've had uh, in the past with all of you. So I, I just want to thank you for that. Food insecurity, uh, as you all know better than anyone else, is a major, major problem in our city. It's one that we at the council are focused on tremendously. I'm really proud that the, I think the busiest pantry and kitchen on the east coast of the United States is in my district, Holy Apostles Church, and I work with them very regularly and hear about the issues that are endemic about the sector that serves people throughout the city who have food insecurity. So I have to go, but as you can tell, I am pretty well versed on these issues, and I look forward to reviewing the testimony, uh, hearing from uh, what you had to say today, working with Chair Drum and the other colleagues that are here on the issues that are important. To the other panelists uh, that are here that I haven't been able to hear from today, I'm going to review all the testimony, as I said, work with the staff, talk to the staff, talk to Chair Drum. So just because I didn't hear you directly doesn't mean we're not paying attention, and I want to really thank you for being here today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I see folks from the Community Land Trust Initiative who are here. I know opportunities for a better tomorrow are here. I know folks from the different job programs and workforce training programs are here that haven't had a chance to testify. There are positional arts and culture folks that are here today that haven't testified yet. All of you, I know you're here. I'm grateful you're here. I look forward to reviewing your testimony. Don't have your feelings be hurt because I have to leave, and I want to thank you very much and turn the meeting back over to Chair Drum. Thank you very much. Okay.
Did you want to start right away? Your mic. Before he leaves, if I call your office, will you speak to me personally on the phone? It depends what the issue's about, but I'm, I'm well, happy to... I'm I happy thought to this was about something else. This is about DOT. You need to assign monies for inspectors to inspect each borough for the crosswalks. I was crossing, had two broken feet from a pothole, I'm told by DOT. Is that me? No. Oh, I'll hang up. Okay. I, I'm crossing the street, pothole, two broken feet, surgery, everything. According to DOT being, it wasn't reported, they're not liable. They didn't even pay for my medical expenses. The point is, as far as DOT and inspecting the roads, they don't inspect until after a citizen reports it, and they're not liable until 311 gets a call. Okay? I didn't know I was. I didn't know I worked for DOT. You should have inspectors every borough. Let's say two. Just drive around and look. It'll decrease the number of people getting hurt. One year I was biking, had a broken arm, pothole. Someone cut me off. Now, a few years ago, two broken feet. They had to take a piece of my hip and remake it. Forget it with that, because I couldn't walk a bike like I did every day for the diabetes. From one year to the next, my eye went bad and woke up practically blind in one eye. And I have to hear from people like DOT, well, that's not our fault. It was no 311 notification. I found out two months before there was a permit to do work in that area. Well, that's a permit. That's not a notification to 311. The point is, have inspectors do things and prevent people from getting hurt. They go, I called the DOT commissioner. Why don't they have it? Well, we can't afford that. We can't afford inspectors to do that. They're going to wait until someone's hurt. I called maintenance. They do not have inspections until someone gets hurt or a 311 call. They may see it immediately, but why wait? Have inspectors before get someone gets hurt. And it won't cost to pay for two people in each borough. They can give the mayor's wife all that money. She could pay, they could pay for inspectors to inspect it to make sure it's safe. There's also a law of accessibility, ADA law of accessibility. According to that, crosswalks are supposed to be accessible for the disabled. How can you have that law saying you are responsible and the notification law saying you're not responsible until a citizen reports it? I'm confused. I've been asking my city councilman what law overrides it. They refuse to talk to me. So if you have a litigation in court, you're not allowed to call the city up and even ask a question. I don't understand that one. But my point, I'm asking you for each borough, two inspectors, either one DOT and one DEP, in a car at the main thoroughfares where the roads are worn out quicker. It doesn't have to be every single street. But just drive in a car and make a notification. Listen, maybe this is a little bad. There's a lot of people walking down here. I was on 34th and Diane, Broadway. Diane, we have to, I, I have to go. But oh, I, 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 oh, well, thank you for I listening did, did, to me. I didn't want to walk out on you. Given I, I know. Well, I got to go. Well, I'm a diabetic. Thank you for letting me let, go. I didn't know I'd be this long, and I take a Cesaride. And if I miss it, it'll be another three hours. Okay, well, thank you for coming. I'm really <laughs> sorry that that happened to you. I'm glad you stuck but around to testify. Is, let, can I finish? I'm oh, sorry. A habit. So I'm really sorry that you had to go through that horrendous experience. I'm grateful that you came to testify today. I don't know enough about the issue. I say that candidly and I transparently. And so if you could submit, you don't have testimony, I see. If you could submit testimony, if you could write something out about what you said today and other information and give it to the staff here, we're happy to look at it. No. Thank you for coming. I have to run. I apologize. No problem. And as I, I have said, to go. I'm sorry. So no one else gets hurt. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Rachel. Sorry. No, thank you. My, I, get, I talk a lot. <laughs> I'm disabled, so the law, I want to know which law overrides the other. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up if you get that into the speaker. Good evening. My name is Rachel Sabella, and I'm the director of No Kid Hungry New York. I want to thank you, Chair Drum, for being here all day. We know how long these hearings are. I want to thank the finance staff who have worked really hard on this, and I don't know if they always get the appreciation from the advocates, so thanks to them as well. Um, no Kid 
No Kid Hungry New York is a campaign of Share Our Strength. We're a national organization focused on ending childhood hunger, and I have the honor and privilege of leading that work in New York. It saddens me to be here today. We have worked together for a long time on the issue of hunger. We've worked together on universal school meals, on funding for food pantries, and implementing breakfast in the classroom. And unfortunately, this executive budget proposal takes a step back in that battle. There's a $6 million cut proposed to breakfast in the classroom. We are asking the council to fight to have the administration restore this funding, not only put the money back in, but to continue expansion of this critical program. Um, since the the program rolled out in 2015, more than 79,000 additional children are eating breakfast in all five boroughs. We know, you especially know as a former teacher, when kids have that nutrition they need, they're able to have more success. They learn, they pay attention. To take this program away, to put it back in the cafeteria where there's stigma, where you have to arrive on time, is going to have less kids eating and less families have access to this program. Um, my last two quick points on this is number one we've heard this administration speak so much about equity in education breakfast in the classroom actually leads to equity because every child is starting the day the same way taking this away takes away from that equity principle the other thing I want to make sure I say is because I know it's a priority of this council we know the challenges immigrant families are facing right now we know the threats coming from the federal level I testified in this room about the potential of the public charge rule if those changes are to happen school meals are one of the only supports that people will be able to rely on so what we should do is be expanding those programs right now not um, weakening them so thank you we know we have faith we know you believe in this and thank you for the opportunity today okay and you know it's a priority for us yeah why don't we go to this woman over here and then we'll go down the row if you don't mind thank you um, thank you for um, thank you to mr. drum to council member drum and to um, council member Johnson for having this hearing and my name is Celia Green I am the co-chair for the Chancellor's Parent Advisory Council, as well as the co-chair for the Citywide Council on High Schools. And I'm here to talk about putting $175 million into, having the Board of Ed put $175 million into school foods for the cafeteria redesigns. The, um, we have found that with high schools especially, it has made a big difference in school foods. 31% um, more kids are actually eating food in the places that have had the cafeteria, in the schools that have managed to have this cafeteria redesign. Um, we're hoping that 175 million will do a large, sizable portion of high schools um, that request it. Um, and just having kids have that food, we've already taken away the stigma because food is free, you know, for lunch. But I'm hoping that having more kids be able to have food. Because there are a lot of kids, there's still a lot of housing insufficiency, and that comes with food insufficiency. So I'm hoping that more kids will be able to eat. Um, and when you're fed and when you have fuel, you'll do better in school. And I think outcomes and graduation rates directly are affected by whether or not children have services and food and the support they need. So I'm asking that 175 million be in the budget for school for feeding our kids. And that wasn't over one year, that was over a number of years, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I've actually seen the uh, program work because we have a, a, a junior high school in my district where they've done it, you know, um, a revision to the cafeteria and um, the, the kids seem to really enjoy it. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's go to this young man over here. Uh, good, good evening, um, Chairman Drum and distinguished members of the City Council. I want to thank you for holding this hearing today. My name is Drone Nathaniel. I'm the Senior Program Manager at City Harvest. And City Harvest stands here today with a coalition of anti-hunger organizations that are fighting to protect uh, breakfast in the classroom. Uh, City Harvest, we rescue and distribute some 61 million pounds of food to emergency food programs. Uh, many of those service young children. Some. 350,000 children who don't know how or where they're gonna get their next meal. And what uh, the city should be able to guarantee is that the children can rely on having a healthy meal at school. 
Uh, Breakfast in the Classroom has been an effective program in being able to provide that. Uh, echoing what Rachel said, that it's been effective in the past five years in increasing uh, uh, breakfast consumption by 80, some 80,000 more youth that are eating breakfast in the classroom. And that's important for them to be able to focus in school. It's also important logistically if you're coming from far Rockaway to go to a school in Long Island City, like where we treat, uh, teach nutrition education, that you don't have to wake up 3 a.m. Uh, to beat the opening bell and be able to have breakfast, or you don't have to sacrifice having breakfast uh, in order to make it to school on time. Um, so just from the humane side of it, it's very important to protect uh, breakfast in the classroom. Now also from the financial side, uh, the city is saying that they're saving money, uh, so $24 million over four years, but really that's also sacrificing uh, federal reimbursements, uh, $44 million of federal reimbursements that they would be able to access by implementing the program. So not even just from a humane component, but also uh, from the economics, it really wouldn't make sense uh, to make cuts to this program. And also considering the timing as the federal government is finally going to uh, make a, a, a real effort to pass a child nutrition reauthorization after some uh, four or five years of being overdue, uh, it's important for the city to set an example by strengthening these effective programs and focus on expanding it as opposed to cutting it uh, entirely unprovoked by the federal government. Thank you. I mean, to be honest with you, I've questioned the chancellor on this, and um, I don't really understand his response. And his response was that, um, you know, uh, they're saving the money, the six million, by, um, you know, not having as many people to clean up and stuff like that. Well, I don't really get it because those people are still going to have to be there in that school to clean up. I think it really comes down to um, either teachers and/or principals who just don't want to do it for whatever reason. They don't want to do it, but the benefits outweigh the negative stuff that they're talking about. So the council stands behind um, the advocates on this. It's great to hear you say that, thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Drum and members of the New York City Council. My name is Mika DeRue and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at Food Bank for New York City. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify here today. Uh, Food Bank has submitted extensive written testimony, so I'm just gonna cover a handful of highlights here. Uh, I'd like to briefly say thank you to the Council and the Speaker for fighting to baseline food funding for New York City's food pantries and soup kitchens through the Emergency Food Assistance Program, or EFAP. Also, on behalf of the 1.4 million hungry New Yorkers that our network of food pantries and soup kitchens serves, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the initiative investments that the Council has made to support capacity development within the emergency food network, as well as other essential life-saving programs for low-income New Yorkers that combat hunger, including pantries in our schools, benefits outreach and access, and free tax assistance. We urge the Council to continue investment in these critical initiatives, which not only enable New Yorkers in need to put food on the table, but also aim to alleviate the poverty that's driven them to seek out a food pantry or a soup kitchen to begin with. Um, I'm going to echo my colleagues here. Uh, food Bank is also very disappointed in and concerned by the executive budget proposal to cut funding for breakfast in the classroom. Uh, children of families who visit the Emergency Food Network also rely on free meals in school to learn and grow. Plain and simple, kids can't focus or pay attention, much less learn and grow when they're hungry. Uh, the schools that provide breakfast in the classroom, as Rachel noted, uh, note a wealth of visible positive benefits. Increased equity, better student behavior in school culture, fewer disciplinary issues, higher test scores. We urge the City Council to reject the funding cuts and instead work with the Mayor and the Department of Education to expand this vital program. Uh, finally, uh, Food Bank will continue to stand with the Council to combat ongoing attacks to food insecurity, uh, including the recent White House proposal that would lower the poverty line, disqualifying hundreds of thousands of households across the nation for needed services, including medical and nutrition assistance. Um, above all, these ongoing federal threats just underscore the need for further advocacy and the need to shore up the crucial New York City programs that serve as the safety nets for our, needi our neediest. Thank you for your time. A yeah, quick question. You said you're still doing the tax uh, preparation? Yes. Where are you doing it? Uh, we do it across the five boroughs. I can get you particulars. Because they closed the office in Jackson Heights. Uh, I, I can look into the details. Yeah, I'd just be curious to know, because it does come up. Uh, sure. Know, I, can, I can follow up with some detailed information okay. on that Thank for you. you. You're welcome. Liz. 
Good evening. Good evening. Chair Drum, Councilwoman Chin. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify uh, here today. My name is Liz Ackles. I'm the Executive Director of Community Food Advocates, and I am here along with my colleague Celia Green from representing the Lunch for Learning campaign. Um, to, to just quick start, I think to say, of course, we strongly oppose the cut in breakfast in the classroom. Um, I think that is needless to say, but I want to be on the record saying that. And But I'm here to talk, um, to supplement um, what Celia was talking about, about the, um, the cafeteria redesign model. As you know, we love this cafeteria redesign model. It modernizes the cafeterias. It, it has a food court style serving. As Celia mentioned, in high schools with both universal and the cafeteria redesign, 31% uh, is a 31% increase in participation. And in addition, I, I just I have long testimony there, but there's a, a two pager in there that has um, some graphics. Vegetable and fruit consumption in those schools have um, multiplied by fourfold. So um, there are more kids eating, and in high schools, the 31% increase is, is pretty amazing. Um, we think this is the next big thing to build upon the, univer the foundation of universal free school lunch. $175 million in the, in the Chancellor's capital, five-year capital plan would either cover all high schools in five years or half high schools and half middle schools. And that would be quite a thing to be able to accomplish um, within that time frame. And we think that, that the, you know, more kids eating more, always means more federal dollars coming into the city and, um, and creating the cafeteria as a social hub. Thank you. And, and I, I, if I didn't thank you before for include, did I say thanking you for including it in the, the response to the preliminary budget? And we hope that you'll carry that forward. Absolutely. So 4.9 times more broccoli eaten. Yeah. <laughs> How's that, right? Make a lot of mothers happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you to this yeah. panel <laughs> for coming in and yeah, giving us Yeah, I think testimony. that those pictures say it all, yeah. don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Evelyn Ortiz. Is she here? Okay. Uh, Yessie Lehman? Or Jesse? I'm sorry. It's the way I wrote it. I apologize. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, I used to have an employee named Jesse, so. <laughs> oh, sorry, here you go. Garrett? Here you go. Hello. Shove? Oh, no? no oh, okay. Uh, Carolyn um, Iso? Yeah. Rachel Castillo? Uh, Jodessa uh, Ramir? Uh, Raymer? and Thomas Hunt. Is Thomas Hunt here? Okay. okay. Is Joel Kufferman here? Oh, okay. All right, Joel. All right. So we have Joel, we have Rachel. Right? I'm Caroline. Uh, okay. Is Rachel here? No. Okay. Sorry. Let me see. Caroline Garrett. Okay. Uh, Jesse? Did I name everybody? Okay. Why don't you start? Uh, hello. Um, is this on? All right, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having us today. We appreciate the opportunity to comment on the 2019 executive budget. Uh, my name is Garrett Shore. I'm the Policy and Communications Associate at Jobs First NYC. We're an organization whose mission is to reduce the population of out-of-school, out-of-work young adults in New York City. Um, I'm joined today by, by my colleagues Evelyn Ortiz from NIATEP and Jesse Lehman from NYCETC. And we're all here representing the Invest in Skills New York City Coalition, and a citywide coalition that understands the economic imperative of investing in a skilled workforce in New York State and New York City. We aim to make workforce development an economic priority and achieve policy change that streamlines the workforce development system through, sus through sustained and significant state and local investment. 
We appreciate this opportunity once again, and we are here to call and thank you for your assistance in calling for an investment in bridge programming, which is hybrid educational programming with a career focus that will help empower New Yorkers to access bridges to better jobs. Um, so, New York City's economy is growing with a 3.0% GCP growth in the first quarter of 2019. It's making our neighborhoods more expensive and our labor market more competitive. Unfortunately, we don't have equity of access to that growth. There are 1.5 million New York City homes making less than the federal poverty level and less than the basic cost of living for the state, at a time when our city's unemployment rate is near a record low of 4.2%. The economic security of our city is threatened when there are millions of struggling, unsustainably employed people. It's time that we build bridges to better jobs for all New Yorkers. And if we want to make our economy accessible and empower New Yorkers to enter better jobs, we need to provide training programs that are responsive to the job market. A high school diploma is frequently not enough to access sustainable employment anymore, and that trend isn't slowing down. The Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce, um, sorry has predicted that 65% of all jobs by 2020 will require some form of post-secondary degree or credential. Conversely, 43% of New Yorkers either have less than a high school equivalency or low levels of literacy and numeracy. 2.5 million New Yorkers have basic skills needs that prevent them from accessing good paying jobs. Therefore, we need the city to, to make its investment of $70 million into bridge program as it promised in 2014. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be here, and we're finally here. Uh, my name is Evelyn Ortiz. I'm the Deputy Director of the New York Association of Training and Employment Professionals. Uh, for over 40 years, our association has represented every county in the state and includes local workforce boards, providers of economic development, union training funds, colleges, literacy, education, job training, and employment service providers. Collectively, our members serve over a million New Yorkers each day. Today, I'm also here to testify on behalf of the Invest in Skills New York City Coalition to highlight the need for bridge programs and the impact that these programs have on the lives of New York City's most vulnerable populations. As my colleague stated, 43% of New Yorkers have a high school diploma or less. Over 220,000 of them have less than a ninth grade reading level. For those who lack these basic skills and educational credentials, prosperity appears to be growing more distant. Unfortunately, many of the workforce training progr programs that offer advanced training into good paying jobs require a 10th grade reading level, leaving behind many without access to a viable career pathway. A recent voluntary survey conducted by the Invest in Skills New York City campaign found that within last year, 18 workforce training organizations reported that they had to turn away a total of 8,880 potential clients from their desired programs due to low reading and math scores. Many of these potential clients also face additional barriers to obtaining and maintaining employment, which include homelessness, involvement with the criminal justice system, mental health challenges, substance abuse issues, and lack of childcare. Bridge programs are designed to provide individuals with wraparound services to combat these challenges, while at the same time helping with basic skills deficiencies reach the levels of literacy and numeracy they need in order to enter the next level of training, obtain employment, or go to college. Unlike traditional adult literacy programs, bridge programs are contextualized to a, a specific sector of the job market. One phenomenal example is TechBridge, offered in partnership with The Door and Perscolas. And just overall, I just wanted to give you the highlight of that. 70% of TechBridge clients went on to advance IT training, and 80% of those clients found employment in the sector. Hello, and good evening, and thank you for managing this marathon uh, once again. Uh, I'm Jesse Lehman, the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. The coalition is the umbrella organization that represents over 150 workforce service providers across the five boroughs, neighborhood-focused CBOs, community colleges, vocational training programs, and labor management organizations. As an advocate for this broad workforce sector, there's a lot of the city budget that I could focus on today, but my colleagues have given you an idea of why we We've chosen to focus in this year's budget on bridge programs. Uh, as Garrett made clear, we know that reading and math deficits stand as barriers for tens of thousands of New Yorkers seeking careers in higher education. And as Evelyn laid out, uh, we know that the bridge model of contextualized education is the best pathway to guide New Yorkers past those barriers. The need is great. The de Blasio administration has identified it itself in its career pathways blueprint, promising to allocate $60 million per year to bridge programs starting in 2020. 
Now that fiscal 2020 is upon us, it is critical that the administration keep this promise and the council unflinchingly insist on the promise being kept. But the proposed budget is $40 million short. That means the promise is not being kept, the need is nowhere near being met. To take one population example, the mayor's proposed budget would leave adults, such as those served by HRA, com entirely unserved by these sorts of contextualized programs. What makes that even more galling is the fact that investments in bridge programs are fiscally responsible for the city's budget. Serving those HRA adult clients might cost us $30 million or more in the next year, but keeping them on public assistance is already costing us tens of millions of dollars more than that. Uh, the council can make sure that the adopted budget closes this gap between the promise and the reality. We want to thank the speaker, the BLEC, the Progressive Caucus, and the full council for, for their public support. The council response to the proposed budget called for not only the promised $60 million, but an additional $10 million to highlight the need and importance of bridge programs. And we ask that you keep up this focus in the final negotiations around the adopted budget and do not settle for a budget that leaves so many New Yorkers behind. Thank you. So, so I'm just a little confused. In this testimony, mm -hmm. yep. is this it's three of us, right. yep. the three of you together, um, it asked for $53 million. Yeah, um, we, we've, uh, identified a specific program that could be launched for that amount of money that serves an exact number of clients. The promise from the administration was $60 million and we want to help them get close to that. Um, and we wanted to be exact in our ask of what could actually be funded realistically and launched in this year's budget. I see, so you're saying, so what Garrett was saying was that he wanted the 60 million promise and then 10 million on top of that. that the council put that in the budget response right, and we were very right. thankful okay, I'm for following that. You now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, next please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Caroline Ayoso, and I am the Director of Community and Government Affairs at Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, OBT. Um, thank you, Chair Drum and Councilmember Chin for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Founded in 1983, OBT is one of New York City's largest providers of workforce development and education services for opportunity youth and adults who are disconnected from education and employment. We serve over 4,000 youth and adults every year across six sites in Brooklyn and Queens, and our programs have an 87% completion rate. For fiscal 2020, we're seeking funding from City Council to strengthen our core programs and build out several exciting initiatives. There are lots of details about these programs in the testimony that I've submitted. Um, but briefly, first is our Youth Education and Job Training Program, which is OBT's signature program that provides HSE classes for youth in a simulated work environment with one-on-one -on -one counseling, case management, and a community of support. Um, we're also seeking funding for adult literacy classes, immigration services, our college access program, our transfer school partnership, and our sector-specific trainings, Tech Start, medical administrative assistant training, and our pre-apprenticeship in masonry. Additionally, OBT is a proud partner of Invest in Skills New York City, and the $70 million investment in bridge programming prompt proposed by the council would better enable us to ensure that there's equitable access to economic opportunity in New York City. Both our work and our advocacy seek to address the evolving needs of opportunity youth and disconnected adults. Our priorities reflect the realities that they face, which are an increased need for basic skills support, increased barriers, and a disconnection from new opportunities that stem from New York City's economic development initiatives. We are deeply grateful for the support that the City Council has shown us over the years, and our requests for fiscal 2020 represent the appropriate next steps for our programming, supporting those seeking higher education, reaching transfer school students before they graduate, safeguarding our immigrant communities, preparing our participants for the future of work, and meeting our participants where they're at with the supports they need. We couldn't do it without you, and we look forward to working together in the coming year and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank Next, you. please. Joel Kupferman, yep. New York Environmental Law and Justice Project and the Emergency Task Force for the Prohibition of Roundup. I think I'm the first organization to ask for reduction in funds. We're <laughs> asking the city not to spend another dollar on Roundup and glyphosate. Okay. Two days ago, Los Angeles prohibited the use of that. There's scores of states, municipalities across the country that have said no, and New York City continues to use it. The paper I handed in is a picture of the notice of the roundup that is in your, Councilmember Chin's um, district. Part of the problem is that 
we have kids that are exposed to high levels of, of lead in the soil, and they're also now, it's being used in, in playgrounds and parks. It's carcinogenic. There was three cases recently in California. The last case is a billion dollars worth of findings. I don't know if they're gonna get the billion dollars, but lawyers are lining up now. There's over 13,000 cases, and New York City is probably gonna be one of those people on the list that's gonna be sued. We can't understand why that New York City continues to put people in path of danger. It's a cosmetic pesticide. It doesn't have to be used, and also it's hurting the workers, the environment, and especially our kids. New York City Health Department, we've used it over 13,000 times in the last two years, okay, in places where it should not even be used. But also, the City Health Department pointed out that when this hits soil that has lead or other heavy metals, it causes kidney failure. So we've been on notice, the City Health Department has been telling us, it admits it, and we're still using it, okay? I urge you to, to, to ask for moratorium. Six council members have asked for that, that we do that, and then we actually ban it but there's no reason why we have to keep on spending to use it. The City Health um, Parks Department has told us it's cheaper than just pulling this stuff out, but I think it's really, really, I think the largest chemical assault that the city is not just looking the other way, but is actually paying for this to continue. And we brought this up at the parks hearing yesterday, and they didn't mention it at all. It's the health department is using it. They're using it in, you know, in different areas, no, but, but it I doesn't told, have to be used. I, I did tell you yesterday I would look into it, okay. and I did give it to my legislative director, because that's the first I've heard of it. I never heard of Roundup before, so I'm looking into it, and we'll follow up with you. Okay, but I just want to say this going to be just the law cost alone of defending the city. Mm -hmm. It's going to be millions of dollars, and I think New York has played a role. With all the environmental talk that the city has done, this is basically a step backwards, and I think New York City's got to come back to the forefront to do Okay. That. All right, thank you very much. Last but definitely not least, Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, Jennifer Wright Cook, Fran Garber, Julia Dorante Martinez, John Krinsky, and Tito Sinha. Okay, who's that? You want, you want, did you fill out a form? Oh, okay. Come on up. Yep. We had thought you already testified, so I'm sorry. Uh, I think we got it, yeah. And nobody else, is there anybody else here who wants to testify? Okay, all right. All right, let's start uh, right over here. Good afternoon, my name is Alejandra Duque Cifuentes and I'm the Executive Director of Dance NYC, a dance service organization for New York City. On behalf of more than 5,000 dance makers and 1,200 dance companies based in the New York City area, the service entity Dance NYC joins New Yorkers for Culture and Arts and colleague advocates to request, one, that the city reconsider the proposed six million cut in funding in fiscal year 2020, and two, the city maintain the 25 million increase in funding from fiscal year 2019. The need and opportunity for funding is urgent. This is a moment when our presidential administration is threatening the rights to creativity and free expression, and New York City's increased investment in culture and the arts now will have both symbolic, systemic, and tangible significance. The current affordability crisis in New York City stems from longstanding systems of oppression and continues to heighten inefficiencies that result from one-time or short-term commitments to funding arts and culture. Healthy ecosystems require sustained, intentional support at every 
level. In the case of dance, this ecosystem is culture and the way in which culture defines us and advances us as a city, nation, and civilization. It is for this reason that we must commit to continued support for the arts. In doing so, we will strengthen the city as a be beacon for artists and audiences around the globe and ensure New York artists and cultural groups have the resources they need to advance the role of artistry in justice, equity, and inclusion in a changing United States. I've provided in the testimony um, a couple of urgent, uh, several urgent priorities for the dance community and how they relate to arts and culture. Um, ultimately, for Dance NYC, the ongoing implementation of the cultural plan is a critical time for strengthened and new advocacy. With the city's vision for a sustainable, inclusive, and equitable sector in place, it is incumbent on the city to operationalize that vision, fund it ad at adequate levels, and measure progress over time. As the city establishes its evaluation framework, Dance NYC strongly advocates for tracking the success of each planning strategy by creative discipline to ensure that the art form of dance, as well as all other peer disciplines, are adequately, adequately served. Thank you. Thank you very much. Were you involved in the dance parade at all? Yes. Yes, we, we were one of the partners that helped uh, to promote it, and we were present. Uh, how was it? It was incredible. Really? Over 10,000 dancers, more than 100 different dance forums across the entire city were represented. I, I, heard the, I only heard of it the first time this year, so I have to make sure I get out there at some point. Every May, next Every, year will be the 14th year. Uh, well, uh, okay. I've been in the council too long. <laughs> <laughs> next, please. Hi, I'm Fran Garber from Regina Opera Company. We don't dance, but we sing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, for 49 years, Regina Opera has offered year-round fully staged operas and ticketed and free concerts in Southwest Brooklyn. We will be starting our 50th season, 50th season shortly. Uh, our performances are places where thousands of Brooklyn residents, many of them retirees, come to meet their friends, stimulating their minds and getting them out of their home. Attending our performances distracts them from their troubles. We've also been told that our performances are very high quality. We provide affordable entertainment for, for, uh, for audiences who may not otherwise attend live opera performances. Some are on fixed income and some just can't travel. Uh, some, are, some people who love music are intimidated by the major opera houses or have not been exposed to opera previously. The venues that we perform in are all handicapped accessible. We offer matinee performances, reducing travel after dark. 4,000 people attend performances during fiscal year 2019, taking advantage of low cost and free tickets. Many tickets are also donated to senior centers. Uh, we are unique in Brooklyn. There are other people who perform operas, but only we have been doing it for 49 years in Brooklyn, year round. We're well known in the music world for training musical artists of all backgrounds, and we reflect the makeup of New York City. We help the entire community. We purchase local goods, rent storage units right near our theater, which is in Sunset Park. We depend on the support of audience members our council members, Menchaca and Brannon, and on the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Do you have an ask for money from the council at large, other than the discretionary funding you're getting? Uh, we get money from, no, we just get money from Mr. Brannon and Mr. Menchaca, and we get money from the Department of Cultural Affairs, Brooklyn Arts Council, and several other foundations and cultural institutions. So you're asking for a continuation of that Can, funding? Yes, we request that there's no cut, that it be baselined, uh, and not cut the funding cuts for the arts. Okay, good, I didn't see this um, paper before. Now I have your testimony. Well, thank you. Did you come last year? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, I remember. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. Next, please. Hi, my name is Imana Berry, and I am the development associate at the field, um, and I will be entering testimony on behalf of myself, as well as the executive director, Jennifer Wright Cook. Um, on behalf of Jennifer Wright Cook, um, the organization, the field, is a 33-year-old 
33-year-old art service organization based in Lower Manhattan, and we serve over 1,600 ambitious artists citywide. Um, she is also the co-chair of New York's for Culture and Arts, the city's arts and culture advocacy organization. Um, on behalf of Jennifer, we urge the city not to cut the arts and culture budget and to request a total of 25 million in cultural funding. We ask that this funding be divided evenly as it has in the past and that any additional funding also be shared equally. Um, Jennifer Wright Cook has shared, has testified every year and this is the first year she has been unable to do so just because of conflicts in her schedule, um, but she's, uh, been in her role as a field for uh, 14 years, and every year um, she has seen, or every, ooh, I'm messing up, uh, she testifies nearly every year here for increases, and this is the first time she's had to um, give a testimony against cuts in the arts budget. Um, on behalf of myself, so in addition to my work as a development associate at the field, I'm also a writer, producer, actor, and stand-up comedian in New York City, uh, and I know one of those things does not sound like the other, um, but I am here asking that um, these these cuts, while they affect my work at the field, they also affect um, my passion, which is creating work and opportunities. Um, I create new work in the theater profession as a practitioner surrounding the Me Too movement, as well as to demystify the, the stereotypes we have around diseases, specifically multiple sclerosis. So it affects my ability to create work as an artist and to also bring these important public health issues to my community. And so I urge the council to fight and advocate for not only um, organizations like the field, but for the artists that are out there doing the groundwork and who have families to feed as well as, you know, we seek affordable health care. So, thank you. Okay, thank you also for coming in and for giving us the testimony. Uh, uh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, committee chair uh, Drum, my name is John Krinsky. I'm a professor of political science at City College, and I lead the minor there in community change studies. I'm pleased to offer my testimony in support of the citywide uh, community land trust initiative sponsored by council members Carlina Rivera and Donovan Richards, which would provide critical fiscal 2020 discretionary funding of $850,000 to 15 organizations working to create and expand community land trusts, or CLTs, in all five boroughs of New York City. Thanks to years of community education, organizing, and coalition advocacy, interest in community land trusts has blossomed across the city. Community land trusts are nonprofit organizations designed to own and steward land over the long term in the interests of their communities. They have a history going back to the civil rights movement and have had notable success in cities across the country and here in New York City in preserving and creating affordable housing, abating gentrification and displacement pressures in neighborhoods, and supporting affordable commercial space, art space, and green space. The common denominator is through a 99-year renewable ground lease to the users of the land, community land trusts enforce affordability and use restrictions according to a balance of interests in the community. Community land trust boards have representatives from residents or leaseholders of CLT land to ensure the demand for good management, members of the broader community to ensure the demand for expansion of decommodified land, and advocates and technical assistance providers who can help steer the ship and link to, to other resources. This model of long-term land stewardship depends on, an or, on organized communities and it depends on setting up CLTs with organizing at their core. Community-based organizations in the proposed initiative have been working closely together since 2017 through a CLT learning exchange or capacity building series coordinated by the New Economy Project and for which I and colleagues at uh, City College's Community Change Studies Program have developed the curriculum. Through this collaborative work, groups have deepened their CLT knowledge and planning and are, and are now poised to undertake um, intensive organizing work required to set up their CLTs with support from the technical assistance groups. So the uh, proposed initiative would be, it, it comes at a crucial time in their development. Thank you. You have strong advocates in both uh, Councilmember Richards and uh, with Carlina Rivera, so. Yes, we do. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, good
Good evening, Committee Chair Drum, uh, Council Members Chin and Gibson. My name is Julia Durante Martinez, and I'm the Community Land Trust Coordinator at New Economy Project. Uh, for more than 20 years, New Economy Project has been working with groups citywide uh, to advance financial and economic justice and equitable community development. And we are the coordinating organization for the proposed Community Land Trust Initiative, um, along with 14 partner organizations, which include City College and Community Development Projects, and the Brownsville Partnership, who are three of the groups that are here today um, supporting the initiative. Um, community land trusts are a proven mechanism to preserve affordable housing stock and prevent the extraction of public subsidies. And the long-standing Cooper Square Community Land Trust here on the Lower East Side is an excellent example of that. Cooper Square has developed and stewarded nearly 400 units of deeply permanently affordable housing um, that rent on average for $300 to $1,000 a month. And this has enabled hundreds of extremely low-income tenants to stay on the Lower East Side in the face of gentrification pressures nearby. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight in my testimony is that um, after years of organizing and advocacy and coalition building led by the groups that are part of this citywide initiative, community land trusts have made tremendous gains in New York in the last several years. And this includes the first local law defining and entering CLTs into the administrative code, increased support from HPD, expanded training and technical support networks, and investment of New York State Attorney General settlement funds in new and existing CLTs. And this was the investment that also supported the learning exchange that John mentioned, um, an intensive two-year capacity building process that most of the groups participating in the initiative um, were also part of. So now building on this intensive training and ongoing community organizing, groups from the South and Northwest Bronx to East Harlem to Brownsville are pursuing CLTs. And the proposed initiative would jumpstart this progress at a really critical moment of opportunity by providing direct support to groups as they carry out the organizing and planning work needed to launch their CLTs. New York needs CLTs. They're an essential tool in providing permanently deeply affordable housing and community space stabilizing neighborhoods and building healthy, resilient communities. And we ask that you support the city's first major investment in community land trusts by funding the CLT initiative for 2020. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's good to see uh, Kachaya is involved with it as well as in my district. So. Yes, they are. Yeah, thank you. Good, good evening. My name is Tito Sinha. I'm from the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. I'm the supervising attorney of the workers' rights team, and I'm here to advocate for renewal and expansion of the low-wage worker initiative. Uh, in this time of federal retrenchment of civil liberties and workers' rights, fighting for workers' rights at the city and state level remain a vital avenue for fighting for social justice. As you know, when people assert and protect their rights at the workplace, that sense of mobilization empowerment and consciousness they gain carries into every aspect of their lives. People become change agents. CDP leads the Citywide Immigrant Legal Empowerment Collaborative, known as SILEC, which is uh, comprised of several legal services organizations and CBOs. In FY19, uh, the City Council importantly uh, provided, granted $2 million for civil, civil legal services for low-wage workers an additional 500,000 for outreach efforts, of which uh, SILEC received 671,486. In the first uh, nine months of FY19 alone, our uh, consortium handled 270 new employment matters, uh, including representing more than 200 workers in court or administrative proceedings. Uh, the majority of these claims uh, are not going to be resolved in one year, and our organizations have made hires to represent these people um, and so to not renew the funding would essentially uh, leave these people without representation or with reduced or, or with representation, you know, by folks who are beyond capacity. So um, since the mayor's office and city council, you know, importantly, and we you know, are so grateful, uh, provided this funding in FY19, I believe it is our responsibility to renew and expand the low-wage worker initiative to continue to promote and advance workers' rights. Are you uh, working with uh, those who have been um, who have not been paid? Yes, I mean we represent those with minimum wage claims, uh, 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 overtime claims, discrimination, retaliation. We also work with trafficking victims. So I mean all types of workplace issues, and um, 
as you can imagine, the most vulnerable, vulnerable of us, uh, you know, uh, suffer the most in those situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And last, but definitely not least, as I said before. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Ada Lin, and I'm a counselor advocate at the program at CPC. Thank you, Chair Trum and the member of City Council for the opportunity to testify on youth services today. I will start with my family story with CPC. A few years ago, when my little sister was going to elementary school, my mom purposely looked for a school where CPC provide after school program. Unfortunately, my younger cousin had to be home playing video games for all five years of his elementary school because my aunt could not find an after-school program and summer program for him, although he's on the waiting list every year. While both my sister and my cousin are the same age, however, however, not only my little sister's grades are higher, but she also knows her interests, she knows how to resolve conflicts, and she knows when to speak up for herself because CPC after school program focus on academic with development of the social emotional skills and the competency that are equally essential for youth to succeed in school, career, and life. This is why after school programs like Compet Sonic, Summer Youth Improvement Program, and Work Learning and Grow are so important, and why we urge the city to baseline these programs and expand funding for them. Compass is critical to ensure that children are safe while their parents work. Additionally, after school program provide many positive benefits to social emotional growth and academic support for youth. However, especially in high needs area of the city, providers often have lines of parents waiting to register their children for program and many uh, carry significant waiting list. We urge the city to expand after school program for elementary school students so that every family who needs a program can find one. Summer program like Sonic uh, ensure that this important care continue over the summer, but it takes CBOs like CPC to time to recruit and train staff. Enroll participant plan programming, which is why baseline funding is so critical. We urge the city to baseline $20.35 million for 34,000 Sonic summer slots. Through SYP at CPC, nearly 3,000 young people gain skill and experience, and many of them find long-term work through their participant participation at CPC, at SYP, often at CPC. We urge the city to baseline funding and increase rate for this program. Work, learn, and grow, provide career readiness training and pay improvement for opportunity for youth who are enrolled in uh, school. We urge the city to baseline $19.9 .9 million in funding and expand the program to serve larger proportion for high school students. Thank you. Were you here with the other um, CPC people? Yeah, I was sitting there. And we didn't call you? Well, I was waiting for my name to be called. Uh, <laughs> next time you have to come and see that man over there, okay, and let him know or come to one of us so that you could stay with your group. I apologize to you for that, okay. but uh, you did an excellent job uh, in your testimony, and uh, you'll get extra credit for that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, the, all of the issues that you brought up, some of the youth program, Compass, Sonic, are major, major topics for the council that we're going to fight for. So, we, you know, we're, as we go through the negotiations, you know, we're going to really fight for those things. So you can be assured of that. Thank you. And thank you for staying to be the last one. All right, I have to read a statement, which I'm really happy to do after, after a month of hearings. Uh, let me see. This concludes the City Council's hearings on the Mayor's Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget. Thank you to all my colleagues for being active and engaged in these hearings over the past three weeks, and thank you to all the members of the public who took time out of their busy schedules to be here today to have their voices heard. We hear you and we appreciate you. As one final reminder to the public, if you wish to submit testimony for the official record, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. We will accept testimony through 5 p.m. on Thursday, May 30th. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this year's budget process. This hearing is now adjourned. Yay!